Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Mid Suffolk District Council's Development Control B meeting today, 25th of November 2020. Um, can I just ask all the speakers who are here to turn off their videos, please, because we don't want to lose connections um, during the proceedings. So if those who are just speakers, can you turn off your video? Thank you. And then when you are speaking, we would like you to turn them back on. I'd also like to welcome those who may be watching on YouTube, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who are. So welcome to you all. Now, first of all, remind you of some domestic arrangements. Please ensure that microphones are muted when you are not speaking, that you do not interrupt the other speaker. Members are reminded not to use the messaging or chat function during the meeting, unless it's to report a pecuniary, non-pecuniary interest or to notify the chair that you wish to make a proposal. Members are reminded that they should not have alternative communication lines open, i.e. other Skype chats, and that if you are contacted by a third party during an application, you should bring this to the legal advisor's attention. That if you are attending the meeting to speak and persistently interrupt the meeting, you may be asked to leave. Additionally, you will be invited to speak and ask questions. Please await your turn. We will not be using the hands up function except for declarations of interest, site visits, declarations of lobbying and questions for clarity. And in the second round of debate, we can do it that way. If you're experiencing poor connection issues in the first instance, please turn off your camera. If this does not work, please turn off all incoming video. These options are under the three dots in the main information bar. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The whole of the meeting will be recorded except where there are confidential or exempt items. If you make a representation to the meeting, you will be deemed by the council to have consented to being recorded. By entering this meeting as a speaker, you are also consenting to being recorded by the council and to the possible use of those sound recording for webcasting and or training purposes. The council, members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and press are not lawfully excluded. The introductions, Ian Dupre, Legal Advisor, Robert Carmichael, Governance Officer, Vincent Pierce, Case Officer, Daniel Cameron, Case Officer, Area Planning Manager, John Pateman G. And we do have the ward members, John Field, Lavinia Haddingham and Julie Flatman. May I move on to the agenda, please? Apologies for absence and substitutions. Thank you. Present. 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 Thank you. Declarations of pecuniary and non-pecuniary interest by members, and you may use the hands up function. There are none. Declarations of lobbying, and again, you may use the hands up function. I think it will probably be all of us and certainly for me it is for the pressing field application. Does anyone have any alternative? No, so that would be for the pressing field. Thank you very much. I need to take my hand down. Declarations of pers <coughs> excuse me, personal site visits, please. There are none. Confirmation of the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of October. Are any points regarding accuracy in the minutes, please? No, may I have a proposer, please? Mark Norris, happy to propose. Thank you, Councillor Norris. And I saw Councillor Humphreys as a seconder, is that correct? Or <laughs> well, your hand came up? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to second the proposal. Thank you very much both. Robert, can you take a roll call, please? Uh, 
So if members could please respond with for, against, or abstain. So Councillor James Carston. For. Councillor Peter Gould. For. Councillor Cathy Guthrie. For. Councillor Barry Humphreys. For. Councillor Andrew Mellon. For. Councillor Mike Norris. For. Councillor Andrew Stringer. For. And Councillor Roland Warboys. For. Thank you, Chair. That is carried unanimously. And the minutes of the meeting have been confirmed and will be signed at the next practicable opportunity. Thank you. To receive notification of petitions in accordance with the Council's petition scheme. None received, Chair. Um, the schedule of planning applications, I will run them in the order in which they appear in the papers. And just for information, um, I would suggest, Robert, if you're happy with this, that we can advise members that the application DC 19.05956 won't be heard before 11 o'clock. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, yes, if if you want, wish to advise members um, to come back for that, app, sorry, speakers to come back for that application at that time, that is completely reasonable, providing that um, we do not start business on that item prior to that time. Do I need to have a vote for this, um, Ian Dupre? If I, if I can jump in before Ian does, I don't believe you do, Chair, as it's your prerogative as Chair yeah. to be able to change the order in which yeah, the quite. items are heard. Quite right, Madam Chairman, yes. Sorry, not the, order, I, I, the timing. Sorry, apologies, Chair. <laughs> then then I think that's reasonable because if we are a few minutes early, we can always have a five minute break. So um, for those people watching uh, for that later application, they might like to do something else. If not, please stay with us and um, watch the earlier applications. So thank you for that. So we will be starting with um, land at Blackacre Hill, Brantford Road. And Vincent Pierce will introduce the application to the committee, please, if you would. Thank you. Listeners, listeners and viewers, I just need to activate the presentation. So please bear with me for a moment. Hopefully, very shortly, the presentation should appear. Can anyone confirm whether or not that has happened? It hasn't yet for me. Okay. No, not yet, uh, Vince. Okay. Any joy? Nope. No. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> yep. Right. Strangely, OK, I'll cancel the share because it is showing up as sharing on mine. But... Right, try again. It actually shows up on my screen as actually sharing, but it from the look of your face, Kathy, you're not seeing <laughs> no, anything. No, it's not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do I look a bit vacant? No, no, you're looking perfectly on the ball. It's just you're looking disappointed not to be able to see the 
I wonder if John's got it on his um, laptop, whether we can do it that way. John Payton G, you normally have it. I don't have a copy of that particular PowerPoint. It's okay. not of that size. Um, I'm just wondering, if, have you got a um, another document open, uh, Vincent, that you can share instead to just test if it's sharing at all anything? Or possibly share, yes. desktop, but make sure you don't show anything private <laughs> um, in terms of just it's, making okay. teams actually working. The only other thing you can do is reset teams and uh, oh. come out of it entirely and go back in again. Okay. I'm having a final throw of the dice, Chair, with something else. That also looks as though nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. So apologies, everyone. I think I'm going to have to take John's advice. I'm going to have to sign out and then sign back in. Apologies. That's all right. These things happen. We'll wait for you to get that. Order. Thank you. Yeah, Hopefully, thank you. I'll just be a minute or two. Uh, the only other last ditch thing we could try if that's not successful is I can access um, the central drive to get the original PowerPoint up and running. But if Vincent's able to quickly upload whatever current version that is, I might be able to access it and then be able to display it from here. I don't but know whether I'm, you can hear me, John. I can hear we you. We can see you as well. You're still well, very there. strange because it, it's telling me I'm leaving, but it hasn't made me leave yet. So. They should all be in the P drive, uh, John, and I'll be the one with the latest time. I was working on them last night, so whichever one. Ah, oh, super. OK, let me go there. Um... This is even stranger because <laughs> it's actually not leaving, letting me leave even. We have some weirdness going on this morning, members. Robert, can you um, e exit Vincent from can your you, yeah. side of things? Can you force me out? <laughs> Um, no, I can still hear. The only for thing the first I can do... time ever, I, I, I've asked people not to come back before 11 o'clock. <laughs> and now we seem to have got a bit of a muddle on it, but it would still be Vincent anyway, so we need to get everything sorted. Excellent. Do apologise to the public, these things happen, but we do our best. I found the presentation. Um, if I don't know if it's, it's gone, but I just, might not be able to get back in now. <laughs> uh, I'm just attempting to share myself in a moment, if, if that helps, and hopefully it'll come up. I do just he need can to join. He could join by phone, and then you could drive the um, yeah presentation.
I got Robert, that. Can, Robert, can you contact um, Vince and see if he can join by phone? And um, John will just have to sort of flick the uh, slides forward. I'm oh, sorry. So I've just requested Mr. Pierce to join through Teams again. Um, he should be able to do that even if he can't control the presentation. I believe there is a functionality that Mr. Pierce can control the presentation, but I don't want to overcomplicate things. No, no. Daniel Cameron, are you still on in the listening to the meeting? Can't yes. Was um, um here starting to I, stream? Well, Holly, I need to go on. Yes, can you hear me? Thank you, Daniel. Um, in terms of presentation, um, I have a fear, especially as I'm getting a new computer on Friday, that this yeah. thing will run out possibly in the next couple of hours if I'm presenting on behalf of Vincent, if that's how we organise this, stand by to also go into P Drive and present any item if we need to switch and get you to present instead the actual point. You can just be aware of that need. Thank you. Robert, I wonder if we should suspend the meeting for the moment so it's not running and then uh, reconvene, uh, particularly for members of the public. Yes, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I've just spoken to Mr. Pierce. Unfortunately, what has happened is his computer has done an automatic update. So that's why <laughs> he was kicked out. Um, so extreme apologies on that front. But he is he's just said to me that he has just restarted and he should be here momentarily. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So I was he apologises. I'm, sure um, I'm sure he'll say that himself. OK, thank you. Just to save time, we'll present this item through my computer um, and then we'll when we switch to the next item, we can always try again in terms of Vincent's computer if the update has solved the problem, perhaps.
Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Vince. Off you go. Are you, you. OK? Did um, Was Robert able to explain what had happened? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So so it does appear. I don't know whose screen. Is that something that you've put on the screen, John, or am I? Well, That's John. Yeah, your presentation uh, that is on the P drive. I'm hoping I've chosen the right one. It's the most up to date. Um, uh, the only thing to do really is to carry forward. If you just tell me to change slides when you need me to. OK, I'm sorry. It's going to be a bit clumsy on that respect. Or um, would you want me to just have one last try now that my system has completely updated itself? Can we just go ahead on this one and then do it? Okay. For the next yeah, one? of course. Thank you. The item before you this morning is an application to vary two conditions, conditions 20 and 26, on an existing planning consent. Next one, please, John. So we are looking at uh, an employment application in Great Blakenham, known as Port One. Next slide. So on the screen, you can actually see I've identified the Port One Business Park. It's very close to the waste, energy from waste building that I've identified. Also, just south to what will be the Snowasis site, um, accessed via Junction 51 on the A14. Members will have noticed a large industrial building going up on the site at present. That's very near to completion and is about to be fitted out by the new occupiers. Next slide, please, John. So the applicants are Curzon de Vere, who are undertaking the whole of the Port One development. Next slide, please. So we'll look at each of the proposed variations in turn. Next slide, please. So what we have on the screen is an explanation of how we've gone about this. So we've had a request to vary condition 20 and that request has come from the applicants. That has been looked at by the District Council, the County Council and the Parish Council. And generally, we believe that to be acceptable in the form of wording that the applicant has proposed. So that's what we're putting before you this morning. In terms of condition 26, the applicant made some suggested amendments. Again, we considered them and we were not happy with the, the wording. So we have discussed revised wording with the applicant, and it is the revised wording that we are recommending to you this morning. So if we can go to the next slide, please, John. So the part that says no part of the development is the original wording. The blue text is the requested wording. So the key here is that originally, or as existing, no part of the development can be occupied until the access has been constructed in its entirety. Now, what we have uh, come across is obviously the COVID crisis. And what has happened is that the junction works have not been able to be completed prior to the handover of the new unit. The works are ongoing, uh, the works are being supervised. However, we felt it unreasonable to prevent the new occupier from getting into the premises to fit it out. And so what we are suggesting, or what the applicant suggested and the Highway Authority have agreed, is that we have a condition as put out within 24 months of occupation of the first unit or earlier before the third unit. So Hopefully, this will allow the new occupier to get in, fit out the unit. The works to the junction can be ongoing. And therefore, we're happy that that flexibility will allow the operator to move in, but it will not prejudice highway safety. And on that basis, we are saying we recommend the amended condition. If we can go to the next slide, John. We look at 20, condition 26, and this relates to off-site, off-road cycle improvements on Bramford Road. And again, these are required to be uh, constructed before a first occupation. And we have the same issue 
in terms of the unit currently under construction is now being fitted out. COVID has caused a delay in completion of the, the works. So what we are suggesting is not that we put the works off pending the submission of a, a delivery programme. We are actually saying, along with the Highway Authority, no, we don't want to put it off particularly uh, for a long time. But what we are willing to do is suggest that prior to the occupation of the second unit on the development, the off-road cycle improvements along Bramford Road between the site access and its junction with Addison Way shall be completed. So that will allow the first unit to be occupied, fitted out and, and start being used. Now you may say, well, how can people get to the site if the access is still being formed? So if we can go to the next slide, John, please. Presently, traffic would be able to use the Addison Road access, which is the dog-legged road to the, the top half of that. That's Thank you, John. So you would be able to get into there while the orange square uh, junction is being formed. Please note that with the outline planning permission, so in terms of condition 20 and 26, the orange junction on that screen was not proposed to be signalised. The signalisation comes with the next application when we discuss that but ultimately as part of those cycle improvements the connection between addison way and the rest of the port one site in the orange square will be closed to hgv traffic traffic and i know there was some concern expressed previously that what people didn't want was for traffic hgv traffic to to be able to continue using the addison road access well that that is not going to happen that will be controlled by condition 26 and that will be closed to HGV traffic. Next slide, please, John. So that is a, a screenshot of the junction works that are currently underway. Completely new access being formed for port one. Next slide, please, John. Part of those works are footway cycleway connections along that frontage across that junction they are three meter wide that will run right into the port one development and connect all parts of the port one development to this access on both sides of that road so there will be excellent connectivity next slide please john just highlighting again the the point at which access will be closed to hgvs next slide please john Currently, there are um, traffic management techniques in operation in Addison Way. So there's no parking bollards along both sides of the road. There is an enforcement uh, contractor who monitors the situation and uh, people can get parking enforcement notices if they are parked in places that they shouldn't be. There is use of ANPR that's number plate recognition and CCTV. And the point here is that by preventing people parking on the on the road, it, it is possible for HGVs to manoeuvre around that. Clearly, if people started parking, let's say, on that bend, it does make it difficult for HGVs. And the whole point of the new access is that port one can be served with purpose built road that is capable of accommodating HGV movements in a way that Addison Way isn't. So there are benefits all round once that access is in and we get the Port One development off the ground. Next slide, please, John. Just to remind members, as part of the outline planning permission, originally we did secure a, a, a minibus shuttle uh, arrangement that is still on the cards and what will happen is the port one minibus will take the route shown in blue and pick up local people who are working on the the site the actual details have yet to be finalized but there is no fear of that being withdrawn either as part of this variation of condition or the following application in terms of the expansion next slide please john as part of the original application as well, the applicants have agreed 
I would say some a, a groundbreaking uh, emergency ride home scheme whereby employees are able to get access to effectively a taxi or cab ride home in extenuating circumstances. So although the footway cycleway might be put off for a little uh, while, whilst the access gets formed, there is this other raft of innovative measures in terms of the shuttle minibus and the emergency ride home facility that are all encouraging people to get to the site without using their car. Next slide, please, John. So on that basis, members, we are recommending the uh, variation of conditions as set out in the report. And just to remind you, we are perfectly happy with the suggested wording put forward by the applicant for condition 20. And what we're recommending to you is the revised wording agreed with Suffolk County Council in respect of condition 26 as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Thank you, Vincent. Um, we now come to the point where if members would like to have a clear or a clarity point made, um, do you want to put your hands up if anybody wants to ask the planning officer a question that hasn't been made clear? And we've got Councillor Field, please. Oh, can I just before you start, um, Councillor Field, can I just see if any members of the committee? Sure. Sorry, Councillor Stringer, if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got two two questions, uh, or just pieces of clarity. So, we're this can't this road junction hasn't been done in line with the original conditions because COVID precluded work on that junction, but it didn't preclude work on the warehouses. Can I just have that clarified? And what I want to know is the, the original condition said you, you cannot occupy a building unless this junction is provided. What happens if we grant this in two years time if the junction is still not provided? Thank you, Councillor Stringer. I'll deal with the second point first. If the junction isn't provided, then no more units can be occupied. The only reason we're showing some flexibility is because the junction works were delayed due to um, road building work ceasing during the darkest time of the lockdown. Now, clearly, if the highway construction work had ceased, so did some of the construction work on the building. However, the work on the building proceeded at a, a quicker rate when people were able to work than the highway works, because obviously with the highway works, there also had to be um, road closures, access into the highway. That all took time to arrange and rearrange, because obviously slots for working in the highway are limited in time. So the combination meant that the building has proceeded quicker than the the junction. But the, the comfort I can give you is that once this building is occupied, if the junction works aren't completed, that holds up the rest of the development. But subject to there being no further uh, complete lockdowns, there is no reason why that should happen. I mean, to be fair to the applicants, they have been working hard with both the county and ourselves to try and progress those, those works. Um, so we have every confidence that we won't get to a point where another building is ready to be occupied and the works aren't in, because actually it is in the interest of the developer to have those works, because that's part of the selling point of the development. Thank you. Um, Councillor Caston, I think I saw your hand up, did I not? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, in, in this is the... Um, an inclusion of some sort of wheel wash or um, um, street cleaning in the early stages of this development for Addison Way. I assume there would have been something in place for the access that is is obviously not going to be um, completed first. Um, what have we what have we got in place, or is that 
our job to um, look after that. That's a cracking point, Councillor Keston. What we normally have is a condition that says, as part of the construction method statement, during construction works, roads have to be swept. We do have the benefit of having Sam Harvey with us this morning from uh, our partner authority at Suffolk County, the Highway Authority. Um, I don't know whether Sam under the section 38 or the 278, you also have uh, controls over preventing mud from being deposited on the highway during construction work. Good morning, everyone. Yes, we we do. Um, we have we have the powers to um, instruct the contractor to make sure that there are wheel, wheel washing, and their um, the carriageway is swept, so there's no debris on the highway. Thank you. Hopefully, that answers that one for you, Councillor Caston. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I've got a bit of a confused screen at the moment. So unless there are any more um, committee members, I believe Councillor Field had a question. Thank you. Yes, I did. Thank you. Councillor Stringer has got uh, sort of one of mine, certainly. Um, <laughs> perhaps it could be uh, made clear to me why uh, 10 months of COVID, maybe 12 by the time we get to the end of the current wave, has caused a 24 month delay to highways work. Seems a big multiplying effect there. Uh, second point perhaps is if the Addison Way entrance is going to be beyond capacity, which is what the highways analysis says, how is it acceptable to delay that entrance for two years again? It's a considerable period. Third point related to that is that the point or one of the points of the new entrance is to prevent vehicles, HGVs, turning left out of Addison Way, which is a sort of a valid manoeuvre. You have to be able to access the site from both directions for various purposes, but HGVs would then transit Blakenham and Needham Market to quote just two areas which have weight restrictions and considerable housing close to the road. So we seem to be leaving them at risk for that. So there's two questions. Uh -huh. Third one and then I'll stop. Well, I thought you've got up the three already. <laughs> oh well, I never could count. Uh, condition 26 highways um, there's a new word, newly worded condition, but if I look on page 44, it says that those uh, developments will not now be feasible. It will not now be feasible to complete the construction. And I didn't notice a time limit on that, so I assumed there's something preventing that highway being built. So could you clarify those points? Thank you. Yes. If we start first, Councillor Field, with the 24 months, John, if you could please go to slide seven, I think it is. Yeah, it's the the applicant there on condition 24 months within, yeah. So what we have built in is absolute flexibility, but the you, you're right, it might take less than the 24 months, but what we're thinking is because of condition 26, John, if we can just go to the next slide. What we're saying there is prior to the occupation of the second unit, off-road cycle improvements along Brownford Road will have to be in place. Because those cycle improvements include the um, signalisation as part of the next application, we believe that they will be in significantly quicker than the 24 months because it'll be tied to occupation. But it is fair to say that we have built in flexibility to allow the construction work to go ahead, but also to factor in any other works that are being required as part of the Snowasis development. And what we're trying to do is avoid uh, Brownford Road being closed or dug up lots of times over the next 24 months. So we have built in that flexibility. In terms of the right turn, 
I think if we can go back to the junction slide, John, that you had up a moment ago. That's it. The current outline planning permission, the one that condition 20 and 26 relate to, does not include signalization of that junction. It is the following application, the expansion application, that provides signals to that junction, and it is that work that that controls movement out of that junction and prevents HGVs going back into Great Blakenham. As part of the outline planning permission, there is the closure between Addison Way and Port 1, so HGVs will not be able to track back out through Addison Way, but actually getting the control over the movement of HGVs out of the access on the screen is made absolutely foolproof by the delivery of signals, and that only comes with the next application. So technically, if an HGV wanted to try and turn left out of that junction, it could have a go, but it probably would have to swing out across the other lane or nip across the curb, which is far from ideal. So it's the signalization in the next part of the uh, agenda that actually delivers that final piece of the jigsaw. Signalization wasn't secured and wasn't felt necessary for the first phase of development. Your reference to page 44, I haven't got the agenda now because that went. I don't know whether some, if somebody could uh, read out the page, but there is nothing that would prevent development proceeding per se, other than delivery of the works associated with condition 20 and 26. And as I think I'm saying to Councillor Stringer, if the junction works are not in place, that holds up further development. But if the junction works are in place, there is nothing preventing completion of the first phase of development. And if planning permission is approved for the following item, nothing to prevent that being completed in its entirety. So sorry, that's a long answer for the points you've raised. Come back, Kathy, hopefully more briefly. Yes, please do. <laughs> My, my my concern, I thought I asked clearly, was that in the interim 24-month period, yep. HGVs will be exiting via Addison Way, the next junction down, and that has bi-directional exit by, you know, you may yes. turn left or yes. right, if I put it simply. Yep. Um, uh, and it was during that period, I quite accept that by the time you put lights and things in on this new junction, it will constrain that behaviour. And that's what local people require. So I understand the yep. new junction. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Hang on, John, the we're getting into debate. We just want clarity you on know, it. I'm trying to make sure the question is clear because obviously I have a difficulty with that issue. And I'm quite happy to read out the other paragraph sentence to you, if you like. It comes from Christopher Fish, Senior Development Management Engineer, Growth Highways and Infrastructure. If you can get someone else to read it, I'm equally No, happy. no, that's fine. Thank you for the absolute clarity. I didn't doubt for a minute you understood what you meant. It's I was having trouble digesting it. You are absolutely right. Until the new access is in, HGVs will be using the Addison Way connection. And you're perfectly right, HGVs leaving Addison Way can go either left or right. Once the junction is in, and even once the signals are in, and that connection is closed, obviously HGVs serving the existing developments off Addison Way will be able to come in and out without restriction and will also be able to turn left when exiting. That's the existing arrangement and there is nothing in the outline planning permission or the next application to prevent that movement. But I understand the point you're making is why should local people in Great Blakenham have to endure up to a further 24 months with additional HGVs from Port 1 exiting via Addison Way and turning left, that is 
unfortunately the position we are in but that will be short term because the benefits we are securing if the next application is improved will enhance the situation immeasurably but there will be a delay and that's been caused largely through um, delays in getting the access works completed thank you for that explanation can I just come in just one little thing on that? Obviously, in the terminology of the condition that's proposed to members, you have the restriction here that it's first occupation. Um, so we don't have any other occupations coming forward. It's so the it's limit, if you like, in terms of what HGVs will be allowed in the short term, is limited in number by the occupation level of the first unit, if I've got that correct. Um, in, so you have that caveat that controls it despite the allowance to um, allow the development to carry on because of the uh, delays uh, elsewhere on the on the road network thank you right thank you very much for that so um, no further questions so we now move on councillor field can you take your hand down please um, we now move on we don't have a representative from the parish council objector or supporter so I will ask the applicant to speak. Nick Davy, you have three minutes, please. Thank you. Nick Davy, are you there? Robert, do we have the applicant? So I just turn on my other microphone so the public can hear me as well. Um, I can see that Mr. Davy is in the meeting. Um, as a participant, so and he's put his microphone on. I can see Mr. Davy in terms of his video, although he's just come away from the chair. Um, he seems to be having problems because he's trying to fix something on the the video. Maybe a microphone. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Thank you, John. If we bear with it just for a couple of minutes, Chair. Um, just see if Mr. Davy can resolve whatever technical issue is taking place. I think he has a plug-in mic. He's trying to plug in, um, but. Clearly, that's causing issues with whether he's mute or not. <laughs> I, I, am I the only one who can see video, video that he's transmitting? No, I can't see it. Yeah, I can't see it either, I'm afraid, Mr. Pate. Oh, I can is, see it, Rob, it's Claire. Oh, I believe you, Claire. Mr. Davy is there now. Ah, oh, brilliant. Mr. Davy? You're very quiet. I can't hear you. You're very faint. I wonder if you can go directly from your computer rather than a microphone. Is that any better? No, can't really hear you. Right. Actually, I'll, it, he started to talk, started to go. If he can get it a bit closer, then he... Chair, in the interim, would it be were, would it be appropriate if we heard Councillor Field uh, first, just to move proceedings along? Um, yes, I'm quite happy with that. Councillor Field, are you happy with that at the moment? I can do that. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. If you'd like to give us your presentation, please. Okay. <laughs> Fairly brief, perhaps, for this particular part of the the overall procedure. I, I think, first of all, I, I would want to emphasise that I, I think I have accepted and supported the ex, this business park uh, since it's close to the A14 uh, and it's clearly part of a series of developments in Sporton, Blakenham, Gateway 14 and Elmswell to boost the capacity, the warehouse capacity in, in Suffolk in, in, in the, on the route to Felixstowe or between Felixstowe and the north. So one of the sides, I, I'm certainly not just a opposer of these developments and local people perhaps have a similar somewhat pragmatic view but somewhat more concern 
about the issue of HGVs, uh, heavy numbers of HGVs, which often run 24-7, passing their dwellings, which, as we all know, were built in Victorian or earlier periods, very close to roads. So there, there is a considerable concern that we should control various aspects, particularly highways aspects of these developments. Um, and there are a series of highways aspects, uh, not all perhaps related to this, these two changes that we're debating here. The one that is related to this one is clearly the use of Addison Way. That that, that it was cons there was a, a condition that said we built a new, or the developer built a new entrance. That entrance have uh, has constrained the transit of HGVs so that they turn out of the site directly towards the A14, which is a short dual carriageway link, um, albeit it starts on a B-class road, which is, is somewhat constrained. So that was necessary, and it's backed up by the thought that there was congestion at the Addison Way entrance, which already exists with the current load, let alone a new building, let alone a large number of new buildings, but I, we, the locals would completely take the point that you're constraining this change to just a single building occupancy, but even that is too much is the feeling. Um, so that's one issue. The, the other clear issue is the confusion about highway is uh, condition 26, the footway, the move towards sustainable transport. And I totally heard everything that the officer mentioned on that front, other actions being taken, but clearly there's wording from highways that says the building of these new, uh, new footways will not now be feasible. And I wish to explore that and wish to object to the removal of those sustainable tra transport means or what looks like the possible removal of them. I think that sort of is restricting my wider remarks to the ones that are particularly concerned with this proposed pair of changes. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor would you, Field. Would you mind if I responded? Well, hang, at that point? Uh, hang on. I'm in your hand. <laughs> Sorry. No, well, well, funnily enough, I was going to say, could yeah go on could could i've written a note here i've written vince footways answer is what okay. i've written down on my well, papers um, so have... can i can i just ask uh, members um i'm sure they're happy for vince to explain that a little further for us before we have further questioning of councillor field so uh vincent if you would like to move thank forward. you Chair. sorry for um yeah uh, no no we're on the same page because I've mr davy hasn't um spoken yet this might give him time to think about what I'm about to say, but I understand the point that uh, Councillor Field has made. There is a lot of anxiety in Great Blakenham about these movements. And I wonder if, with some subtle adjustment to the wording, if we were to say uh, prior to occupation of the second unit or 12 months, whichever is the sooner, I think then, Councillor Field, that would provide additional comfort that the longest local people um, are expected to wait is 12 months. So that wouldn't be the 24 months applied for by the applicant. So we will have halved that. It will add some uh, momentum and an imperative to get those works sorted. So sorry to spring that on everyone, but I, I've, I hear what you say, Councillor Field, and I'm, I have quickly Skyped uh, Sam Harvey, and we do think that 12 months as the backstop would be a reasonable limit. So no matter what else happened, those works would have to be in place within 12 months. I put that forward. That isn't in obviously in my recommendation. And if somebody, if, if Councillor Field, you felt that was appropriate, you might want to suggest it as an amendment. But uh, at least that would on, allow uh, people... Vincent, um, Sorry. John, uh, Councillor Field is not in the position to recommend amendments. That's Apologies. up to the committee if you let us do that. Sorry, um, Chair. 
but 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 I think that's very useful because again I'd written Sam as well so uh, thank you Sam for those things there so can we come back thank you for that at the moment and we'll hold that one in abeyance um, can I come back to members do they have any further questions for Councillor Field please no thank you very much so can we go back to Mr. Davy, have we got access to Mr. Davy, please? I am here. I you are so faint. We really can't hear you. Can't hear a word you're saying. I'm so sorry, Mr. Davy. Can you can you not use your computer without that microphone? Yeah, but does the computer not have a microphone? We just can't hear you. Have you got your microphone turned up on your computer? We really can't hear you, Mr. Davey. Um, Robert, is there any way he could telephone in that we could hear it? Let me just have a think, because I don't believe that that function is available. Um, does, if... does, does his computer, I'm not technical, you know how nightmare I am with it, you have to turn the sound up on the actual computer, do you think? Because I hear him very, very faintly in the background, but... It could be more can of a someone help associated him? with the microphone sensitivity and the sound settings as a possibility, mm -hmm. but I don't know if Mr Davies already tried that, so I, do, I don't want to... Um, can I ask Ian Dupre, legally, can we go ahead without the applicant making um, his comment? Um, yeah, hello, uh, I'm, I'm here, Madam Chair. Hopefully, hopefully you can hear me. Um, well, we, we have a usual procedure whereby we invite uh, public speaking and, and we seem to have, obviously in the council chamber this wouldn't occur, but we, we, we have a, pro a technical problem that seems to be nobody's fault in particular, that means Mr Davey can't be heard. Uh, I'm just well. I, like Mr. Carmichael, I'm thinking as I go along, what what's the best and fairest way of, of dealing with this? Um, does it does Mr. Davy have a written presentation well, that yeah, he could that, forward that was, that was to either mind. me or to Robert Carmichael? Or if he goes to device settings on his PC, <laughs> he might be able to wind up the volume of his yeah. microphone. Well, that's what I was trying to say. It needs the computer to do it. I would not uh, share. Sorry, I didn't mean to speak over anybody. I wonder if if the committee takes a short, say, a five minute break and if somebody gets on the phone to Mr. Davey, uh, I don't know who, who Robert or Mr. Carmichael, one of our colleagues, and and just sees if we can identify what the problem is and what possible solutions are. Is that what sounds reasonable? That sounds reasonable to me. Um, so if we take a five minute break, um, so if you would like to suspend the meeting for five minutes, Robert.
Sorry about the delay. We have now got Mr Davy, the applicant, and Robert, if you would like to time the three minutes, please. Thank you. Yeah, and I do apologise. It's all my fault. Um, thank you, members. Um, and I hope that the Port Wine Logistics Park is a good news story. Um, the first £8 million unit is completed to Shell and was handed over to its tenant on Monday. Oh, dear. We've it's lost now moved it. in and is in the process of fitting the building out with state of the art, the further cost of 1.5. Mr. Davey, you're you. breaking up. Can you just keep the phone Can still? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Okay, is that any is that any better now? Yeah, just keep still. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right, I'll carry on. Turn um, your video off though, and then just leave your voice on and we'll hear that. Right. Is that okay? Yeah. Right, start again if you would please. Okay, so apologies. So um as I said, hopefully it's a good news story. The uh, tenant has moved into the building as on Monday and is fitting it out. And early in the new year, it should be operational and uh, it will start employing people. And we, we reckon about there'll be 150 people employed in that building. And we do have to apologise. Um, we had the design of the Brantford Road Junction, the cycle path approved over two years ago. But for circumstances largely beyond our control, it's just not been possible to complete it at the moment. We are working very closely with your officers and the County Council to try and resolve the outstanding issues. And we're also looking to add a new crossing on Brantford Road um, at the um, opposite Addison Way. And as uh, Mr Pierce has said, signals uh, into the junction, which require a slight adjustment of the approved design. And that's one of the things that, that's held everything up. But as soon as we get a resolution to those issues, the work will be timetabled and it will be coordinated with the county to coincide with the other improvements coming forward from uh, Snowasis. But in the meantime, secure storage has been, sorry, secure cycle storage has been provided and installed. Um, we submitted a travel plan to the county. We submitted details of the planned shuttle bus service and the ride home scheme. They're all waiting approval and hopefully they'll all be in place when the unit opens. But so that the unit can open, we are seeking a, a, um, to amend the conditions for a relatively short time so that the uh, unit can be accessed via Addison Way. And in answer to Councillor Phil's questions, the County of Chet and Addison Way does have the capacity very safely to take this unit. It's only if we try to put the whole scheme, all nine units through it, would there be a problem, not with just one unit. And yes, uh, vehicles can turn left out of Addison Way, but so they could turn left out of the existing junction, the approved junction. So there's no real difference there. It's not until we put the signals in, which will be part of the next permission or application you're about to look at, that uh, we, will, we will be able to prohibit all, junk, uh, all movements out of the junction, so they only go right. So this is a fantastic employment site. We have other tenants lined up to go. And as soon as this planning permission is sorted out, the funder will release funds and we can bring forward other schemes. We're more than happy with all the uh, suggestions that have been made both in the officer report and have been discussed by uh, Mr Pierce, uh, changes to the conditions. And we hope that members can support this scheme so that those 150 jobs don't have to be delayed, they can be delivered. And we will get on and build that junction as soon as we possibly can. And if we don't, in reply to another question, we'll be in breach of condition. We would also be in breach of a section 106 agreement, both of which you could effectively come after us for. Thank you very much indeed. Stay Hello. there, stay there because there might be questions from um, the committee. So members of the committee, do you have any questions, please, if you'd like to put your hands up? Councillor Caston, if you would like to ask your question and hope that we keep connection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if you'll um, you'll give me this answer, but I'm just wondering who the tenant was. If you can't give me that answer, could you tell me what their line of business is and what sort of business activity will be going on in, yeah. in the first one? 
Now, I can't give you that answer because it's public knowledge. They're in there now and you'll see signs going up in the building uh, next year. It's the FDS Corporation. They have an existing 50,000 units on the Bransom's Euro Park at Ipswich. This is their second facility in the area. And they're basically, they, they sell import goods and sell them on the internet. Thank you for that. And now we have um, Councillor Stringer, please. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just wanted to uh, ask whether it's possible to employ a strategy in the short term of temporary signage to request that drivers don't turn left coming out of here from port one, because we realise it can happen and it would be really, yeah, and, and it, in eventually over time it will be precluded, but it, it's it's how we manage the interim. And I'm sort of asking, is there is there a way you could manage or the operator could manage to uh, try and help preclude that circumstance? Before Nick yeah. answers that, can I just say that if he is in, in agreement to it, that Councillor Stringer, we could bring that up in the debate for um, an additional recommendation once we've heard from uh, Mr Davy, Is that appropriate for you? Well, then that's why I'm asking the question now, yeah. because if yeah. it's unfeasible... Well, we'll, ask Mr. We we'll ask Mr Davy if they'd be prepared to do it, and then we have to ask Highways whether that can be conditioned and whether that's appropriate. We'll ask the officers in the debate. So, Mr Davy. Uh, absolutely. There is a condition in the existing consent that requires signage to go up to advise against left turns when the new junction onto Bramford Road is created. So we'll be quite happy to do it temporarily for Addison Way as well. And my client does have control of Addison Way, so we can put uh, signs up all along that road. Um, and if you want to add an extra condition on, if you decide to grant permission, then we'd be very happy with that. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you for your question, Councillor Stringer, very helpful. Councillor Norris, can those take your hands down who have spoken? Because I'm I've got a bit of a messy screen at the moment. Councillor Norris, please. Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, the question has just been asked that I was going to ask oh. about signage at this uh, junction uh, to try and deter uh, traffic, HGV traffic, from turning left along the B Trouble 1 3 through, through Great Blake and Man Needham Market. So that one's been dealt with. But you did make reference to certain matters. You referred to certain matters coming forward in conjunction with Snowasis. Could you just elaborate on that, please? Um, I, I wish I could, but um, as I understand it, there are certain uh, improvements to Bramford Road that have been agreed with the County Highway Authority and with the your district that the Snowasis development will deliver. I see. And can, can I just stop you there? Um, can I just stop you there and ask Sam to answer that question rather than give you um, the difficulty of answering it? Sam, could you just comment on it, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Nick is uh, correct. There, there are junk. There are improvements from the Snowasis on on Bramford Road and in the area that we are trying to make sure that, that each um, mitigation complements each other and timing as well. Councillor right. Norris, is that fine? Okay, that's, that's fine. I understand now. Thank you. If okay. you can take your hand down and then I'll see if there's any more left because I've got quite a busy yeah. screen here. Have we, who, who else? Or have we all finished asking questions? I've still got one hand up. I don't know who it is. Is it me? Councillor Field. <laughs> Thank you, pardon. I only just put that up. All right. <laughs> the the point I'd like either Nick Davy or Sam Harvey to answer still is uh, I, I I accept the answers he's, he's made so far. It is the one on I say on page forty four is, is the obvious point. Christopher Fish comments that it can be confirmed it does not now appear to be feasible to complete the construction of the shared route along the west side of Bramford Road that was required in the original permission. I just want to be clear that that's being delivered, you know, that, that somewhere in this confusion we have some certainty that the footways and cycleways can be delivered because that implies 
they can't. I think the best person would be Sam, first of all, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. There, we are working with a developer with regard to Section 278 for the works for the original application. There are some engineering difficulties that we've got to overcome for where the actual footway is going, if it is with which verge it's um, going on. At the moment, I don't have the information in front of me what, what the latest is, but we just want to make sure that we, we will be working together with the developer to make sure that their cycle and footway uh, pedestrian facilities are put in place for the original application, but it may be that it's not on the verge that was originally specified. That's very helpful. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I've been told that Councillor Warboys, you had your hand up. I just can't see it, unfortunately. So Councillor Warboys, you had a question, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, it, it, we, it's coming back to Christopher Fisher's letter. There's uh, a, a present. Uh, I think I'm safe in assuming that all the construction traffic and HGV traffic is Can going down. Can you just down. ask the question, actually, because we're, we're entering into debate here and we've been sort of labouring quite a lot. So what is the question? Down Addison Way. And Addison Way does not have separate pedestrian or cyclist facilities through to the site. Uh, you've mentioned bollards being put up, no waiting bollards. Are there any other measures along Addison Way to... Uh, ensure the safety of pedestrians and cyclists using that route into the site, especially as it's mixed with construction traffic and potentially... Yeah, if you ask your question, vehicles. you don't need to embellish it, if you don't mind, please. I just needed to make it clear. Sorry. I'm sure it's quite clear. Uh, do you wish me to answer that, uh, Chair? Yes, please. If you, yeah, if you've um, any other help. Yeah. Sorry, there are no bollards along Edison Way. Parking is controlled by uh, AMPR cameras and, and then patrols. Um, and there is a scheme to upgrade Addison Way and deal with some drainage issues there, which would include putting in a new um, uh, cycleway, but that will probably not be, that'll be probably delivered in the same time, same time frame as a new junction. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Warboys. I hope that answers your question. And with Sam giving us the Thank debate you. earlier, I hope that's helped there. Excellent. Right, we now move on to the debate. So if we may start the first round, if you would, please. Um, and if we can start with Councillor Caston, please. Thank you. Councillor Warboys, can you take your hand down, please? Sorry, one second, Madam Chair. No, that's all right. It's it's been one of those IT days, hasn't it, or not? It's um yeah, it's going quite slowly, but um I think I'm there. So um with this, I it does seem um that that the the first way this was um this was laid out was the right way. It it doesn't seem like the developers tried in any way to um do things any differently it's, it seems like it was its externalities that have caused this delay um that doesn't make any difference on whether this is acceptable or not whose fault it is um i do have quite large concerns with lorries going down the b treble one three to need a market um which it seems very unlikely because it's such a straightforward way to um go down the um onto straight onto the a14 but um if there was with if there's congestion at certain times on that roundabout going onto the a14 um it could pose a problem i think um the amendment that's been talked about the 12 months instead of 24 months sounds like it would do a lot less harm than 24 months um the um, signage that Councillor Stringer spoke about, I think, is a very good idea. You've just got to manage that so it's the people coming off that site and it's not at the end of Addison Way. It's, um, yeah, it's it's a difficult one. I, I think this is a really important development. I wouldn't want to hold it up or 
um, cause cause problems on this. But I also think at the same time we do need to keep HGVs from travelling down that B treble one three regularly and the and the, the nuisance that that would cause. Um, Addison Way, if um, the developers said that there's there's capacity on Addison Way, it concerned me when I thought there wasn't capacity on Addison Way, but it seems like that capacity is for the whole site when it's built. Um, uh, you know um, that 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 will be over capacity. It will, it will still remain under capacity with this one um, it, it, occupation. So. I don't know. I think those amendments do make a um, a big difference to um, this application. If um, other members considered they would put them on, I'd, I'd, I think that would improve it. Thank you. Um, thank you for for that, uh, Councillor Caston. Um, as we move forward, that might well be something to put on. So if we can now come back to Councillor Gould, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, this proposal obviously has uh, brings huge economic benefits. Uh, I've been struck by the pragmatism, the flexibility uh, that the applicant has shown in discussions uh, on this matter. And I think the, the proposal to reduce the 24 months to 12 months uh, for me, um, is a bit of a clincher in terms of uh, supporting this application and the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Gould. Councillor Humphreys, thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I also agree this is um, huge e economic benefits to, to the region, especially in the, in the current climate. It's really important we get on with this. Um, I don't see any massive uh, issues with the two condition changes, to be honest with you. And, uh, and I agree with Council Goal on the 12 month. That's the clincher, really. Um, but it is, it, like I say, it is what it is. We, we're caught where we are because of COVID. That's part of the problem. The conditions aren't unreasonable. I think they're fair and generally safe. And um, I'm minded to, uh, to approve as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now we will come to Councillor Mellon, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I, I won't go over what other councillors have said. Um, I think if the 12 month limit and the temporary signage can be conditioned, I'd be minded to approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Councillor Norris. Thank you, yes. Um, I'm just still very concerned about this HGV traffic turning left, but if it can be put in as a condition, then I think it serves to um, placate me somewhat. So, uh, yes, that was my major concern. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Councillor Norris. Councillor Stringer. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, say, I, I think, can I just have a resume where we are? Do we have a proposer and a seconder yet? No, no, we're going through. We the don't. OK, that's fine. Uh, just wondering. So uh, I, I say I'm slightly wary about approving something that's relying on something else we may or may not approve at this meeting <laughs> that relies on stuff happening there that that almost seems to be an, an order thing uh but but yeah we'll take that as, as 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 sort of we'll look at that when we get to it i think if we could condition that no traffic turns left uh from this development as it was conditioned originally uh using a different solution i think that would that would be most helpful to to get this uh, to where uh, a compromise position between the developer and the communities will be affected if traffic starts turning left because it won't just be great blake and it will be all along that route through through a conservation area in needham market as well so i think we owe that duty to make sure as yeah. little as that traffic turns left coming out of there as per the original condition thank you chair Thank you, Councillor Stringer. Councillor Warboys, please. I think I think uh, I'd just like to support Councillor Stringer's marks. The the signage about turning left um, from Addison Way 
and also the implementation of the 12 month uh, limit. Uh, um, otherwise, I think it's important to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Warboys. Um, I, I just have um, a question from Sam just um, before we move on. Um, did you not say there were weight restrictions on certain roads, Sam, that um, would hopefully help us as well um, making a decision now? Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Chair. Yes, there are weight restrictions of HGVs through um, going north through Needham Market and there's also weight restrictions going through to Sproughton. So um, these weight restrictions are enforced by the police. Um, so if there are anybody, if there are any HGVs that are going down those routes that they shouldn't, then obviously they can, um, the police will enforce it. It is, uh, but putting the additional signage in can remind them that there is an, a, a weight restriction to the north and to the south so that could be implemented as well so so as well as what you're saying as well is as well as just saying no left turn weight restriction on that sign as well yeah we could enforce we, it we, we could we could advise working obviously with a developer that there could be just an information sign saying weight restrictions to the north and south use a 14 yeah, yeah. Um, right. Well, um, I've, I've listened to the debate. There's been a lot of um, IT upset today and I do apologise for that. So I'm not going to be long winded about this. I think there's been some excellent points made by um, all members there. Um, so if anybody would like to make a recommendation of they will, if they'd like to put their hand up, I'd be happy to hear what their recommendation is and any additional mitigations. Anybody going for a proposal or are we going round again? Councillor Humphreys and then Councillor Stringer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, uh, Councillor Stringer, I think I've just got in before you, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to support what you said, really. So I'd like to move for approval on this with the condition, and Councillor Stringer, come back to me because I guess you're going to second this, that um, we do have the 12 month period imposed. And secondly, that there is ample signage to prevent traffic turning left um, down towards Needham Market and Claydon. Um, if that's in agreement, Councillor Stringer, I'd like to say I think I've preempted you, but uh, hopefully you'll agree with that. So that's the proposal at the moment, Councillor Stringer, please. Yep, th thank you, Chair. I, I, I will then second second this, although I, I still have that nagging doubt because although we've been told that the cycle and walking routes will, will be put in, uh, it be really nice to see it timetabled and, and and all of that ready to go given that we've we've seen other, other delays but we've had that assurance and we must take that on trust which we do i will then be relatively comfortable in second this application thank you chair thank you for that i will go around everybody and ask to speak to the motion but can i have um either vincent or um john to make sure that our extra recommendation is worded correctly can we have that put forward please to the satisfaction of councillor humphreys and stringer to start with please thank you so i'm um, sorry i've just caught up to the other bit we just said um so instead of so as far as 20, uh, condition 20 is concerned uh where the requested amendment is within 24 months we're changing that to within 12 months and in terms of uh, all of the rest of the recommendation that remains the same but we are imposing an additional condition to require temporary signage to avoid left turn and a reminder of weight restrictions to be agreed is that that's how i've got it so far chair and i think there was a possibility people wanted in addition uh, to use the a14 is that feasible would that be reasonable john on those signs in Sorry, well, the signage would say don't go left. Left or right, so you have to go the other way. Councillor Humphreys, yeah, are you uh, satisfied with that addition? Yeah, Madam Chair, that's that's bang on. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Stringer. Yeah, happy with that, Chair. Right. So anybody who wants to speak to the motion, if you put your hands up, I'll try and keep up with you. Councillor Mellon. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just an additional point, and I'm not sure if this would work, but since we have... AMPR in the location, could that be used in any way to 
help the um, help avoid traffic going left? Uh, it's a bit of a technical question, but I just sort of thought of it. Well, I don't think we can add that to a condition, but it's a point that we could make a note of. Uh, do you think, John, for the for the? Um, I think I wouldn't want to go there for God, various reasons. Because it's their like, own, I, isn't it? Yeah. Safety protection is going to be all sorts of problems there, as well as how would you use it? I, I wouldn't yeah, have a clue. Yeah. I'm sorry to say. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that, Councillor Mellon. Anyone else wishing to speak to the motion, please? No, in that case, then may we go for a vote, please? And um, Robert, if you'd like to take the call, please. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Do you want? Did Did anybody want that read out in full again, or are we happy with what we've got? I think we're happy, aren't we? Yeah. Go for the Go for the roll. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So, if members could please respond with for, against, or abstain. So, Councillor James Carston. For. Councillor Peter Gould? Four. Councillor Cathy Guthrie? Four. Councillor Barry Humphreys? Four. Councillor Andrew Mellon? Four. Councillor Mike Norris? Four. Councillor Andrew Stringer? Four. And Councillor Roland Warboys? Four. Thank you, Chair. That is unanimously carried. Um, right. Yes, I, I agree, carried. Thank you for that. Um, can I suggest we take a 10 minute break um, or five, uh, 10 minutes um, to get everybody sorted? And can the applicant for the next um, application be sure that they've got their telephone ready so that we can um, deal with the application in that fashion again? I think that was more helpful. Thank you. So if we take a 10 minute break, thank you.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, we now move on to the next application, um, land adjacent to Port One Business and Logistics Park. And I'll ask Vincent to once again um, give us his presentation. And I believe he's now got everything on the IT sorted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Can everyone hear me and can everyone see the first slide? Well, I certainly can, so let's hope everybody can. Okay. Right, just to remind members, this item did come before you on the 28th of October and was deferred. Um, so what I... So this is a revised presentation. It will be shorter than the previous one. What I intend to do is simply... We know where it is because we've just looked at all that, so I just slide through those. What we're looking at are the following items, and these are the items that members previously asked me to go away and report back on, and that is what I'll do. So I'll do it topic by topic. So the first question that arose was, what are the indicative building heights? Because we had reference to Snowasis at 93 metres and um, the energy from waste building, which is also a tall building, I can confirm that the two blue coloured buildings on your screen are suggested as having a ridge height of 17.5 metres from the ground. That building 18.5 metres from the ground. That one 14 and a half and that one 20.5. There was reference in the previous report to 40 metres. That 40 metres is the is a reference to datum. The reference that you see on the screen is absolutely ground to ridge. So apologies for any confusion that my previous report um, caused. If we compare that to existing buildings, you'll notice absolute, I was going to say parity. In some cases, the proposed buildings are suggested as being lower, but broadly speaking, similar to the existing building that is currently under construction, the one that has just been handed over to FDS. So hopefully that provides the um, comfort that members were looking for, that we're not talking about super high buildings. There is a shot of the building that's currently under construction. Obviously, it's much more advanced than that image shows. The application site we're looking at at the moment is, is in that position. Provided contour, so you'll see there is quite a bit of levelling to be undertaken so that each of those buildings has a flat floor, which is understandable. Again, some more shots of the existing building. And as you know from the road, the site slopes up towards the plantations. So the next question was, what is the impact on the plantations? And on this screen, the red zigzag line is the area in which the occupiers of the property in the white circle, they wanted to shield their views from quarrying activity that was at the time underway and also the commercial activity to the east, hence the plantations in this area in between the building and the red zigzag were planted to provide additional screening from unsightly views. The current proposal has been discussed extensively with the occupier of that that building and the extent of tree loss has been agreed with the owner um, between Kurz and De Vere and the occupier. So they are fully aware and have endorsed not just the loss of trees, but also the replanting. Here's a shot of the site. So you can see the extent of the plantation. You can just see what will be snow oasis, but presently the disused quarry just to the top of that image and the existing industrial sheds uh, within Port One. If 
if I've, I overlay the scheme that you saw in October over the plantation, I'll just do that again so you can see. You'll notice that it's actually the unit at the top that eats into the plantation. Since 28th of October, we have discussed moving that building with the applicants and they have agreed to move the building plot eight at the top of that image further to the east to allow extra sections of the plantation to be retained. That isn't something that members asked for, but we did pursue it in an attempt to ensure that that planting belt remained uh, a good depth. So on the screen, you'll see on the left, the current latest position for plot eight and on the right you'll see the version that you saw in October. Not only has the building moved to the east but it's also been dropped from the northern boundary so we have ensured that we've now got a thicker buffer to the west and to the north and members will recall that the public footpath runs along the north of that left to right Blue Barn Lane. So again, there'll be added um, landscape buffer from the public footpath. What I've done there is simply overlay one over the other so you can see the differences. we we'll come to the tree survey in a moment. In terms of the cross section, there you have at the top an existing cross section through what would be the building on plot eight. What you saw in October, the building in that position, the narrowest part of the buffer retained was 11 metres. Since that meeting, with the amendment we've secured for the meeting today, what we have done is the moving of the building further to the east has added another 10 metres to the retained buffer. I'll also notice if we take a long section through the site is that the height of the buildings would be below the tops of the trees in any event. So at the suggested ridge heights this whole development should be screened by the existing trees to the north and the west. Another series of cross sections. This one shows the relationship between the building that's just been handed over, plot four, and the proposed building on plot nine. So whilst the ridge heights may be similar, because the land drops in the location of plot nine, the ridge height will actually be significantly below the ridge height of the existing building. That's just to give members comfort that um, ridge heights are not going to be intrusive. And again, some further uh, cross sections here through plot six. So the existing trees are 15 metres high. They're between uh, 10, 12 in metres high in places, but here they're 15 metres. They are still young trees. They've only been in place for, uh, I think, 12 years. So they will continue to grow and their height will continue to provide added screening. But at the moment, you'll notice ridge height is already on a par with and in places below the existing tops of trees. Again, another shot just to demonstrate that that is true for the whole length of this, this site. What I've done on this side is in the royal blue square is the new location for plot eight and in the the mid blue is the amount of plantation that will be lost and we absolutely accept that some of the plantation will be lost these are coniferous trees and as i say they that has been agreed with the occupier of the, the property to the west in terms of the quality of those trees I'm not sure whether you, my cursor is showing or not, but midway between seven and eight, you'll see some green trees on the left. 
they are category A trees, they are being retained. Um, at the bottom of that picture, in positions on plots five and six, there will be some category B trees lost, but that would have been true of the previous scheme. And again, highlighting the extent of tree loss. I have another slide that, that provides a summary of that. There is extensive new planting throughout the, the scheme. If we cut to the whole of that area and the bottom of that screen, you'll notice a, a new pond bottom left and that area of lime green is all new planting and the new water feature. There is planting throughout the development to actually soften the visual impact within the, the scheme, but there is extensive replanting as recompense for the loss of the plantation to the north west of the site. What I would say is as well that the trees within that lime coloured area will be deciduous. So we will be losing conifers, which are not as um, wildlife supportive as deciduous trees and getting a large area of deciduous woodland back on the, the site to complement the mixed deciduous woodland plantation that isn't being eaten into. So hopefully what we're doing is actually enhancing the ecological value of the site and enhancing biodiversity at the same time. Obviously, when I say we, I am referring to the, the applicant, but we have, as officers, have through negotiation ensured that that adequate replanting is in and that it's deciduous woodland. I think I do want to refer to Blakenham Woodland Garden because the late Lord Blakenham planted an extensive um, array of trees, almost an arboretum to the southwest and there may have been some concern in some quarters that this scheme would somehow adversely impact that very special area that is open to the public at certain times of the year. Now if I can just illustrate Blakenham Woodland Garden is broadly in the area with the red arrow. The purple dot is a cottage, well, it's a rather fine house, but it is known as the cottage. The application site is to the top right hand corner of that picture. So what I can confirm is that the scheme before you will not in any way adversely affect the uh, rich mixture of trees within the woodland garden. Now turn to the proposed access and highway works. That is the, the access arrangement that you saw earlier. But what we are looking at is the signals at the junction at the moment allow this set of movements. Now what I've tried to do is animate them. So those, the signals are in the positions sh shown. So if you are approaching port one, that's where you will be held at, at the moment. Obviously, in this direction, you can go straight through. And when you're coming towards the A14, you can do that movement. But what would happen is, of course, you can then, these are all controlled, these movements here. What this scheme will deliver that the previous outline didn't is the signalization of the new access. And this has all kinds of benefits. So if you're traveling north towards port one, you will be able to just slip into the site through through here. Coming out, you would be held at the signals, traveling north again, signals, traveling south, signals. Now in terms of the movements you can then do, this is the point that certainly Councillor Norris, Councillor Field, you were most anxious to um, see delivered, is coming out of the new access, you would only be able to turn right. There will be no left turn. That's for all traffic. So that immediately um, 
sends traffic towards the A14. Also included is the provision of a Toucan crossing as part of the signalisation works. Again, that links in with the footway cycleway improvements already secured, the three metre wide connection. And again, this enhances um, the benefits of that cycle pedestrian network. We've already explored the arrangement for access prior to the formation of that junction. And as we've discussed, a range of movements are possible out of Addison Way, but with the amended condition that now has the temporary signage, that will hopefully better control the, the use of that junction in the interim, which is now only 12 months as we was previously agreed. We've already examined the closure of Addison Way Port One connection. So we won't go through that one in any more detail, but what this demonstrates is that's the movement we are reinforcing as a result of the signalisation. Mentioned we have already secured the minibus shuttle service. This is just an illustration that will be tied in with the new permission, the if it's granted the consent would be linked to all the previous deeds of variation and the original section 106. As we looked, that is the route. We explored that earlier, so we'll skim through that. In terms of traffic, I think there was some concern that perhaps Highways England hadn't been intimately involved with the, the modelling. What I can confirm is that Highways England and Suffolk County Council have worked very closely together. The Suffolk model has been used. Additional work was required by both Highways England and Suffolk County Council uh, Local Highway Authority to rerun models using the, the Suffolk model and Highways England is entirely satisfied uh, with the, the scheme. They're satisfied with all the inputs to the model and they are satisfied that the outputs result in managed traffic flow and should not cause problems. I think there was some concerns that there may have been extra uh, congestion on the junction with the A14, but that isn't the case as reviewed by Highways England and Suffolk County Council. Let's close that because that's stopping it moving on. So in terms of accessing the A14 from the Claydon interchange. You come, slip off the A14, you swing right into port one with the signals. Coming out, you are directed to the A14, but if you actually wanted to go back down south down the Brownford Road, that is the move you make. So everything is geared towards taking traffic out of Bramford Road travelling north. We also explored with the previous item the weight restrictions that are in place in Sproughton and, and Needham Market. So this is part of an overall strategy to provide Needham Market with relief from HGVs. Again, Highways England to confirm that capacity at Junction 52 exists and that this scheme would not cause problems. Highways England support the extensive range of sustainable travel incorporated with the, the package. As we say, the actual minibus shuttle and the um, emergency out of hours taxi service is something I've, I've never seen provided before. So that really is quite an innovation. And the extensive cycle network improvements, um, again, have been recognised by Highways England as a, a real benefit to this scheme. Suffolk County Council, very happy with the proposals. And as I say, they've been extensively involved in negotiation and they have pushed the traffic consultants working for uh, Curzon de Vere very hard to do additional modelling and to incorporate the Suffolk model. So actually that work has been 
very transparent and it has used the model that um, Suffolk and the Highways England have developed. So the inputs and the outputs have been shared. In terms of ecology, I think there was some concern that perhaps our colleagues at Place Services had been lent on to provide some supportive uh, comments. But what I would say is they are very happy to accept the proposal because built into the scheme is a an extensive network of new wetland habitat. You'll notice some of that is off site in terms of the creation of the ponds. That is actually in agreement with the landowner as part of the recompense for some of the tree loss within the plantation. And as you'll recall, members that dealt with snow oasis just to the north, that also includes an extensive network of uh, newt reserves and water features for great crested newts. This actually picks up the same theme in terms of providing a corridor, a wet corridor for invertebrates. But also, as I explained earlier, included is extensive new woodland planting as a compensation for the loss of trees within the, the site. Our view is that provision of deciduous woodland is ecologically better than the loss of conifers. In terms of drainage, there was some concern expressed previously about how will this site be drained and will it add to existing flooding problems. Extensive work has been done behind the scenes. Examples of the, the work that's been submitted is, is on the screen. So in terms of what exists at the moment, very little in terms of flooding on the site. You'll see some pockets at the um, junction between three prongs of Bramford Road, but very little within, in fact, hardly, that's almost nothing, isn't it, within the site. But how the system will work is that a whole new system of swales and, and drainage will be provided. So the pulsing blue is the drainage will be flowing to the south and a series of new swales will connect to a new infiltration base shown at the bottom of that, that screen. So surface water will be held in the infiltration basin and will gradually release into existing swales. Everything is moving south. Uh, Suffolk County Council as the Surface Water Authority are satisfied with that as a design principle. But it also has the benefit of in, uh, improving biodiversity by creating these new wetland areas within the, the swales. So we're confident that the applicant is able to address uh, water flood issues and as reserve matters come in, if members are minded to grant permission, that would all be worked up in terms of the detail. But the principle that the strategy is certainly acceptable. There we have some more confirmation. The deed of variation that we've referred to is required to ensure that were members to approve this scheme, all existing commitments, that includes the footway cycleway, the um, sustainable travel benefits would all be linked to this scheme. We're also um, controlling the signalisation through conditions and Sam and the team at Suffolk County will be able to control that as well through the section 278. So on that basis, I am continuing to recommend that permission be granted for this development subject to that deed of variation linking it to existing consents. Um, on the basis that the concerns that were raised and the areas that needed clarification, the applicant has satisfactorily addressed all of those points. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you for that, Vince. Um, just before I ask members for questions, I do have a question for Sam. Um, the uh, potential for somebody to go in the correct direction round the roundabout of the A14 and back down. Is the signage there that says that there are weight restrictions, etc., already? Thank you, Chair. I do believe there is. I'll just check for you. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much. Um, so do we have questions for Vincent on this, please? And we have first of all, Councillor Caston, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I just um, wondered with this um, new layout, is there a um, security fence? Um, and where does that security fence um, lay in relation to the, um, the map of this? The answer, Councillor Caston, is that conditions would control the means of enclosure. Um, but what we would be very careful to do is ensure that wherever there is a boundary on the public frontage, we're not looking at sort of uh, palisade fencing, that it is attractive. Um, but that is a matter that would be resolved at reserve matters in the event that members are minded to uh, grant outline permission. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for um, Vincent? If there is, I unfortunately can't see. Uh, oh, Councillor Humphreys, beg your pardon. Councillor Humphreys, then Councillor Norris. Madam Chair, thank you. It's just it's a minor thing. The uh, the shuttle bus. Can you confirm whether that would be electric or um, or some other renewable energy source? Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. I can't although i know that details have been submitted to the county council but have not yet been approved it would seem eminently sensible that if that hasn't been agreed that we do encourage the use of a, an electric vehicle so i'm quite happy that um, we take that up with the the applicant um, it is a matter that would be resolved via condition and has that hasn't been approved yet there is nothing stopping us suggesting it would that be dealt with at reserve matters or now well actually it's, it's dealt with now because the yeah, outline good. planning permission requires the submission of those details mr davy earlier is, said that he had provided those details but at the moment we haven't approved them so Taking up Councillor Humphrey's point, it seems eminently sensible to at least explore the ability to use an electric vehicle. That would be perfectly in line with the Council's um, philosophy. Councillor Humphrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I was going to say, did you have any further questions? No, I'll raise it in debate. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Councillor Norris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question. On page 166, Suffolk Fire and Rescue in red type say hydrants are required for this development, but I don't see any mention of them in the conditions. I suggest that they sh could perhaps be added. That's all. Thank you. Perfectly um, acceptable suggestion and should have been picked up by me. So thank you for that, Councillor Norris. And I'm afraid I can't see who else has got their hands up. Has anyone else got their hands up? I've, I've got my hand up, Councillor. Yeah, if you can hang on for one more moment, um, oh. Councillor Field. Oh, Are there well. any other members? Yeah, um, uh, Councillor Mellon here. Can't we, yeah, I just can't see them. They're not coming up. Councillor Mellon, if you would like to. Um, yeah, thank you. It's just a, a question for Vince, a clarification. Um, in the presentation, um, Mr. Pierce, you, you you majored on the fact that um, one of the plots, plot eight, had been adjusted to reduce the amount of tree loss. But it seems to me that most of the trees are being lost from plots five and nine, and there's no particular amelioration there. Can you just confirm that's the case? Certainly, yeah, five and nine existing trees are being lost. They are at the very best category B trees, but the new deciduous woodland in the southwest corner is larger than the area of 
coniferous plantation being lost in the northwest corner. So that is actually compensation, not just for the northwest corner loss, but also the loss of trees within the middle of the site. What I didn't highlight in that scheme is that between plots five and nine, the majority of A category trees that are, are within that group are being retained in an open space. But the answer is overall compensation is for both areas, not just the plantation. And yes, trees are being lost within the middle of the site. Thank you. No further questions, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see anyone else except Councillor Field, if you'd like to ask your question now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, a couple, couple of questions, actually. Um, I'm sure I asked last time, but I'll ask again. Uh, there was a scheme to run heating pipes from the incinerator to the greenhouses, and that seems to be coming back to life at the moment. I just wanted to be sure that it's not being precluded by anything in this development. So that's a simple one. The second one really around Highways England. Uh, the, the, the presenter assured us that Highways England and, and the County Highways are now fully satisfied with the, the traffic analysis. I uh, just wanted to be sure that they did question the analysis that was applied to the Claydon Junction and that's a point where I witness uh, regular congestion at the moment with current traffic volumes, not extended traffic volumes. So just be unsure where that's recorded because I didn't see it in the papers anywhere and uh, an assurance that it's true because some of the congestion seems to be due to current um, road marking configurations. Um, I wondered whether there's an estimate for the increased HGV and other traffic from this development, because again, I didn't see that. It would be somewhat normal, I would imagine. And uh, accepting that uh, Marcia Blake and are now, are now evidently happy with the trees, um, and I'll leave that with there. Uh, the issue about uh, Natural England's concerns about the site of special scientific interest, the backed colonies and the impact on those, that doesn't seem to have progressed forward, although we have a great list of um, everywhere they went or whatever, a great list of uh, what was done, but no, no analysis of, of the results of that. I wonder if we could have some clarity on those points, please. Thank you, uh, Councillor Field. In terms of uh, recycled heat, there, sh there shouldn't be anything in this scheme that precludes that. And in theory, if there is that available additional energy, there's probably no reason why potentially this scheme couldn't benefit from it as well. Um, it was perfectly in line with um, the Council's philosophy in terms of energy conservation. Uh, we also know that Snow Oasis is, is looking to generate most of its, its own power as well. So I see nothing in this that will preclude the benefits that you've set out. In terms of the junction, I will leave that to Sam Harvey to deal with, but in terms of bats, the place services are happy with the solutions that have been come up up with it, not only in terms of bats, but also newts and other fauna. So that's in terms of the answer is place services are happy provided, and there is a proviso, provided that we do secure the additional woodland planting and that we do secure the new wetland habitats. And of course, we will do that by condition. I don't know, Sam, whether you want to just pick up on Councillor Field's detailed points about the junction on the A14 and how the modelling looked into that. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr Pearce. The Highways England responded to the new, uh, well, the additional information and the additional uh, modelling that the developer put forward. They they um, responded on the 15th of May where they have no objection 
to the proposal and in their comments at the bottom they're saying that the junction 52 they were queried the, um, the measurements given they note that these have now been taken into consideration and is unlikely to affect the outputs of the model um, result the presented model appears to show that the junction is predicted to operate within capacity with the proposed development trips and also they're happy with the sustainable travel um, put forward for the minibus so that's where highways england p p position is actually on on the website so does that mean some they have specifically dealt with that issue raised by yes the field yes i believe so could could i just ask a supplementary question to that yes please do john which is, which is basically that the junction currently jams back to over past the river not all the way to the energy from waste plant but across the river so how can it be okay with increased flow i'm not talking about a simulation which clearly is the best way of estimating often but can be an error but actual practical current experience Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the the information that we have been given with the uh, the model obviously shows um, that, that the junction will operate within capacity. I'm afraid I haven't recently been going um, anywhere near that junction during the peak hour, so I'm able unable to give comment on the queues. But the model is showing that the junction will operate within uh, parameters allowed by Highways England and ourselves. Sorry, Thank can I you. ask a supplementary myself of Sam? So does that mean if it's below capacity, that doesn't, does it or doesn't it mean that at times you will be in a queue of some sort? Yes, yes. During the, during the peak hour, there, there will be queues um, um, within, but it's within parameters that are allowable uh, with, a, um, with How Is England and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Right, um, so we've all had our questions there. Um, so we don't have a representative from the parish council objector or supporter. So let's hope that Nick Davey can get back in um, with his telephone and we'll hear from the applicant if we can, please. Oh, yes. I have been here all the time, can you hear me? Yes, that's excellent. Thank you. Fantastic. Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to emphasise that this looks a big site, but 30% of the developable area so of the site already has the mission, and it's only 18%, which is new development. The rest of it, well over half, is actually existing and proposed replacement tree planting and biodiversity enhancement measures, which Mr Pierce has described. And that percentage will go up as we've now reduced the size of the units on plot eight. Um, and as a result of that, the tree belt to the west and the north has doubled in size. And if I could just also pick up on one slide that uh, Mr. Pierce put up, um, he showed the loss of the tree planting between unit nine and Bramford Road. That is actually not being lost, that has been retained in full. And I can confirm that all security fences will be on the plot side, so there'll be nothing on the uh, on any road frontage. Um, now we have ex surveyed very, very extensively for bats, badgers, great crested newts and reptiles and your ecological consultants and they've taken the advice of Natural England and their representations on board and they were satisfied even before the latest changes that any adverse impact upon uh, protected species and habitats could be appropriately mitigated. We've incorporated a full suite of sustainable construction and on-site generation, uh, energy generation measures into the scheme, which meet fully Council's requirements. Uh, Mr Pierce has discussed building heights, so I won't go into them further. But just to say, majority of the land to the west is being purchased from the Blakenham Estate and Lady Blakenham, and she employed her own landscape consultants to make sure that the buildings wouldn't be seen and would be below the trees, and she will retain all that land in her control, and it's part of the, the uh, agreement with her that the buildings can't be seen. Um, we've diligently worked with uh, statutory consultees to address every concern, as you've heard. I won't go into a flood risk again. Um, on traffic flows, the Suffolk model, as I understand it, uh, does in, uh, include the junction. 
It's based on traffic flows provided by the county and it includes all the traffic generated from the Snow Oasis development. And um, both the County and Highways England are okay with it. Um, the only additional things we've been asked to do are to add traffic lights onto the junction and to add an additional crossing on Bramford Road near the Addison Way junction, which we're doing. Um, a couple of other matters. Uh, yes, we can look at electricity or electric uh, bus or the shuttle bus. Those are still to be agreed. And plot nine, unit nine, we are purchasing from the uh, greenhouse developer. And in that agreement is that he can run heating pipes through plot nine if he wants to. Uh, so in summary, the site is attracting, you know, it's a fantastic site, brilliant position, and it's attracting a lot of interest. If we do get the go ahead for this enlarged scheme, my client's confident that not only will he build out what he's got consent for, but there'll be great demand for the rest of the scheme and we'll be delivering hundreds of jobs in the next two to five years. Um, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you for that. Um, do members have any questions for Mr Davey, please? Mr Councillor Caston, please. Um, this is a um, question out of interest more. Um, why on these type of developments don't we put um, solar panels over the entirety of the roofs? Um, w from your point of view, I'd just be quite interested. I think this does affect this um, development, but maybe not a key point. We um, just stick to the planning application before us. So if we can turn that round and say, why are you not putting... So okay. Why roof. are you not putting solar panels <laughs> across the entirety of the roof? We're, Thank we're putting Thank you, what, what your policy requires. So 10% of energy will be generated from uh, on each building. But also these are warehouses. They're unheated. They, they, they don't actually use a lot of energy. It's only the office um, parts of it, which are a very small part of the building, which needs uh, heating and uh, need 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 power. The rest of it is, is just to operate the, the racking systems and the lighting. So they're, they're largely unheated spaces. I, I, okay, I, think that's, I think we've got the question and the answer there. Um, Councillor Caston, well done for asking that. Um, does anyone else have any questions for the applicant? Councillor Field, then you're the only other one. Thank you. Nice to be unique. Uh, Councillor Caston, I think, has stolen my question, but but I was <laughs> going to point out that uh, it's not a matter of heating. You know, the solar farms being presented uh, are on unheated fields. It's for generating of electricity for profit or to supply the things you do. But uh, um, I guess that's not a question. I was um, just going to say, what is your question, Councillor Fee? <laughs> I won't repeat Councillor Caston's question. OK, so it's been covered then. It's yeah. been covered. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Um, so you now have your slot, Councillor Field, to tell us um, your thoughts on this application. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I've said some of it before today. Um, yeah, and basically, the first thing I wanted to make is the point that, you know, in general, one's in favour of development in areas that are appropriate and that match the current economy, the issues of high, uh, COVID, the impending hard Brexit uh, and uh, the increased use of digital techniques in general. So uh, this meets many of those criteria, uh, certainly as it's close to the A14. But I would point uh, members to the comments of both parish councils. Um, uh, they seem quite extensive and, and considered. Um, you may want to wonder whether the um, changes that the landowner has introduced or persuaded the developer to introduce to tree lines actually addresses the issues that Little Blakenham Parish had. Uh, so so there are the positive things in, in, a, in a way. Um, the concerns still really are the uh, traffic, uh, it's, it's access uh, to through um, Needham Market and, and through Great Blakenham itself seems to be being controlled, providing that new junction goes in. And we've discussed that earlier today. Um, the concerns with the 
traffic flowing to the A14, I'm afraid I find less than satisfying. Um, uh, we maybe have got some simulations that say all is OK, but if you actually visit uh, the, the site now, bearing in mind current traffic flows are substantially less than they will be when there's 600 people employed and the large number of HGVs that are on the drawings flowing in and out of this site regularly. So that's an issue of not perhaps that we mustn't ever build anything here. It's an issue of there are traffic concerns that could be and should be addressed. So that's what concerns me at that point. Um, you've covered sustainable traffic m m measures, uh, transport measures, foot and cycle ways, and, and I think one's reasonably satisfied with that now. Um, the height of rural buildings has been analysed. It seemed uh, that the, the slide that was presented was very new. It wasn't in the papers um, and I and other councillors had little time to assess it. But one would point out that some of these buildings are, sit on a 30 metre high ridge, at least 30 metres high ridge, and therefore are very high in the landscape that most uh, residents will view them from the road side, if you like, not from the side that uh, the Blakenham uh, establishment will view them. So there is still a concern there. Snowasis, I think, has just been rebranded as Valley Ridge, and that's been done for a purpose. It sits on the ridge of these hills. Um, and there are still issues, to my mind, with this, this site of special scientific interest. The uh, some thousands of bats that live in a tunnel down there, some of them extremely rare uh, species. So I still have significant reservations about this, but one has to admit that it is in probably in a good place um, um, in a similar way to Sproulton, Gateway 14, etc. are all in quite good places for development. So that's the end of my presentation, but I would recommend that you look at the statements from the parishes. Those councillors obviously live considerably closer to the development than I do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Field. Do members have any questions for Councillor Field? It would appear not. So we now move on to the debate and so we'll go round uh, the first time round and see how we get on there. Councillor Caston, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The um, So um, these heights I'm a lot more comfortable with now. Uh, when we previous looked at, previously looked at this, I was quite concerned about the size of these buildings. They are, don't get me wrong, they are large buildings, but um, we, we I think with the other development around there, they won't stand out. Um, the um, the planting, I, I'm really glad that the developers listened to our debate on the last in the last meeting and come back um, having moved a building to um, to stop that thinning of the um, of the boundary trees, which was a big concern of mine in the first um uh, in the first viewing of this um the the i think the the out of hours taxi is a great idea it's one of the things that gets in the way of people um cycling in they think that something might change and they might not be able to get home so that that gives them the ability to um solve that issue if that comes up that that'll make a big difference um the um yeah the um I don't see any flood issues with this. The um, the thing for me is um, one of my first jobs was on this um, site here in Great Blakenham, um, emptying containers. I'd cycled in I, before I drove. I was emptying containers and loading them up by hand. After that, I got a job at the at the um, recycling place, litter picking. So it. This this has been a really important area for me to um, get a job as a as a young teenager, you know, needing the money. Um, so 
in my yeah in, in my heart it's quite important to me that we deliver this and get these jobs i think at the moment the the junction issues at junction 52 i do agree with john field i think that there is congestion there i'm surprised that hasn't been put up um that hasn't been picked up on there but it is in front of me in black and white that that is not over capacity and that's what i have to follow i i've got nothing else to go by but i do agree with john field that it does seem to me like there are issues with um traffic um tailing back at times but um at the moment i think yeah i, th I think this is um doable now i think the changes there uh, make me happier about it it doesn't carve into the landscape quite so much with that mitigation the um Planting trees 1.5 metres apart down the far end seems like they were going to grow very tall and very thin. But um, I'm sure this has been done for a reason. But looking at this, I'm supportive of this application. But I'll, I'll listen to debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Caston. Now we'll come to Councillor Gould, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, like Councillor Caston, I'm uh, supportive of this application for the for the economic benefits it will provide um, and I'm I'm very pleased to see uh, the uh, the changes that have been made uh, to accommodate our concerns or many of our concerns uh, when this previously came before us uh, I, I think once again the the flexibility the pragmatism of the of the applicant is appreciated uh, like others I you know the the, uh, the the situations projected in in, in modelling never seems to co in, in match what things are like in reality. I sometimes wonder whether the the, the modelling is predicated on urban settings rather than our our rural settings. But um, we can only go by uh, what the, what the, the highways authority advice. Uh, so I am uh, pleased to support this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gould. Councillor Humphreys. Madam Chair, thank you. And um, yeah, I'd first like to say this was a really good presentation because it's allowed me uh, to better understand the changes that have been brought about, but also to visualise what it's going to look like in the end and also that traffic plan. So that's really important. And, and thank you for that presentation. Um, the signalisation and traffic flow is welcomed. Um, it certainly satisfies much of our concerns from the previous meeting. And, um, and I think the flow, the flow diagram for the HGV is perfect. In terms of the um, build-up of traffic and everything else, the signalisation will slow that down and actually aid the process, in my opinion, as does the signalisation at the junction as you come off the A14 to join that road. It will slow the traffic. So, so I don't think it's a major issue. I think it's a massive improvement, actually, and makes it a lot safer, as does the crossing. And I thank the developer, really, for being proactive in that and uh, to, to actually do more than actually has been requested or required. So good news. Um, the building uh, number eight, the movement of that, in my opinion, is fantastic news. It widens that belt of greenery between the quarry area and the plantation, uh, and that's good for everybody, so so fine. The heights of all the buildings, uh, having seen it now and visualised it, all below or level with the tree line currently, that's a good thing because eventually they'll merge below it, and that's excellent. The only thing I, I might say is that if you wanted to improve that, and this is probably reserve matters, um, then a slight blending camouflage scheme such as Milton Keynes, that would go a long way. Um, but that's I think that's reserved matters, just my opinion. Um, overall, this is a really important development uh, and it's a really important uh, thing that we get this through because because of employment opportunities, not just immediately in a local environment or a local area, but also nationally. This is an ideal position as well, a good link to the A14, the arterial route basically to the rest of the UK uh, via the A12 and A14, and also very close to the Port of Felixstowe. So it's the right place and it's absolutely the right time. It's critical that we, uh, we build areas for employment. That's what we're gonna get with this. Um, the only thing I would be adding, I think, if I was to go for it, um, in the conditions is probably the shuttle bus being of a um, renewable or alternative energy source. I think that's quite important and it makes the right statement. We are in that environment where we're trying to prevent damage to it and also um, with the 
new changes to the law in uh, 2030 will have been no more diesel vehicles sold new or, uh, or fossil fuel vehicles. Um, when we talk about the BATS, there's been a lot said about the BATS, but um, if I go back to page 103, it talks about the BATS from ecology. Uh, no objections subject to securing biodiversity mitigation, which I think is in there, and enhancements, which I also think is in there. And it talks about the um, survey they did. A recent survey found no evidence of bat usage and no sign of bats were found in any of the features explored. Um, it says to me there's not really an issue in this particular site within the, the red lines of the boundary. We talked about the tunnel in the quarry. That's not this site. So uh, we need to stay away from that one, I think. However, maybe a condition could go in that on the lighting, which I think is 0.12 in the in the uh, recommendation, um, that should be wildlife sensitive in those areas where it's required. I don't think there's sufficient uh, detail in the condition, and that's what I would seek to add. Um, but all in all, I think this is a really good development, an important development, and uh, and I'll be supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Humphreys. Councillor Mellon. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just be brief. Um, I do have some reservations about this development. Um, I'm concerned that it will contribute to traffic on the A14. Um, you know, the simulations and the modelling are all very well, but we know the reality um, and, and a large number of vehicle movements will um, increase the amount of traffic. Uh, some people would argue that warehousing and distribution as a sector is an un inherently unsustainable sector. Uh, you know, you could argue that point, and I have some sympathy with that. Um, it, it, it's you, you, the, the the fact of moving large quantities of of goods around the country is part of an inherently unsustainable economy, but that's a bigger argument than we're we're detailing just now. Um, there are things in this application that I welcome. The clarification on the heights, I think, um, that has sort of um, that has been very useful. Um, I welcome the changes to the plantings, although I, I do regret the tree, the trees lost. I mean, even conifers have a wildlife value. Um, but um, overall, um, I am very minded to um, to approve this and particularly welcome Councillor Humphrey's um, uh, conversion to an eco warrior. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Norris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree with the comment earlier. Very helpful presentation this morning. Um, I don't wish to repeat everything that's already been said. Uh, the only comment I would make would be to make sure that this condition about the hydrants was included. Uh, otherwise, I'm inclined to support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Norris. Councillor Stringer? Uh, Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just like to sort of say what a difference a month makes. Uh, we the the added clarity and the added value we've put into this application, I think, by the deferral uh, has been marked, uh, and I think it would, for me, change my uh, the way I would possibly vote on it. Uh, I think we. It's good that the applicant has amended to, to save some more trees. And actually, the tree thing is quite important, not just for tree huggers like myself, but but it, it, also from that mitigation from a wildlife point of view, the, the, the more screening you can get between the buildings and the other areas that surround it, obviously, the more wildlife that can exist and use those corridors. Uh, Gladly like to see a, a non fossil fuel minibus uh, uh, for the shuttle bus. That seems to be a very logical step uh, and a small way of mitigating uh, emissions uh, from the thousands of lorries that will be using it, probably using diesel engines. But of course, that will probably change in the next decade anyway. Uh, the or the important thing for me also about the it was mentioned about why aren't solar panels on all the roofs? Well, of course, some of the roofs face out of the sun, so you you're unlikely to completely cover a roof. Ha have, having said that, uh, our policy demands a certain level, but it's up to the applicant. If if they are going to forecast the future as being electric transport, they may choose to cover more of that roof with solar panels. Uh, therefore, it makes it more marketable when when we, we go into that modal shift. Uh, so for me, I think uh, locationally it's in the right place. It's been planned for to be here. 
the only little bell going off in my head uh, is obviously that issue of stacking uh, and 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 cues at that roundabout. Uh, and you can do all the modelling you like, but the reality of your own eyes and your own experience sometimes tells you otherwise. I get one of the junctions is traffic lit control, but one of them isn't. And that's the one that's often stacking up back into a village. So that's my only minus about it. I can't see that that not having data for anecdotal evidence is a way I could support refusal. It, it just isn't. So uh, I, I will I will be, I think, uh, 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 voting to approve this. But I would say, but I do have reservations about how some of this modelling has been done because my own eyes tell me there is an issue that needs to be sorted out. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stringer. Councillor Warboys. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I think I, I welcome the the changes to the um, to the the plan, uh, particular the sort of sensitive and sophisticated changes uh, by moving the the building back to double the width of the green corridor. Uh, it is important, I think, to note that it's the connectivity of these planted areas that that is is really important and i really welcome the um inclusion of a water corridor which i think is is quite a, an interesting idea i do have concerns about the traffic projections especially as there is going to be further development involving the Claydon junction but suffolk highways have modeled it and say that it's within um an acceptable level. Um, so I, I am minded to support it. It is very important to to create uh, job opportunities. Um, so it's it's good. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Warboys. Um, well, I'm not going to repeat what everybody said. Um, the improvement, um, excellent. The presentation, excellent. Uh, Councillor Humphreys refers to blending of Milton Keynes. He knows well of my photographs that I took when I went there. Um, and it's interesting to note, I think on site they already are putting panels in and I hope they don't do what they did at Woolpit, which was green at the bottom and blue at the top. But there we are. Um, I, th I think um, the developer has listened to many of the issues and uh, I'd like to thank all the members of our committee um, for putting all those points forward in the earlier meeting. So um, I, I now look to see if anybody would like to make a proposal and there were a few um, additional recommendations, for example, the electric car and lighting for wildlife. And I wonder if there's anybody who's prepared to make a proposal. Sorry, Chair, there was also hydrants. Oh, yes, hydrants. I've got them on my third one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I just come in there, Chair, if I may? Oh, yes, John. Yes, please do. Yes. Um, just to, to just clarify the discussion, um, fire hydrants uh, to be conditioned. We certainly would add that um, from from the uh, planning officer point of view, if, if not by member. Um, ultimately, uh, yes, there was a discussion about electric uh, uh, shuttle bus. Just in respect of the lighting, uh, in your papers, lighting is to be agreed. Um, so right. it, it it is a matter of what's already effectively there. We would obviously, in that agreement, look at the biodiversity side of any agreement that okay. should be made. I, I, I'm sure Councillor Humphreys would be satisfied with that. So is anybody um, going to make a proposal or do we want to go around for a further discussion? Councillor Humphreys? Madam Chair, yes, I'd like to make a proposal, please. And that proposal is for approval with the additional condition uh, that the shuttle bus be of a um, renewable energy source. And I get your point about the lighting. Um, so therefore, that's just a note, really, that we would want to see some wildlife sensitive lighting in the areas where that's applicable, but uh, not as a condition. Thank you. Do I have a second of that then, please? Hang on, I saw two. Peter, Councillor Gould, please. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd be very pleased to uh, second the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Does anyone wish to speak to the um, motion? Councillor Stringer? 
Yeah, just uh, just a, uh, a comment on the, uh, the shuttle bus. Uh, a non a, a renewable energy source could be biodiesel. So uh, I, th I think we might need to just you know uh, clarify the wording on that. Thank you. John, do you want to make any comment on that, whether we need to alter it? Shall we just say electric unless otherwise agreed? Madam Chair, if, if I may just propose, uh, uh, electric would be fine, but also hydrogen is now a new technology and that is also um, non-fossil fuel. Um, my, to make this easier, I think perhaps we should say, uh, why don't we just, do, we, we'd be better off doing it in the reverse, which is to say uh, this shall be electric unless otherwise agreed in writing with the local planning authority. And that just allows us to uh, to look at other options. Should Flexible, they come. yeah. Councillor Humphreys, would you be happy with that? More than happy, thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Gould, would you be happy with that? Yes, very happy, thank you. And speaking to the motion, I see that, oh, Councillor Custon, did you put your hand up and then take it down again? I think, have we resolved your your point? Councillor Custon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was going to suggest zero carbon, um, but I think um, we came to a conclusion on that one. Okay. So, um, I, I decided I wouldn't um, I put my hand down. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Caston. Right. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? No. In that case, we've got a proposer and a seconder. So, Robert, can you take a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Chair. So if members could please respond with for, against or abstain. <coughs> Councillor James Caston. For. Councillor Peter Gould? Four. Councillor Cathy Guthrie? Four. Councillor Barry Humphreys? Four. Councillor Andrew Mellon? Four. Councillor Mike Norris? Four. Councillor Andrew Stringer? Four. And Councillor Roland Waterboys? Four. Thank you, Chair. I'll just confirm, Mr. Prey, that is unanimously carried. Yes, this is the legal advisor. I agree unanimously carried. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to everyone. Um, because we've had such a delay this morning, um, my view would be to um, carry on and keep going. Um, it's only 20 past 12 and we've had a lot of public waiting. Um, so if that's all agreeable with you, unless I see any hands up of dissent, um, unless anybody wants a five minute quick break, um, can we carry on? And I will ask. Chair, this is Vincent. Sorry. Vincent, yes. I think it would be useful from my point of view if I could have five minutes just to make sure that because of all the technical difficulties, at least the next presentation is working smoothly. So for five minutes, then, yes, if, we, if we have just a very quick five minutes and then we'll move on, if we would, please. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm sorry there's been so much of a delay um, to enable us to present the next application. But with the IT problems we've had, um, it's really caused a delay. So I do apologise to you all. Um, can I now ask the um, officer to do a roll call to make um, sure that all the members of the committee are present? Thank you, Thank you Chair. So, Councillor James Carston. Present. Councillor Peter Gould. Present. Councillor Cathy Guthrie. Yep, present. Councillor Barry Humphreys. Come back to Councillor Barry Humphreys. Uh, Councillor Andrew Mellon. Present. Councillor Mike Norris. Come back to Councillor Norris as well. Councillor Stringer. Councillor Stringer. Okay, Councillor Wallboys. Present. Okay, so I'll just ask again, Chair. So, Councillor Barry Humphreys. Yeah. Yeah. Can I see Councillor Stringer is here? Can I just confirm Thank you, Stringer? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Norris. I think we need to wait a few minutes then to contact them to remind them. We wait until half past, Chair, and I will then ask again. Thank you. Okay, Chair. So I will just um, check. So, Councillor Humphreys, are you present? Or Councillor Norris? Present. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I will just ask Claire, would you mind please just giving Councillor Humphreys a ring just to check that there are no issues? Yes, Rob, I will do. Thank you very much. Very unusual because he's usually pretty prompt. If you wait for me, I'm here. I did so I was here. We didn't. Oh, we didn't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you were, you yeah. were muted. I, I saw. Have all gone silent. <laughs> <laughs> I did say it's not like you. Right. Okay. So um, I think um, Robert, are you happy that we are all here now? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that. So in that case, then, Vincent, um, as I say, with apologies for those that have had to wait, Vincent, would you now like to present the case? Post Thank you, Chair. Pressing Thank you. Thank you. Here, members, we're looking at an outline planning application for up to 18 dwellings, and as the Chair said, Post Mill Lane, Fressingfield. I just want to check, has the screen now changed to Fressingfield is a primary village? Yes. Thank you. This, of course, was the um, previous 
iteration of the core strategy and Fressingfield was identified as a primary village because it had a shop and a number of other facilities. However, in the joint local plan, Fressingfield has been downgraded in terms of the settlement hierarchy and now sits at a rung below what was previously primary village and is now core village. So within hinterland villages, we are looking at small scale development within settlement boundaries, uh, largely for a local need. Of course, as I explained in the um, updated papers, we do have the benefit now of the November 2020 version of the joint local plan, the pre-submission document. At the time of writing the report, that hadn't been published. So where relevant, I will refer to the November version of the joint local plan. Just to be absolutely clear, Fressingfield Neighbourhood Development Plan is made and adopted. It does form part of the development plan and as such is a significant material consideration. Indeed, it is part of your development plan. In terms of the village Vince, referendum. Can I just stop you for a minute? Yes, um, of course. I do beg your pardon. I've got somebody, I don't know who NW is, um, saying that she can't hear anything or something, but I think that's her. Um, um, that's Madam Chair, that's Nicole Wright, I believe, saying that. So, so her, she's a guest, isn't she? Yeah, Nicole is the agent for this application, Chair. I suspect she also wants to speak at. But, well, yes, indeed. Uh, but, representation time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not sure how to. Can we... Robert Carmichael here. I believe, um, just to confirm, that the live stream. So, is going out so it's not in terms of that so it's, if it's possible if I could ask Nicole to just check her settings because if we if Nicole is in the meeting she should be able to hear the audio from Mr Pierce and from all of us if you could just confirm Nicole if you can hear us now or not can you put something in the chat yeah, box sorry that I just realized that would have been I have logged in Yes, she can device. hear us now. There we are. So, so Vince, would you like to start that, that section again? I do apologise. Yeah, just this section on the... Um... Just the slide three here. Is, okay. that, is that correct? Slide three? Yes, yes. yes. What I was saying, uh, Nicole and everyone, is that the Fressingfield does benefit from a made and adopted neighbourhood plan. It is part of the development plan and is therefore a significant material planning consideration. In terms of the village referendum, as you can see, 86.6% of those voting uh, supported adoption of the neighbourhood plan. So there was widespread support for its adoption. In the report, I have set out extensive discussion around each of the relevant policies within the neighbourhood plan and I will go on to elaborate as we go through the presentation. Just to make absolutely clear, there is the reference on the Council's website to the fact that it is now an adopted neighbourhood development plan and is part of our own development plan. So it is an up-to-date document. In fact, it is probably one of the most up-to-date documents we currently have as part of our suite of development plan documents. In terms of the parish profile, what I want to make clear is, and I'm happy to do this, is that the figures quoted in the report are figures for the parish in terms of population and dwelling numbers. And I'm perfectly happy to accept the figure provided by SAFE uh, on its website and in separate correspondence with me that the number of dwellings within the central part of the, the village, i.e. the built up, part of Fressingfield is 350. And this is important because clearly when you're considering what percentage 18 new dwellings is of the overall total, clearly it's a higher number 
if you take 350, than if you were to take the, the number for the entire parish, which is 444. And uh, I do correct that on the updated papers. The application site shown here in red, the applicant controls land edged blue. Within the blue land, there is no built development proposed, but what is being offered is for the area in blue to be used in perpetuity as a wildlife area, thereby ensuring that built development is never promoted on that site. So here we have those, those two boundaries shown on top of an aerial photograph. And as you can see, the area in red is now largely a grassed field. It isn't farmed. And the, the little finger of red that pokes into the site is where the existing pumping station is located. So in terms of adjoining sites, everything that appears in yellow there is a recently constructed dwelling. So that is what is now Post Mill Lane and the properties within it. We have the GP practice, the medical centre. We have the rear of properties. These are older properties in New Street. We have the access road that is in place and is constructed to that degree that serve the properties in Post Mill Lane. What I've shown here is there is what appears to be consideration for perhaps a future phase, but clearly that is only dependent on planning permission being granted. In terms of key local facilities, this diagram highlights those. I draw your attention in particular to the light blue, the almost like the, in the centre of the screen, which is the village shop, which is on New Street. The members familiar with Fressingfield will know that much or even most of New Street doesn't have the benefit of a footway. You are required to walk in the carriageway. And so anyone within the development in the red area, if it were approved to get to the shop, would be walking in the in the road. In terms of other key features, they're all set out on that, that screen. We'll come back to the highway safety implications of no footway in New Street as we go through the presentation. In terms of constraints, the site is shown in the cross-hatched mauve in the top left-hand corner. We have conservation area, the, end, the western extent of the conservation area, just I'll make that flash a bit so that we can see, to the east, and we have two listed buildings, Mount Pleasant Lady Mead Cottage. Those flash just so you can see those. Previously, um, the refused development for 24 units in the field behind Lady Mead Cottage was a key area of uh, debate not only at committee, but also as part of the inquiry or the appeal rather. And we'll go through that in more detail in a moment. So there we see an older shot of Lady Mead. Cottage, very hard to see it because it's mostly behind them. Trees on the frontage, but that is the, the dwelling. We have had objections from Fressingfield Parish Council and I have explored those in detail, not only in the report, but also in the table papers. And the table papers represent Fressingfield Parish Council's latest updated comments. The updated papers fully sets out an analysis of local objections received since um, my initial report was produced. And again, we've broken those down into categories. I also need to explain that SAFE, Supporters Against Fressingfield Expansion, have provided an updated uh, objection to the proposal following reconsultation. 
and they draw out errors in my report. So one of those is the reference to the number of dwellings in Fressingfield, which I corrected in the earlier slide. There is also um, dispute about the number of properties that have permission. I will deal with that in a following slide, but I am absolutely happy to accept the figures offered by SAFE as representing the most up-to-date position. That will result in some change to my updated papers, but I will explain that in greater detail as we go through. The point that SAFE are wishing to make clear in their view that the application is not compliant with the neighbourhood development plan, and there are points throughout my report and the updated papers where I accept that is the case. There is continued very strong objection to the proposal on drainage grounds and members who will recall debates in Fressingfield in recent years with the combination of major developments. The issue is that there is a problem in the lowest part of the village, particularly around Low Street and Cretfield Road, in terms of during periods of high rainfall, the foul sewage system overflows, the manholes in those low points of the street pop open, and diluted sewage is um, egresses onto the, not just the street, but also into the beck and potentially into parts of, of gardens. The issue here has been that Anglian Water previously described this as a, a closed system for foul sewage, but over the generations, unauthorised connections have been made to that foul sewer to put surface water into the foul water system. And so when there's heavy rainfall, the foul sewage system cannot cope with the amount of water in it, and the pressure causes the manholes to pop at the low point in the village, and that's what causes the uh, diluted raw sewage to empty into the street. And we'll go into a lot more detail of, of, of the issue as we go through the presentation and the reasons why we believe the current proposal will not exacerbate the existing problem. Safe point to infrastructure deficits within the village to cope with additional population. There's a debate around windfall sites, which I'll pick up. Um, it builds on the point made earlier about my comments in the updated papers. Safe so feel that the references I've made to the previous appeal decision, I have put too much emphasis on some of the points the inspector made, and I think Safe would want to uh, suggest that the previous appeal is not as important a material consideration as I have suggested in the report, particularly in view of the fact that since the appeal, we have seen the adoption of the neighbourhood plan. And we can deal with that as we go through the presentation. Still continued, very strong objection to um, traffic issues arising from a further 18 dwellings, particularly the issue of pedestrian safety, particularly in terms of the problems perceived as being caused at Jubilee Corner, and I'll highlight that as we go through the presentation. We've discussed the sewage egress. There's also some concern that in reporting consultee comments, I haven't necessarily highlighted areas where consultees aren't entirely happy. We can, we can go through those in detail as we go through. And there's a feeling that the cumulative impact, not just of this proposal, but others in the pipeline, I have three other planning applications in Fressingfield currently on the books that have yet to be determined. So we've got the reserve matters at uh, Red Barn Farm. We've got an outline application at John Shepherd Road, and I've got an outline application on Stradbrook Road. And I believe we've also got an application that I'm not dealing with in Landoff School, School Road. So SAFE's conclusion is that the application is not ready to go to committee and the committee is not ready to consider it for the reasons that, that are set out above. So in terms of policy, 
And this is one of the first points that um, SAFE have picked up on. In the November 2020 version of the joint local plan, the number of homes required, the identified need in Fressingfield is set out as 56. Now there is debate around how many of those already have the benefit of planning permission and we'll pick that up as we go through. The Fressingfield Neighbourhood Development Plan, which deals with the whole area shown in green, but essentially we're looking at the impact on the built up part of the village of Fressingfield, which I've shown here in flashing green. The neighbourhood plan identifies two sites for additional housing. It actually allocates them. So that is the northern edge of the village boundary as appears in the neighbourhood plan that coincides with the local plan boundary. That's the application site, so I'll make it flash clearly. It is outside, but adjacent to the village boundary. The two sites between them are expected to generate 18 houses on the land off School Road that has outline planning permission. And the Red Farm Barn site, 28 outline planning permission for 28. I currently have the reserved matters for Red Farm Barn, the 28, and there are 28 units within that reserved matters submission. One of my colleagues has the Land Off School Road reserved matters application, and currently there are 12 dwellings proposed on that site. In terms of the figures that I've quoted, I have suggested that there are 51 dwellings in Fressingfield benefiting from planning permission. The neighbourhood plan identifies a requirement of around 60 dwellings, which generated a shortfall of nine dwellings. What I did then is if the reserve matters for land off school road if it ends up as being 12 units rather than 18 units, that will bring the gap between uh, those with permission and those identified in the neighbourhood plan as 15. Now, quite rightly, what SAFE have pointed out is that the permission is for 18, and until and unless 12 are approved, I should be using the figure of 18, not the figure of 12. Furthermore, since that, and this is the point I'm happy to accept, a further three dwellings have been given permission in Fressingfield. The combined impact of all of that is that there are now 54 dwellings, if we count the 18 on the school road site, there are 54 dwellings with the benefit of planning permission, which makes the deficit six in terms of what is cited in the neighbourhood plan. The application before you is for 18, so clearly that is three times as many units as would appear to be necessary to meet the target of 60 in the neighbourhood plan. I put it in for reference purposes. If we end up with only 12 on the school road site rather than the 18, then we have a deficit of 12, which is still less than the 18 being proposed. In terms of layout, this is the revised layout. In the centre, you have a, an area of open space with the attenuation pond, and you have a cluster of dwellings arranged around that central space. We have now a bungalow in the top right hand corner and we have a mix of largely two and three bedroom dwellings within that proposal. Everything that's shown in the pale grey to the south and the west is, is existing modern development. If we compare the scheme that was refused and dismissed at appeal, there we have the scheme with 24 dwellings. 
societies larger than the site now before members because of the the finger of land in the bottom right hand corner that has now been excluded so immediately that takes out six dwellings that's how we get to the 18. if i superimpose the current layout over the refused layout what we see is that the land outside of that blue is now the suggested area of wildlife area, the proposed wildlife area. In terms of heritage, there is the significant difference between the previously refused scheme and the scheme now before you. The A field immediately, which is a self-contained field, that field immediately behind Lady Mead is no longer included within the application site and is not proposed for built development. That does have a significant impact on the setting of Lady Mead, and we'll go into, we'll explore that in a moment. The benefit is, of course, that the uh, setting of Lady Mead remains open and uncluttered by built development. That change is significant, so significant that our own highway, uh, our own heritage, sorry, forgive me, heritage officer has now formally responded to say, as a result of this, the proposed scheme for 18 dwellings on the reduced site will have no harm on the setting of Lady Mead Cottage. So we're not in the area of substantial harm. We're not in the area of less than substantial harm, which is where we were at with the 24 dwelling scheme. We are now at no harm. So in terms of would it be reasonable to add adverse impact on Lady Mead Cottage as a reason for refusal? I suggest it would not, and that would not be supported by our own heritage team. Members who've read the appeal statement will recognise that the impact on Lady Mead Cottage was a significant factor, not necessarily the only factor, but it was a significant factor in the mind of the inspector for dismissing the appeal. In terms of heritage, as I mentioned earlier, the conservation area we got yeah, shown purple here is to the east. What impact would the development on the cross-hatched mauve area have on the character of the conservation area? And our opinion is it would have no harm at all. It certainly wouldn't have an adverse impact. The conservation area appraisal for Fressingfield is of the old type, as are all of our conservation area appraisals. And it was designed as a guide to those undertaking development management and doesn't follow the current requirements for conservation area appraisals. But it does briefly touch on what is the character of Fressingfield Conservation Area. And it's, it's a strange reference. I'll just read part of it because it says, very few parts of Fressingfield have buildings close to the road, so the village remains fairly spread out without any urban feel to it. Driving through around any corner you expect to find the elusive centre of the village, but you remain disappointed as along any route the countryside re soon reappears. The small size of the village means that the countryside is in fact never far away from you. So in terms of trying to distill what is the character of the conservation area, it would appear that the authors of the appraisal at the time had some difficulty in trying to identify a sort of consistent and uniform character that you could say was Fressingfield. But in terms of this proposal, here we have the application site in yellow. This is all development. So there is already a, between the application site and the edge of the conservation area, significant built, you'd say urban, even though it's in a rural area, development. The distance between the closest corners is 146 metres, but what I would want to draw your attention to is the amount of new development that has occurred within that maroon coloured area. So that where we've got the vertical line is all recent 
development. Our view is that there is no adverse impact on the character of the conservation area for the reasons set out. And the fact that the field behind Lady Mead Cottage is now suggested as a wildlife area and will not be built upon is in a sense a further buffer between this development and the conservation area because it's an enclosed field the trees will will dominate so there is still a sense of that separation between the two in terms of access <coughs> the access already exists post mill lane is a is a adopted section of highway built to current highway standards you access it from New Street. In terms of the footways, at the moment, shown in yellow, are the sections of existing footway. So that, that phase of development was provided with good footway uh, connections. They do connect with the short sections of footway that do exist in New Street, and they are associated with more modern developments. In terms of that connection, this is a view into Post Mill Lane and on the right hand side you see New Street. So the existing footway comes round the corner, stops just as it gets into New Street, but that enables you then to cross to the other side of the road where you can see footway on the opposite side of the, the road. And that's important when we look at connectivity to other parts of the village. What it doesn't do is provide you with a pedestrian friendly connection to the shop and Jubilee Corner for the reason that I stated earlier is that once you get past that car in the distance, the footways don't exist on New Street. So again, here's a shot inside the site and you can just see the application site between the central two cottages and the building on the right behind the the wall if we go right around the corner there you'll see the sections of purpose-built footway on the left is the application site you can see the pumping station in the middle of the picture to the left is the existing hedgerows and trees that will be retained and in the far distance a uh, boundary fence so in terms of footway connections to the existing post mill lane what i've shown here in blue is connectivity to the existing footpaths that are as part of this current proposal. In terms of how you then access other parts of the village without having to use New Street, what I've shown here is the, the fact that there is a section of footway on the south side of New Street does allow you to access um, Priory Road, um, Priory Way that enables you to get to the school through the school's playing field. So you aren't necessarily required to go along New Street, uh, work your way through the Jubilee Corner Junction and then back up Stradbrook Road and into School Road. There is a, a shortcut, but obviously that doesn't help you get to other parts of the village, such as the shop and the other features that I showed on the screen slide earlier. So I'm not suggesting for one minute that this is the answer to pedestrian safety problems in New Street, but I will go on to say is that the inspector in the previous appeal did not accept that the fact that people walk in the street in New Street is an overriding safety issue. So the inspector previously didn't support the highway reason for refusal, and that in part accounts for the County Council's latest reaction to this proposal. Previously, they opposed development. For this application, they are no longer objecting. So there's the application site. There's another shot of it looking. So as you look towards the top of that, picture you're looking eastwards towards Jubilee Corner at the top. The school in green, the application site in red. The section of New Street that is shown in the blue dotted line is the section without footpaths. So it is a sizable length of New Street. In terms of the accident record, if we look at the last five year accident record on 
at crash map, you will see that within the village itself, or the heart of the village, there has been one slight accident recorded. And what I want to be sure uh, I make clear to members is that, of course, this is crash map data. It relies on that incident being reported. And as we've said in the past, not every accident, near miss, slight bump is reported. So in a way, it under-reports incidents. But what it does suggest is that within the actual centre of the village, slight one slight incident has occurred. And you can see the just to the right on Laxfield Road, there has been a more serious incident. But that incident record is not sufficient to warrant intervention from the Highway Authority in terms of mitigation, new mitigation measures and improvements. So there's a, a closer view of that same image focusing on. So where the where it says Sophie's Dog School, not advertising any particular provider, that is Jubilee Corner. Nothing on New Street between the application site and Jubilee Corner. Included in the uh, package of measures being promoted by the applicant is a 20 mile an hour zone between Jubilee Corner and a point on New Street just to the east of Post Mill Lane. So between those points, purpose being to at least slow traffic down. There we have an exploded view of Jubilee Corner. So you've got New Street running to the, the northwest, Tregbrook Road, which provides access to the primary school, Maxton Road, and then Halston Road that goes further on to Halston Hill. The point to make here is that there is almost no footway connectivity around that junction, save for a short section between New Street and Stradbrook Road, but it's not really wide enough for two people to walk along that section of footway side by side and of course that is a way to go to the school it is a way for people in Stradbrook Road to go around to the shop and other facilities you do get farm traffic going through the village you do get heavier lorries usually related to chicken processing activity also trundling through that section of of Fressingfield through Jubilee Corner the proposed wildlife area, here we've got a suggested illustrative layout. So this is the area in blue behind Lady Mead Cottage. So it would be uh, a mixture of the existing woodland and scrub, a proposed wetland area, some new native tree and hedge planting. The idea would be at the moment not to necessarily make it available for day-to-day -day public use, but to set it aside to allow habitat creation and, and wildlife to really establish itself there. The, the issue then would be, is it opened at certain times of the year to allow the public access? And that would be matters that would be resolved through a management plan, were members to be minded to approve the application. But so this is an illustrative example of what could be achieved on that, that site. In terms of this slide, the white dotted line shows the area of potential wildlife benefit and then we have the application site wrapping around the pumping station to the right hand side of that picture all inside of the existing hedgerows they would be retained. Landscape the existing trees and hedgerow both to the north and the east would be retained. There you see the that hedgerow pumping station in the centre of the plan, that is cut grass, perhaps not very regularly, um, but it isn't farmland and doesn't appear to read as part of the countryside. And the inspector in the previous appeal accepted that that land now reads part of Post Mill Lane as perhaps open space for that estate, although technically it is not public open space. It is private land owned by the applicant. I'll just quickly superimpose the proposed layout over that and there you can see that the hedgerows are kept intact. 
Additional landscaping would be provided, and this is purely illustrative to provide a greener frontage to the north side of Mill Road. Some suggestions here of how that open space beside the pond be, could be landscaped, because it's quite clear that the pumping station itself is not entirely, well, that's to say not entirely, it isn't an attractive feature in the street scene, but it does have the benefit of have, being behind a brick wall. Um, you will find a lot of pumping stations are behind close boarded fences, so it does have some uh, enhancement but new planting would certainly help, but that in itself isn't justification for 18 houses. I would perfectly accept that. In terms of residential amenity, the illustrative layout has regard to the amenity of neighbouring properties. And in the report and on this slide, I've set out why that should ensure that we don't have adverse impacts on amenity. Drainage, and I've got some quite a bit of detail in here because we have received additional uh, commentary following the publication of the report and the updated papers. So what I want to make clear, and I'm grateful to um, Dr. Castro and, and Pam Castro for making this absolutely clear to me. I have double checked. In my uh, commentary, I say that the pumping station is controlled by telemetry and the release rates can be controlled. That is not presently the case. And it's important that I make that clear because I would not want to mislead the committee. So, foul water from the proposed development will go through this pumping station, but that, that won't be controlled in terms of when it is released to join the existing foul sewage system in Fressingfield. Now, the applicants have advised me that they did explore having the 18 dwellings off of its own private treatment work. That was resisted by the drainage authorities because they prefer not to have uh, private sewage systems in locations where there is adequate capacity in an existing adopted foul sewage system. That is Anglian Water's position here, that there is capacity in Fressingfield to accept additional foul water. So the applicant has not been required to provide extra capacity within the pumping station and has not been uh, required to modify the pumps to enable controlled release. Now you'll see from the reports that everyone is incredulous that uh, Anglia Water say that there is capacity in the existing system. But the issue here is that in normal conditions, there is capacity for foul sewage in the foul sewage system. The issue is that a number of, or a significant number of unauthorized connections over decades that mean that in periods of high rainfall, excess surface water is ending up into the foul sewage system. And it's important that I make that clear because the proposed 18 dwellings will not be adding any additional surface water to the foul system in Fressingfield. It will be adding some additional foul water, but it won't be adding surface water. So here we have a, a document from Dr. Castro in which he highlights existing issues at the low point in the village. Um, in some of those you'll see toilet paper and other bits and pieces actually coming up through the, the manhole and you can see some significant uh, examples of flooding. So not only does the foul system pop the manholes but also the beck which sits behind that post and rail, white post and rail fence, that overtops as well. Dr. Castro is quite right. This is a, a matter that's gone on for years and years and years. There doesn't appear to be a remedy at hand. So occupiers of properties on that low point in the village are being effectively told that is the system, that's what happens, 
not much can be done about it. In terms of the surface water system for the proposed 18 dwellings, what would happen is that the surface water would go into a, an attenuation pond, which is shown in the dark blue. That would then be released into the existing ditch system through a series of controls, which would control the outflow to greenfield rates. So despite the fact that there would be 18 dwellings on that side, if it were approved, the amount of water ending up in that ditch where the light blue dot is moving would be no more than if this site had not been developed and remained a green field. And we'll explore how that's achieved in, in a moment. But the point then to accentuate after we've seen how that piece of the system works is that here we have the attenuation pond there would be two entry points into it each would have a pipe in a in a head wall and that's taking surface water from the development so the attenuation pond would be expected to have 0.2 of a meter was that 20 centimeters permanently water within it there will be capacity then to take an additional half a meter giving you 0.7 of a meter depth at particularly rainy periods but then on top of that there is what's known as um, freeboard an additional 0.3 before it gets to being able to overtop that attenuation pond that is considered a, an acceptable suds solution for dealing with surface water. Now how it is controlled, two options are proposed. There's it's a, a manufacturer's title, but the ACOQ brake flow. So what you can see there is what that actually does is throttle down the amount of water that can pass through the system. So it goes from a bigger opening down to that small opening. That's then fed through a series of storage areas so it can be cleaned as well so release is controlled to greenfield rates and that's how it's achieved by throttling the amount of water that can can leave the system an alternative very similar idea is and this is a control flow system is here you can see there are three inlets but only one outlet and that that unit actually provides storage capacity. So again, what that's doing is throttling the amount of water that can be released into the ditch system. So in terms of what happens is at the moment, the light blue is the existing ditch system, and that would take clean water, surface water from this development once it had been through the attenuation pond and the uh, break system. But shown in dark blue, is the existing stream on the right, it's, it's the beck through the village, but the direction of flow is as suggested in the, the arrows. So that surface, excess surface water would be going into a stream and away from the village. It wouldn't be entering the surface water system in the village at a point above the low points. So on that basis, the surface water outfall cannot be adding to the issues within the village and particularly the, the beck. So there is no prospect of this surface water adding to the problems uh, in the heart of the, the village. And I just accentuate that point in that slide. In terms of foul water, here we see the existing foul water from the existing development going to the pumping station. Shown in the mauve is the extra foul sewage in a new pipe system with under the highway also going to the pumping station. And as I corrected earlier, that then is released into the existing foul sewage system. Its release is not controlled. 
If we see all that working together, you'll see that the existing and proposed all ending up into the pump station. And there is the pumping station. Anglian Water were insistent that any development is kept at least 15 metres away from the edge of the pumping station. And that is what that layout achieves. There is no part of that illustrative layout within 15 metres of the pumping station. On that basis, our recommendation is that subject to completion of a 106 to secure the items set out in the report, that planning permission is granted for this development for the reasons set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Vince. That was very comprehensive. Um, now, do members have questions for further clarity uh, on the presentation we've received today? So um, I see Councillor Stringer, please. Thank you, Chair. You said in your presentation that the housing numbers in Fressingfield could maybe and was in, you used the word deficit, but looking at the Fressingfield neighbourhood plan, it, it has quite a percentage of windfall. Some some of that has already come forward, and, and certainly, you know, rural villages like this ha have uh, have a number of Class Q applications. So uh, I just wonder if you could clarify wh whether using the word deficit is 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 the right word to use here. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stringer. I'm more than happy to say if it's not the right word. The, what I was trying to highlight is there is at, the, at present a small number of units between those with planning permission and the 60 identified in the neighbourhood plan. Now, whether that's a deficit, you might say, well, that's between now and the end of the plan period. That's a, a small amount. Doesn't necessarily represent a deficit because, as you say, that could be taken up with windfall sites within the village envelope. Certainly that's what policy FRES1, FRES1, suggests is that that gap can be made up over the plan period with windfall sites inside the settlement boundary. So I would accept that point. Th thank you. And of course, the just to clarify that, the, the neighbourhood plan also has a review built into it as well. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be over the plan period. It would be when it hits the next review. Correct. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Mellon, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Pish, you, you mentioned the fact um, that uh, there are there have been a number of unauthorised connections for surface water to enter the foul system. Now I understand that Anglian Water actually collects charges from householders for the surface water. So um, how how can that be described as unauthorised? It I'm not I'm not a spokesperson for Anglian water. However, what I would say is those connections have been uh, made, who knows, 50, 60 years ago up to modern times. It would appear that Anglia Water are now accepting that that is the situation and they are now char charging people for the fact that those unauthorised connections have been made. I also know that, and this is something that if uh, SAFE or the Parish Council or Dr Castro are speaking, that is something that is at the heart of a dispute between the village and Anglian Water. Um, certainly there are a number of complaints uh, formally being considered. Uh, I, I remember previously from discussion that there is indignation within the village that Anglian Water are making this charge when one, there is this flooding problem that seemingly can't be resolved and two if there are unauthorized and illegal connections why are people then being asked to pay for 
for that. That is something I can't solve. It is a conundrum, and it's probably something that um, speakers will will talk about. But what I'm saying here is that this development will not add surface water flow to the present foul system in Fressingfield. Uh, and a further Can I just, sorry, 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 Councillor Mellon, carry on. Yes, sorry. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned a 20 mile an hour zone for the sort of heart of the village. Mm -hmm. Can you just sort of tell me what the status of that is? Is it a proposal? Is it linked to this application or <coughs> other applications? Yeah, thank you for that uh, question, Councillor. It is an offer that has been made by the applicant. Suffolk County Council as local highway authority feel there is some merit in it. What the developer is being asked to do is to provide the funding to implement that. And that would be a matter for Suffolk County Council to pursue under the relevant traffic regulation orders. But as officers, we are not saying that the 18 unit scheme is dependent upon those works going in and whether or not uh, Sam Harvey I'm just looking to see if Sam's still about I, I think she should be would wish to comment either now or during the discussion but we're not saying they're a necessary prerequisite but the developer will provide the funding so that Suffolk County Council can pursue it if it's if it's achievable. Thank you. Um, Chair, am I allowed to another question? Yeah, yes, yes. If it's for clarity, yes, please. Yeah. Um, you didn't specifically mention this in your presentation, but it's there in the papers. Um, you seem to place quite a lot of store on the fact that um, the, the application site is not isolated, mm. as uh, mentioned in um, in the MPPF. Um, I, I, and I'm struggling to understand the, the, the sort of um, how that point um, impacts on the application. OK, uh, yeah. No, happy to explain that one, Councillor Mellon. Paragraph 79 of the MPPF is what replaced paragraph 55. So this was dwellings out in the middle of nowhere. How on earth do you get approval for exceptional dwellings in the countryside? This is not an isolated location. It is on the edge of Fressingfield, adjacent to the settlement boundary. Now, I think what Fressingfield are saying in their own policy is not necessarily that they are following the strict requirement of paragraph 79, but they are using the exceptional factors that are set out in paragraph 79. So, for example, were this site to be proposed for an essential agricultural workers cottage they might consider a bit it favorably but i don't think anyone is accepting that this is an isolated site in terms of its physical geography it is not remote from any other dwelling that is that's the issue around isolation because members will recall that a lot of um, recent appeal decisions inspectors are are acknowledging that development adjacent to a settlement boundary is not isolated and that if that settlement is sustainable in terms of the MPPF development on the edge adjacent to an existing settlement boundary can in certain circumstances be considered sustainable even though it's outside of the settlement boundary and can therefore be supported under the more general uh, direction of promoting sustainable development in the MPPF and the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Of course, what you have here in Fressingfield is a situation where there is an adopted neighbourhood plan that identifies closely where development go should go, and this isn't one of the sites that's been identified for development. So we have that perennial issue of it's not in the neighbourhood plan it is on the edge of a settlement our own local plan is out of date to some extent we have to have regard to the mppf but in terms of the hierarchy 
as the neighbourhood plan is now part of our development plan, it is a significant material consideration. So we have that perennial dilemma. On this occasion, well, uh, perhaps I'm straying. Yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll we're going I'll into stop. rather a long debate yeah, here. Yeah, um, I'll stop. Thanks. But that's my instant answer to your question, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Before I move on, can I just ask um, Ian Dupre, please? Um, quite clearly, the flooding that currently occurs in, in Pressingfield is a real problem. Um, but it, and people will bring it up, but how much of that needs to be in the debate for this application site if it is proven that it won't add to it? I, I just wanted your legal advice on that because I don't want to stop people having their views on everything. Well, I think, yes, I mean, Vincent, Mr. Pierce has, has explained his advice very clearly. And I, it goes without saying that a, a discussion of the planning merits of a proposal has to be confined to those matters that are relevant and to take into account the technical advice that's been given. But I don't know if that answers the, the question. Well, I don't want to stop debate, but I was just wondering if people uh, veer off. It seems that this this dreadful problem that they've got has been ongoing for years. Mm. Um, and um, it's just been explained possibly that this site may not uh, attribute to it. However, we will yes, move yes, on. Indeed. Well, I, think, I think your point, Madam Chair, is a good one, that if members are considering the um, the planning merits and the planning balance, the um, the benefits and disadvantages of this proposal and the fact that the, the fact that there is a problem in Fressingfield that's been explained very, very in detail if if this if it is the case that in some that this um, this application if granted will not add surface water to the flow as Vincent has explained that that of course needs indeed needs to be noted by all the decision the members who are decision makers okay thank you thank you for that as I said I don't want to um, stop debate um, before I come to Councillor Stringer, who's already spoken, and the ward member, um, Councillor Gould has asked to uh, have a, a question clarified. Thank you, Councillor Gould. <coughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. In fact, I've got uh, two questions. Uh, one relates to the point just being discussed, that whilst uh, this development, uh, it's asserted that this development won't add to the surface water into the system, uh, Presumably, the the sewage that will be added to, to to the system will that pass through the low point where we have uh, where the, where where the problem is uh, is seen. That's question one. My second question uh, is to understand the reasons that the highways authority have uh, for. Uh, not objecting to this proposal when they objected to the previous proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gould. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gould. What I would say is that, yes, it will add to the total amount of sewage going through Fressingfield in the existing foul drainage system. Mm -hmm. What I would also say is that it is right for a planning authority to have regard to flood risk. There is a whole section within the, within the NPPF that makes it clear that flood risk is a material planning consideration. What I'm suggesting here is that because of the surface water being taken away from Fressingfield, it will not add to the problems that exist through excess surface water being put into the foul system but i'm not trying to deny that the 18 units will not be adding their own foul sewage to the existing foul sewage system in respect of why the highway authority sorry madam chair can i can i just uh, i i just want to make sure i'm, I'm understanding yeah uh, the answer to my question uh, <laughs> so Whilst surface water isn't adding to the problem, uh, the sewage will add to the problem, will add to the volume of material passing through those pipes uh, and uh, therefore uh, will make the problem worse. 
It is adding to the volume in the existing FAL system. OK, thank you. In terms of the issues around highway authority position, it's probably best that I defer to Sam Harvey to give it straight from the highway authority's perspective. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pierce. Um, as as you said in your presentation, in the recent appeal for the three sites together, uh, the inspector determined that the proposal would not be harmful in in any effect for the highway or pedestrian safety within the village. Um, and he acknowledged the concerns that we raised for the pedestrian safety for the for the three sites together, but he felt that it wasn't um, demonstrated and it was of little evidence. Uh, it wasn't substantial. So this is why on this application, as it's a standalone for 18 dwellings, because there is a route to the school that is off the, the main route and is a safe route, we determined that this application was acceptable with, with regards to highways. Could, again, Madam Chair, if I can, may just clarify uh, the answer. So um, it's really, are we bound by the view of an inspector on a a separate application? Are we bound by his or her, her view on that application when considering this application? I'm happy to give a planning perspective. You are not bound by that, but it clearly is a, an important material consideration because if, if a previous inspector felt that 24 additional units wouldn't pose a, a, a public highway safety issue, you would expect 18 dwellings to um, generate even less of a problem. And so the issue then is, is it a reasonable reason for a refusal? How do we evidence that at an appeal? We couldn't previously because the accident record doesn't tell the story that we, it, we would need it to um, present. Um, so on that basis, I would say we're not bound by it, but it is an important consideration and it would be a factor that might suggest that we have acted unreasonably. And I know it, it annoys members if I do the gun to the head type argument, what, I, what happens at appeal, but I can't avoid saying if we cannot come up with new evidence that we weren't able to produce last time, I'm not sure it will be supported at appeal and could it leave us open to a claim for costs. But <laughs> you are able to have a different view. That is your entitlement as members of the committee. <clears throat> yeah, Madam Chair, if, if I may, sorry, I've not put my hand up. If, um, if I may join in at this moment just to endorse what Vincent said, it's exactly what I would have said, that planning decisions by planning inspectors aren't like high court or court of appeal legal judgments. They're not binding precedents. But I have in, in over the course of my career once or twice, I've been at a council where we've kind of been a bit bold and said we really think that inspector um, six months ago made the wrong decision when we've gone to a new appeal. But it's you, you need to give very careful consideration to that kind of approach. And I, I think I'm in this case, I do endorse what Vincent, has, Mr. Pierce has said. Sorry, my, my problem, all, all sorts of things going on here. Um, I've got one, two, three, three people who've already spoken, um, and I'm quite happy to come back to them all in, in the order I see them in. So, Councillor Stringer, if you would like to Sorry, speak. Chair, may I just add something, just that something that's happened in the meantime, uh, just so that you're aware. Sorry, Councillor Stringer. Uh, Mr. Pateman, G and myself have been doing some exchanges 
via Skype. They may have been on the screen. I'm more than happy to deal with those if if that matter. Yes, please. Comes up. Would. Yeah, well, um, just deal with them anyway, please. Okay. John and I have been discussing the whole drainage situation and the fact that previously the applicant did suggest a private treatment uh, facility. My view is that if members felt that the um, foul system issue was such that we could condition the drainage strategy to incorporate exploration with Anglian Water of a private treatment system. I think we could also suggest that as part of the drainage strategy, we explore with Anglian Water the idea of increasing capacity at the pumping station and providing some sort of flow discharge control system. And I just didn't want members to be considering these issues and not having the benefit of that exchange, which clearly was on on the screen. As you know, behind the scenes, we often try and see how we can help members come to a, a good decision. So both of those might be technically possible if you felt that the foul issue was an overriding issue. So apologies for interrupting. Apologies, Councillor Stringer, but I thought it fair to put that out there now so that that could factor in because clearly John and I were having that debate and it was it was there. I have nothing nothing to hide that I want to make that transparent. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, that seems a, a big um, amendment, shall we say. Um, so if I come back to Councillor Stringer, who very kindly yeah. waited. Thank you. Um, so Thank you, I'll Chair. come to the, and, and I will come back to the ward member very shortly. I do apologise. Yeah. But yeah. we've got Councillor Stringer next. If Thank, you, would, Thank you, Chair. And yeah, important to get that sewage part of it also correct, because yeah. on current water use, you're talking about 6,000 litres a day here. So that's six tonnes of, of sewage per day coming out of these houses. Don't forget, this is a question, Councillor. Oh, absolutely, Stringer. absolutely. Yes, <laughs> and my question is, uh, on page 266, you very kindly, before we got into the waterworks, uh, were, were describing the status of the neighbourhood plan within the development plan. And on page 266, it mentions our local plan and core strategy as remaining the authorities adopted development plan. It was my understanding that the neighbourhood plan was also part of the development plan. Could I have that clarified, please? Certainly, Councillor Stringer, the neighbourhood plan is part of our development plan. And the starting point for decision takers, such as yourselves on the planning committee, is the adopted development plan. And the reason I quoted that was because even if parts of your adopted development plan are out of date, clearly the neighbourhood plan part isn't out of date, but those parts that are out of date are still required to be your starting point for decision taking. Yeah, so so to clarify then, that wording is incorrect. It should have had the word part of in there. Correct. OK, thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Stringer. Um, and if you can put your hand down, because I've got hands all over the place here. Councillor Gould, you wanted to have a second go, I see, please. Oh, oh sorry, that, that was an old hand, sorry. OK, old <laughs> hand. Down, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm too much of an old hand, I'm getting tangled up. <laughs> Councillor Mallon, how are you on? Uh, there was another question, I believe. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, this is a new hand. Um, <laughs> can I ask um, um, the officer, uh, Mr Pierce, to explain his statement on page 293 of the bundle? It's paragraph 4.2.32, where it says that the um, adopted Fressingfield neighbour development plan is not as robust as it might otherwise be. Can I have some clarity on the reasons yeah. for that? It's it's um, a minor point in respect of relying on windfall sites to make up uh, the number within the, the neighbourhood plan. Uh, government advice very much is you should try and identify 
sites rather than put them down to windfall. But I think as we've established, we are talking about a small number of properties. It isn't a, a significant number within the overall 60 because we have 54 already with the benefit of planning permission, at least the 54. So it is, it's a minor point. And can I just for further clarity, just ask the inspector who examined the Fressingfield neighbourhood development plan um, made no comment about the, what you, I think described as the deficit. In fact, he, they said that um, no further sites needed to be allocated. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Mellon. And now, Councillor Haddingham, you've been very patient. Your turn to ask a question. Um, thank you. Um, sorry to get back to the unpleasant sewage situation, but as the foul water is going to be um, adding to that, I just wanted to ask Vincent, and I'm not being trying to be clever here. I don't know the answer to the question. Um, how many times, you talk about excessive rainfall, how many times in the last two years has the Beck actually flooded or has there been flooding in Low Road? I'm sure that um, SAFE, if they're speaking, would want to answer that. But based on the information provided by Dr Castro, it would appear it's about four times a year. And it definitely, well, I suppose not unsurprisingly, it coincides with the sort of autumn winter where you would expect rainfall to be at its highest and perhaps most e extreme. Okay, thank but you. I do stand to be corrected by anyone from the village who, who says otherwise. But based on the information that I had on the screen, it would appear about four times a year. Thank you for that, Councillor Haddingham. Right. So we now can move on to the parish council. And thank you, Diana Warren. You've been waiting very patiently. Um, you now have three minutes if you would like to put your video on and then we can see you or if you're on a phone just your voice will be fine thank you okay I'm um, can you hear me very clearly thank you and can you see me yes indeed <laughs> okay jolly good um thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak um I've listened very carefully to what has been said and I'm afraid I'm going to reiterate some of it um, we objected to the original application, as did, as did the principal planning officer, but he changed his mind and we haven't. We have, as you say, a robust NDP in place, which is um, aligned with your, your draft local plan with considerable buy-in from the parish. Um, I refer you to the objections from Elizabeth Monero, who ably counters, I feel, the veracity of the balance of judgments made about that plan by the principal planning officer. In the NDP, we have um, figures for house numbers, which again echo what SAFE says, 54 approved. In terms of the village, I, I really think what needs to be taken into consideration is that the reality of living in the village is different to how you carry out a desktop planning um, exercise. 18 more houses will need 30 to 40 more cars. And there is a reliance on cars in Fressingfield because there is no public transport. The developer himself um, has quoted from a route assessment that concluded that the proposed development would increase traffic and that there were restricted measures to mitigate against this on what is probably the most dangerous road in the village. We've talked about that this morning. Residents are fearful of walking along New Street as it is. There are have been no serious accidents to date, but there's one waiting to happen. We also are disappointed with Suffolk Highways changing their mind as well. The drainage um, will be spoken about by many others, and we've already touched on that. But the notion of this attenuation pond is not as convincing as it, as it might seem. It may capture surface water, but at 20 centimetres in clay soil, it has the potential to be empty half the year, unsightly, smelly, and far from being a local wildlife amenity. 
We're not persuaded by the Section 106 proposals. The idea of the wildlife area sold to the parish council for, the, for a pound would be appealing, but given that this land is um, not of much use anyway to the developer, he could be very philanthropic and give it to us anyway, and we would love a project to work on that with the community. Do not underestimate the strength of feeling in the parish and particularly in the village. People are very cross that he's coming to the LPA again. They feel strongly that the local voice supported through the NDP is not recognised as it should be. The character and nature of small rural communities should be retained and not urbanised because of muddled thinking within national and local government. We strongly oppose this development and we urge you as members of the committee to oppose it too. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for that. Now, members, do you have any questions for Diana, please? Councillor Stringer. I, I'll, ask, I'll ask the question I normally ask of a made neighbourhood plan. If this application were to be approved, do you have any idea what the impact is likely to be on your neighbourhood plan? Thank you, Chair. Um, on our neighbourhood plan? I'm sorry, I don't... Yes, I, yes, yes. The impact on the neighbourhood plan? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at. OK, uh, if, if this if this application were to go ahead... Yeah. What do you, um, there's a group, there's a load of volunteers that work on a neighbourhood plan and you have a document in place. Yeah. Do you think the approval of this have with any impact at all on that neighbourhood plan? Well, certainly it would cause us to have to re have to review where we've got to at the moment and for us to be extremely uh, unsettled by the fact that it hasn't been taken into consideration as the foundation for decision making. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stringer. Any other questions for Diana Warren? No, I can't see any there. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, we have an objector, Elizabeth Manero. If you would like to speak, please, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. There are three key sustainability factors that relate to this application. The conservation area, the sewage problem and road safety. Assessment of impact on the conservation area covering most of our historic village, including New Street, is a legal requirement. Historic England have given traffic congestion as just one example of harm to a conservation area, but this has not been considered. It is common ground that this application is in breach of MDP FRES 1. It also breaches FRES 3.1 on infrastructure because of the defective sewer polluting the road and back with raw sewage, which is getting more frequent, and road safeties. These deficiencies are where the harm lies. So the sewer has overflowed 12 times in the last two years, eight times since the appeal, including in July and August. Off what the regulator are in detailed discussion with Angling Water about its breach. Suffolk County Council and Angling Water cannot even agree whether the sewer is foul only or combined. If it is combined, Angling Water's capacity calculations are wrong because it would accommodate surface water as well. If those currently charged are those causing the capacity problem, as was suggested, then they would already have been identified because they get bills but they cannot, it's not been possible to identify where the problem has come from or indeed exactly what it is. No solution has been found. Turning to road safety, since the appeal, uh, SAFE's January 2020 survey of 104 residents found that 84% often or always felt unsafe because of traffic when walking in the village, citing poor visibility, narrow roads and speed. A 20 mile an hour limit will neither stretch the road space nor improve the visibility. Three quotes from respondents show this day to day reality. I think you are nearing your time. Which is not accepted. I always feel unsafe in New Street because cars, lorries, buses, farm vehicles can come along at any moment and if caught out in one of the many spots where there is no pavement, it is very scary. I have to crisscross the road to get to the safety of grass strips or driveways to avoid being stuck at one of these several blind spots. 
So in summary, there is no public transport. The school and medical centre are at capacity, with roads unable to bear even current traffic safely, sewers that already flood and pollute with no solution in sight, no analysis of the impact of the conservation area. This is a textbook case of unsustainability. The wrong house is in the wrong place. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, any questions for Elizabeth Monero? No, thank you very much for your time. If you'd like to turn your video off now, thank you. We now have the agent, Nicole Wright, and you too have three minutes to address the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I am Nicole Wright, a Chartered Town Planner representing the applicant. With me this afternoon is Matt Hare of Plandersill Engineering to answer any technical drainage questions. The importance of addressing the need for new homes in the district is greater than ever in these challenging times, as hopefully we are approaching the end of the pandemic. Planning law requires that applications for planning permission I'm sorry, we seem to have lost you. I'm not sure if you can hear us, but Nicole Wright, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Policy FRES1. Excuse me, can you just stop, Nicole? We lost you there for a little while. Ah, what was the last you heard? Yeah, but where did we lose, Nicole? OK, I shall start from where I think you may have left. It, it was only it was only a few, a few sentences. OK, planning law requires that applications for planning permission be in accord, be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The officer's report has discussed the various relevant policies of the development plan in detail. Policy FRES1 of the neighbourhood plan provides for around 60 new dwellings. We have heard that this means that there is a potential housing gap of 12 homes to fill in the village based on the neighbourhood plan target. There is no other application currently submitted to address this gap. Based on the current situation, if all 18 dwellings proposed by this outline application were permitted, that would take the total to 66 dwellings approved in the village. This would remain around 60. This application site is ideally situated to address the shortfall. The case officer has shown that the site is ideally situated within easy reach of services and amenities in the village. On the issue of surface and foul water management, a new flood risk assessment and surface water management plan has been submitted for consideration by the council and found to be acceptable in addressing all flood and drainage concerns of Anglian Water, the Lead Local Flood Authority and the Environment Agency. There are no statutory objections to the proposal. The concern, of course, of local residents, which is important, as we have heard from in the summary provided by the officer, is not the capacity of the sewage system to take the additional foul, but rather whether the issue that persists with surface water discharging into the foul system, resulting in overflows, would be amplified by the development. This is not the case. As we saw in the, in the presentation earlier, the site is downstream from the system and the surface water flows would be away from the village. It therefore does not, it does not follow that the increased volume of sewage from the 18 homes would lead to increased overflows from storm water. We, we would therefore the respectfully request that you approve this application. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, Councillor Humphreys. Sure, just one question. I, I didn't get it because you spoke so fast, but um, the you said, I think, and I'm just thinking because I can write it all down. You said that the ND, NDP should be uh, acknowledged and uh, and should should follow through unless the material uh, considerations 
that would oh, oh, otherwise override it. Um, I didn't get what those material um, considerations were. So if you'd like to tell me what they are, please. OK, um, so the the the, um, the officer, of course, has summarized them in detail. But in summary, um, I if I just go through the ones that were hi highlighted before, um, they are the the there the, there are no highways um, issues that would result from the development. There was um, there was a question asked by one of the councillors earlier regarding why why is the county no longer concerned about highways impacts, and that was summarised in I think paragraph twenty seven of the appeal decision, where where the inspector said the new transport report and pedestrian route assessment fully fully assesses and shows that there would be no insurmountable increase in, in, in and impact as a result of highways and pedestrian movements and so no impact on highway and pedestrian safety would result and given that the number of dwellings has reduced that would of course be the same um, with regards to um, the surface water and foul situation I have um, touched on that in detail I can review any issues there if you would like but also just moving on, the other material consider considerations before were considered to be impacts on heritage assets. Um, and that was namely Lady Maid Cottage. Of course, we, we have seen that a number of pro dwellings proposed have been removed and the field adjacent to Lady Maid Cottage has been omitted from the development, meaning that there would be um, an, a nil impact on Lady Maid Cottage. So these these were the these were the key issues raised, and then of course um, the. Uh, thank the you. I think you're into the state now. I think uh, yeah. Councillor Humphries uh, has had chapter and verse there on the element. Do you think Councillor Humphries? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So just got it in my head. Um, the only material considerations that you're really coming up with there are highways issues and the sewage issue. Okay, thank you. Because the Lady Mead bit is not relevant to this. So thank That's you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, I, I just have a question that I was a bit confused about. She said, uh, uh, you said, Nicole, that um, all the flooding issues had been resolved. And I understand from the officer's presentation uh, where the pumping station would take the surface water. But I think my colleague asked the question and the clarity was given by the officer that the sewage would still go in to the current sewage system, which is part of the problem of overflowing. Is that correct? Um, well, um, the, 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 well, to clarify, the problem of overflowing is not the capacity of the system. It is, in fact, that the surface, the, the storm, the storm water that enters the system. But if somebody, excuse me, interrupting, but if somebody's calculated that there is capacity, volume, whether it's stormwater or sewage, would it not appear to be overcapacity, whether it's included with something that shouldn't be there? I understand what you're saying. No, no. So um, so the, the capacity in the system, there is sufficient to take the, 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 the system from the, the foul emitting from the development. The issue that is existing at the moment that would persist is one that relates to storm water entering the system, of which we would be adding none. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And it doesn't look as though there's any further questions. And we now come to the ward member, if you would please. Councillor Haddingham, if you would like to tell us your views on this, please. Thank you very much. As you all have seen from your papers and heard earlier, this is not the first time that a development on this site has come before committee. It's just the first time that it's come before you. Two years ago, Vincent recommended refusal. His reasons were fourfold. Firstly, the development lay outside of the settlement boundary of Fressingfield, which at that time was defined as a primary village and expected to accommodate small scale development to meet local needs. To quote from his report, the construction of up to 24 dwellings is considered by the council to be a significant and inappropriate level of development that in any event falls outside of the settlement boundary of the village, contrary to local plan policy CS2. This level of growth is, is considered unacceptable and inappropriate for the reasons demonstrated, and on that basis, considerable weight is afforded the conflict posed with the development plan where the benefits posed would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the harm and conflict identified. Nothing has changed in this regard other than the number of dwellings has reduced from 24 to 18. 
Furthermore, Prestonfield, as you have heard, has a fully adopted neighbourhood plan, which does not include this site, nor does our own joint local plan, which has also progressed further since this last application. It has also downgraded Frestingfield to a hinterland village, in which development will not be permitted within settlement with, with will only be permitted within settlement boundaries. It also states that the cum cumulative impact of proposals will be a, med a major consideration. There's already outline permission for at least four, 54 dwellings in the village and another two applications due to come to committee as early as next month for another 48 dwellings. His second reason also concurred with Steve Mary from Suffolk County Council Highways in that further traffic would result in an unacceptable impact on highway safety. Again to quote his report, the nature of the existing highway network severely restricts practical opportunities for acceptable mitigation. The measures that have been proposed are the best solutions available within existing constraints and fall short of making the highway safe for pedestrians and would increase the likelihood of conflicts between them and vehicular traffic. An approval of the development would increase pedestrian and or vehicular movement through the core of the village without the provision of safe practical alternatives. Further traffic passing along New Street and or through Jubilee Corner will result in an unacceptable impact on highway safety, particularly for vulnerable pedestrians. This risk is, is considered to be unacceptable and its own right would significantly and demonstrably outweigh any benefits that would arise from the proposal, the proposed development. The harm to pedestrian safety identified is contrary to local plan policy T10 and contrary to paragraph 109 of the MPPF. The third reason covered the irregular flooding of raw sewage along the low road, which he refers to as the resultant pollution is an unacceptable environmental and public health risk that appears unable to be reasonably mitigated by the drainage authority. The fourth and frankly almost unnecessary reason, because when viewed after the previous concerns, was certainly sufficient to recommend refusal, but almost as the last nail in the coffin that it would have a less than substantial harm on near, nearby grade two listed property Ladymead. The appeal inspector focused on just one of the reasons for refusal, the one thing that the applicant could easily change, and the applicants had done so, removing six of the closest dwellings to Lady Mead. Does that mean that the other very compelling reasons have disappeared? They have not. The inspector disregarded them with a stroke of his pen, and I'm asking you not to do the same. I'm sure that you cannot fail to have noticed the very strong opposition regarding this development and the outrage that the highly praised neighbourhood plan has been ignored. Not only that, but our own emerging local plan would also be ignored if this were to go ahead. In both of these plans, housing outside of the settlement boundary is not to be accepted. What is the point of having a settlement boundary if it doesn't really matter whether you're in or out? This is not simply a village getting more housing that it feels that it doesn't want or need. This is a hinterland village in a fairly unsustainable location, many miles from any major roads or towns at, without any public transport. Um, and it's only two dwellings short of the target of 56 in our own local plan. To suggest that 18 dwellings could fit in with the neighbourhood plan as windfalls is stretching the definition of windfall undoubtedly to the extreme. Windfalls are surely infill developments of one, two or maybe even three. They are not 18 outside of the settlement boundary, leaving true windfalls, which there have been five in the last two years, at an advantage. Disadvantage, sorry. I urge you to refuse this application and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Councillor Haddingham. Any questions for Councillor Haddingham? Mm, no, I can't see any questions there. Thank you, Councillor Haddingham. So I now open this up for debate. So if we start in the first and usual fashion, Councillor Caston. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I can see quite a few key issues, but I'm just going to go through two of the main key issues for me. It's um, with this um, housing need. Um, uh, so when I when I look at the housing provided, I've still got to um, I've got to stick with the um, safe, uh, like safe says, this. Um, 18 houses because I can only deal with the planning permission as it stands. Um, it means they're very close to their housing need in Fressingfield, which I think carries more weight to the um, neighbourhood plan. But I think that's something that I, we need to talk about in debate. But the real 
key issue here for me is the sewerage issue. I am. Um, I don't go with this argument that because it's not putting stormwater down a sewerage pipe, it's not adding to the problem because it's stormwater that's um, overflowing the sewer. It's um, it's that's that's complete nonsense to me. Um, uh, it's um, uh, it's sewerage going down a pipe um, that overflows from from what the um, resident said 12 times in two years sending all the chemicals all the um, human waste and everything into a brook and I, f I find that a really serious problem here and I'm, I'm surprised that this hasn't been looked at in Fr Fressingfield before but um, it's um, yes it will it will add to the problem it will put sewage into that system that can't handle it i think the um the what would it may be acceptable if it was controlled somehow so at peak times or when there's flooding that wasn't released i think that would maybe be a solution to that problem but as it stands um yeah i've i've got i've got some serious worries about this application but i'm I'll listen to the debate and and um, make an opinion uh, after I've listened to that. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Councillor Carsten. You make a, a very useful point there. And I wonder if um, John Pateman G can come in on that, uh, where you mentioned about holding back sewage during poor times. Um, John, would you like to give us some thoughts on that, please? Yes, um, so I've listened to everybody on this one, and it it is an interesting um, propose, it, well, it's an interesting situation to be in. You know, we recognise that the village has a significant problem. I think that's undeniable, um, and so you know, and that's been you know highly illustrated and demonstrated um, throughout this uh, conversation so far. Right now, that said, the applicant is also correct in that the capacity is there. For the foul sewer, it's the problem with the surface water. That said, I would actually take it slightly further. Let's, you know, we can't, we don't have a solution to that. It doesn't sound like there's going to be a solution to that anytime soon. So I would say there is a material consideration here in respect of the existing problem because even though there's enough capacity for the burden of this development to come forward, that surface water issue is still going to be out there coming into the system at storm times so the additional foul water that this produces even though the capacity is there will be part of the problem spilling out and causing a problem for the the locals now i'm not an expert in in all of this but that, that, that's how i kind of see it so in my head and i appreciate i did this uh, to uh, my colleague very quick earlier why don't we just stop it going anywhere near the problem and why is that not unreasonable to do so and i can't see a problem here because ultimately there are two potential way for ways forward that if we were to approve this and it might be based on uh the achievement to delegate two officers to achieve this, if we were to approve this why not seek either private sewage plants for the individual properties or given the pumping station that's already there a control mechanism to be agreed um, that would essentially deal with that um, appropriately and uh, we think there is an answer there and we can certainly ask members if you were concerned about that issue and, and if we could go forward on the basis of uh, resolving that before issuing any decision that that could be a way forward so i, I think there is certainly a good area here for us to explore and uh, look to have a solution but ultimately the solution to this for the sake of the local locality is just to avoid putting it in there in the first place and I think that's actually a possibility so I would suggest that is a, is a way forward for members. Thank you for that John that, that's quite useful and it was certainly brought up by Councillor Caston which has uh, given us food for thought. Uh, whether members would be inclined on leaving that for officers to decide or how we go forward. Let's just see how the debate goes. We'll sow that seed in our memory and um, I will move on to the next participant, Councillor Gould, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm actually profoundly troubled by, by this application. Uh, 
particularly in kind of reconciling the evidence in in the report with the conclusion and recommendation uh, made by Mr. Pierce. Uh, and, and that's become more so as uh, the presentation has gone on. Uh, and Mr. Pierce has been very generous in, in accepting uh, some of the errors in the report, uh, as pointed out by uh, by SAFE and, and, and the residents. So I'm, 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 I really am troubled uh, by this. Uh, it, it going, we've all been received a lot of correspondence from local residents uh, on this application. And, and, and going through those, I, I found at least seven um, substantive uh, uh, reasons or causes for concern uh, with regard to this application. And we've touched upon many of those. They are highways, uh, the, the, the drainage um, uh, issues, uh, but there are others as well that we haven't really talked about very much, uh, pressure on infrastructure. Uh, particularly, not least the the medical centre. Um, the the thing also that I'm, that, that troubles me here um, is about the neighbourhood plan. Now, often I, as a believer in localism, uh, when we when we look at these decisions before us or applications before us, and we find often that we can't give the regard to the neighbourhood plan that we'd like to because it doesn't make adequate provision. Uh, or it's at odds with the emerging local plan in such a way that it makes it difficult to go with it. This is not one of those occasions. There is a good uh, neighbourhood plan which has been uh, fully adopted, is highly material, uh, makes good provision for, for, the housing, for housing need. Uh, and I, for one, would not want to uh, go against uh, that plan unless there were really compelling reasons. And I don't find reasons why we should go uh, against the plan. So I'm, a, I'm minded uh, not to agree this application. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Gould. Can we hear from Councillor Humphreys, please? Uh, Madam Chair, I have an emergency at home. And uh, if you could put me at the last bit, that'd be really appreciated. And I'll yep. get back to you. Yeah, OK, cheers. Um, Councillor Mellon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, there are three points I would like to add into the debate. Um, the planning officer has made a case based around um, the appeal decision and, and seeking to use some of the arguments there as a kind of loophole uh, in which this current application can be justified. Um, the, the papers in the bundle um, selectively quote various paragraphs of the appeal decision and really focus on the, the, the main thrust being the, the impact on the heritage asset, which I accept this new application does not, um, does not seem to be a problem. However, the inspector's report, paragraph 35, um, he says that I have found that the site would not provide an appropriate location for residential development, having regard to the development plan and national planning policies and the character and appearance of the area. And then he goes on to say, I have also found the proposal would harm the setting to the grade two listed Lady Mead. So the main thrust of the, the inspector's refusal was the policy front, and that's where it still stands. The, the impact on the heritage asset, uh, heritage asset is gone, but the main policy reason for the refusal still stands. Now, secondly, we have the, the foul drainage problem. Um, and here we have to look at the reality on the ground. Anglian water is patently wrong when it says that there is not a problem because uh, the theoretical capacity may be there, but the functional capacity is not. The bland reassurance that this can be dealt with, uh, it just seems to me completely unacceptable. Um, even, however, even if all these new houses were fitted out with the latest composting toilets so that no foul drainage went into the sewer, we still are left with the main plank of an argument against it, which is the adopted 
Pressingfield um, Neighbourhood Development Plan. I don't think we can easily set this document aside. And it seems to me that in, in trying to do so, the, the officer employs a very tortuous logic to say that it should be set aside. There's mention of paragraph 11 of the MPPF, the tilted balance. But paragraph 12 of the MPPF says, where a planning application conflicts with an up-to-date development plan, permission should not usually be granted. And that's where I find myself at this stage of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. Um, very good points there and very interesting. Thank you. Um, we now come to Councillor Norris, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, well, Councillor Mellon has already covered quite a number of the points that uh, are of concern to me. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about uh, sewage egress and what will result from adding another 18 dwellings onto the existing sewage system. Um, neighbourhood plan uh, not identified within the neighbourhood plan as a site for development outside the settlement area. Uh, is there a proven local need for this proposed development? Um, highways issues, reliance on the motor car, question is this an unsustainable location, uh, hazards for pedestrians, lack of uh, pavements in some parts of streets for pedestrians who have to walk in the road. At the present time, I am inclined not to support this application, but I will listen to the rest of the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Norris. Councillor Stringer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I start my uh, my rounding up of this issue from the appeal inspector, uh, and and he rounded up in conclusion and said, "I conclude the site is not a suitable location for new housing, having regard to the development plan and national planning policies." I'm not going to re-rehearse national planning policies, but. I think the most important part of that sentence is the development plan. And for this particular application, you have the most up to date neighbourhood plan. Uh, it's been very recently through inspection, so it's been through with a fine tooth comb and approved by our council. It is the primary document we should be using when determining this application. Uh, and, and, and that's where I, I begin and end all this. Uh, the issue about the sewage is outrageous, what's going on in this village. It's utterly outrageous, and that needs to be sorted out. It's it's a quirk of how we deal with our water, and we cannot fix that here, uh, no matter what we do. Talks of deferring and perhaps looking at private treatment works, they don't work for this multiple of houses, so some, you know, it, it should have been done already. But, of course, we have a plan in place to sort this out. It is the neighbourhood plan. Now, these neighbourhood plans are also reviewed in this case on an annual basis. A report goes to the parish council to say, are we on track? And there's been talks of whether there is a deficit in the neighbourhood plan or not. Hang on a minute. The neighbourhood plan is less than two years in to delivering all the housing numbers. And there's talk of whether it's eight short or six short. Hang on. We've got 20 odd years to go to make up this, this shortfall, if indeed there is one. And the way to, if the, if the neighbourhood plans aren't delivering the housing numbers, then the neighbourhood plans are reviewed and th the position could change. And that is where a proposal such as this should be cited. It should be coming up as a potential site to be reviewed if, very important, if the current neighbourhood plan is not delivering. And of course, this one is delivering. It's a material consideration, as is damage to it. The MPPF clearly says, and there's loads of case history about being premature and damaging neighbourhood plans. Uh, and and, it, and as it clearly says, you know, if something is contrary to the neighbourhood plan, it should generally be refused, uh, which is where I think this one should be. Uh, I think that's basically all, all I've got, other than to say, if we're worried about windfall, there's another class use coming into windfall, and that's this class Q thing where you can have up to four dwellings, uh, an old agricultural building. Th those are coming through in, in quite large numbers. So I have absolutely no doubt that Fressingfield will hit its number, 
Uh, and like I say, and I, I would determine this completely in line with its neighbourhood plan, which is the primary document. Uh, and that's basically where I sit. Thank you, Chair. May I come in at this point, Chair? Hello? Sorry, Chair, I believe you're on mute still. Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, Councillor Warboys. If we can just let John come in, and um, I apologise to you. I think he's got a relevant point to make. Thank you. We need to be very careful about the treatment of the neighbourhood plan, and especially when we say it's a primary document. Um, it's gonna. I'm gonna have to probably read this out and forward because I think it's about the best way to uh, be clear and make sure that we don't end up with a judicial review risk here. Um, so I'm. I'm gonna. It's gonna sound like I'm reading this because I am reading it in part. But I think it'd be useful uh, to uh, sum this up in in a, an appropriate way. And Ian, I, I will appreciate any help you have with this. Um, I'm here, John. Yes. So I'm going to start from the beginning and, and, and put this into context because members do need to demonstrate they've considered this as a matter of law. So while the council can, as a district council, demonstrate a five year housing supply, the NPPF also requires that its development plan policies, which are the most important for the determination of an application, are not out of date as defined in paragraph 11. So essentially, if, we, if that isn't the case, we have what is called the tilted balance. In this case, the tilted balance is engaged because if taken in the round, the most important policies for determination are out of date in the local plan. This is CS1, CS2, H7. And they've been found out of date uh, by various uh, appeals, uh, including those dealt by a public inquiry. So, Members are accordingly advised that paragraph 11D of the MPPF and its effect is a material consideration, which your, in your officer's opinion indicates that a decision should be made otherwise in accordance with the mentioned plans. The tilted balance directs that a planning permit should be granted unless there are significant and demonstrational harm. The neighbourhood plan is a part of the development plan and therefore uh, also within the scope of section uh, 38 of the Act. Now, accordingly, the decision should be made in accordance with that unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The material consideration being the NPPF and the NPPF that requires all parts of the development plan to be in date. All parts of your development plan are not in date. Are not, they are, one part is out of date. Now, I appreciate the local plan is old and I appreciate it's uh, been going for some time. And ultimately, you know, we are desperately trying to get to the point where we have a new local plan. It's almost like a replacement part that we've just been waiting for for some time. And we can give that limited weight and it's an emerging document, but it isn't here now. We unfortunately at the moment have various elements that make up the development plan, but one of them is out of date. And it doesn't matter how in date the neighbourhood plan is, and how up to date and recent it is, it doesn't negate the issue that we have an out of date element still part of our policy consideration. And I think we need to be very careful here. There is no such thing as a primary document. The document is all of the documents that form the development plan. That is your consideration by law. Um, I was going to try and explain it in a different way, but I think I'm going to leave it there at this moment in time. Um, the interpretation of the policy is a matter of law. We've got to be very careful of that. And that includes the placement of the local plan and the neighbourhood plan as part of the development plan. You can't set one aside for another. The weight to be attached to particular material considerations, though, is for the decision maker exercising reasonable judgment on its planning merits. And there's variations of that. That includes the appeal and that includes, you know, the appeal was for more houses. So, you, you know, you've got to be very clear if we're using the appeal as a start point of what the material considerations there apply to this actual proposal in front of you today. I think I'll leave it there before I go on. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you very much for that. Um, coming back. Thank you. That was interesting. Councillor Warboys, I think you wanted to speak next, if you would, please. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to absorb everything that Mr. Pateman <laughs> G's has just told us. Um, the way I see it, I think there are three main issues here, which all for me make it very difficult to support this planning application. The first is, I, I think, as, as we've already aired at some length, is the completely unacceptable business of uh, the sewage being discharged into the street. Anglia Waters sitting on a profit of £68 million to 2019. And, that, and in effect, it seems to have washed its hands of the problem and turned it into so, a, a potential profit making situation where it can charge people for discharging surface water. The existing foul water system is clearly inadequate and it'd be difficult to support a plan and application that added to that problem. Um, the second issue is the the traffic. Um, again, I'm a bit surprised that the 20 mile per hour traffic scheme is linked to this development. There's money from central government available for improving pedestrian and cyclists safely. Uh, and this should be seen as a priority to cope with existing problems. Um, and further development will only make the situation worse. Um, and finally, the, the neighbourhood plan. This is this has a as a vision for Fresingfield. Um, it has set a target for by 2036. It is almost reaching that target in terms of rec need for development. Uh, and as Councillor Stringer says, the, there's over the next 16 years, it's extremely likely that um, the odd number of houses will come forward to meet the, the target in, in full. Um, this is this, a great deal of commitment has gone into producing this main neighbourhood plan, 88% support by the locality. And they recognised that there was a need for development uh, and identified an appropriate target. For, for my mind, that, that document sh should hold sufficient weight together with the infrastructure problems to be able to refuse this planning application. Thank you for that, Councillor Warboys. Now, Councillor Humphreys, have you been listening to us? Um, I, I'm, I know you sort of shot off, but I'm not quite sure what your situation yeah, no. is. Because <laughs> it's pretty much the same, same room, so I did shoot off, but uh, dealt with now. So excuse any noise in the background, but um, my grandson had an incident, uh, so <laughs> just dealt with that. Um, there he goes. So, um, so for the debate side of it, at uh, first glance, um, looking at it in a different way, this is a logical place to develop. Even though it is outside the settlement boundary, it just seems the right place for the right right development. Um, and the fact that Lady Mead now, that has been mitigated against, is no longer part of this issue. Again, that takes away that whole debate about um, about the uh, Grade 2 listed building. So like I say, uh, looking at it objectively from space, you think, do you know what, it's not a bad place to put it. However, it is outside the settlement boundary. And it could be argued, um, there's no no need for any extra local housing here, especially when you consider the neighbourhood development plan, um, well established and has significant weight. They've already allocated um, up to, well, it depends, it got a little bit confusing on numbers before, between 51 and 54 houses or dwellings that have been approved already or highlighted. This 18 houses would take it over that level considerably, in my view, and therefore shouldn't happen. Um, that neighbourhood development plan has significant weight. We shouldn't take that away. That's significant weight without a shadow of a doubt. A lot of effort was put into that uh, in its adoption, its writing and, and basically what it is now. Um, it's already identified areas for development within the settlement area, which is fantastic. Um, so th they've done their best to actually say, do you know what? We're not opposed to development. But there's a level that we can go to. And they've said 60 houses over the lifetime of the uh, neighbourhood development plan 
well, this, as I said before, will take them over that. And I think it's excessive and, and not required. Um, I realise that obviously housing doesn't have a ceiling or a maximum ceiling, excuse the pun on that, but we still need to take the uh, neighbourhood development plan into consideration because it's significant weight. If you go back to the uh, original appeal decision on this site, and I know it's slightly bigger and it's for more houses, some of the points that the inspector brought out and some of the reasons actually it went there are, are still valid and it's all building outside of the settlement area. It, it's madness. I just don't get this. Um, if you think about the agent's point, when I asked them about, uh, they said, well, we need to basically deal with the neighbourhood development plan. Absolutely. Unless material considerations, considerations are greater. And they just talked about the um, the highways and the drainage. Well, I don't think the drainage has been satisfied at all in the slightest. And I think that actually having listened to everybody else in the debate and the officers and everybody else that's spoken, that is still a major issue um, that is only going to get worse. And I just can't can't accept that we'd allow that to happen. Um, I just don't get it. Even, even with Mr. Payment G's uh, solution to some of the drainage issues, it's still not right. OK, it's still not right. It's outside of the, of the settlement area and it's against their neighbourhood development plan. Um, so my major concern is the total number of houses or dwellings that are going to be uh, created in this area, which is against the uh, neighbourhood development plan well in excess of 60. I think they've done their very best to accommodate um, development in that area. And I think, you know, enough's enough. This is too much. I just think this is a time when we really need to listen and read what's in the neighbourhood development plans and try and adhere to it whenever possible. And secondly, I think this is a time when we really do need to listen to the number of objectives, which I think has been unprecedented on this, um, and their concerns, because they're all valid. This isn't an emotional argument. Their argument is fairly factual. I think we should listen to it. Um, I'm not a fan of this, I've got to be honest with you, um, but we'll see where we go. Thank you. Thank you for that. And with the encouraging noises of your grandson in the background, I don't think he is either. Um, yeah, my turn. I think I agree with Councillor Humphreys um, in his opening gambit is when you look at it in the initial stages, mm, that looks pretty good. You know, the road's already in there and so on and so forth. We often have cases coming to us that are outside the settlement boundaries, but they don't always have a neighbourhood plan. Mr Pateman G has bothered me somewhat um, by suggesting that because our joint local plan is out of date, it's only gone through for Reg 19, or it's gone out for consultation, the tilted balance kicks in. And I wonder where we sit with that. Um, many, many people have written and objected very sound objections, and I find it appalling that Anglia Water and um, the many previous people have been trying to resolve the issue of flooding and sewage. And I'm uncomfortable that sewage from this um, development, should it be approved, would add to the problem. I don't care what anyone says, it would add to the problem. I also heard from uh, Mr Pateman G who said, ah, oh, well, we might be able to solve that. We could do individual sewage things. So there's an awful lot of... Um, not very good points here. Sam unfortunately had to leave and the highways issue, uh, there always conflict of highways and it, 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 it's difficult to put more danger in place if you like, but that's not for me to say what's dangerous and what isn't. I wonder for concern of the, 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 the neighbourhood plan, and the reason for it, and our joint local plan, whether we should defer this. And I, the reason I say this is we can get council's advice because we need to know on this business of a neighbourhood plan, does it trump an application? And if because our policies are out of date, the tilted balance comes in place, then we're in danger of being overturned. Uh, I very much don't want to say I agree with this application. 
I don't. But I just wonder if deferring it just to get all those, because I wouldn't be prepared to put this through and say, ah, oh, yes, well, we'll let the officers sort this out and the officers sort that out because highways have said this. We've got an awful lot of people who've taken time to write into us and we owe it to them and their neighbourhood plan. So I wonder whether there's any mileage in that for anybody to think about. So I've sown that seed and we'll go round again because this is a very, very upsetting application. So with your good grace, would anybody else like to comment um, a second time, please? Councillor Stringer. Uh, all along, well, for months since we've had neighbourhood plans, th there is a growing and uh, noticeable conflict between the, many of them and national and some of our local policies in where they do sit, where they don't sit. Mm. There's been a very, for me, an uncomfortable trend of uh, sometimes neighbourhood plans appearing to be inconvenient uh, to, to swift decision making, which is why I'm always very twitchy about how they're written about. And even in the papers today, we found a number of omissions where, you know, where, where it could have been more clarified for us. I personally don't have, I, I wouldn't want to defer this application. We have enough information here to actually make a determination, I feel. Uh, and actually, if if this is, I mean, in the end, what we're trying to do is law, lawfully determine an application and see how it fits with local, district and national legislation. For me, this particular one is quite unique because we've got a, you know, the, the biggest, the document with the most noise for me uh, within all the suite of documents is how this document links with the National Planning Policy Framework. And it bolts on beautifully. And for me, it says that this application should be refused uh, because of the, the housing provision of this hinterland village with very, very sparse connectivity. And that community has looked at that sparse connectivity. Actually, when uh, the officer put up the, the, the footpath mapping, I thought that was brilliant because what that demonstrated was how difficult the connectivity of this site would be and why the parish, uh, the, why the, uh, the, the neighbourhood plan had allocated the sites it had allocated. It pointed out to me why that neighbourhood plan had been well thought through. So for me, I would have no qualms in refusing this application as it stands on a number of grounds, including it being against the uh, FERES1 in the neighbourhood plan. And if that applicant, the applicant then has two choices, they either appeal that situation and then the government whose will via the MPPF can then be tested by the government. Uh, and or they can work with the neighbourhood plan group as bringing in this up a site in the future as part of any review. That's all I have to say, Chair. Thank you. That's me again. Sorry about that. Um, I think we need to be careful. The um, joint local plan is advising hinterland. It hasn't gone through yet. And that's where I'm getting nervous about it all. Um, so um, we'll carry on just going around listening to everybody else. And then um, I think if anybody wants to um, make a proposal, they need to demonstrate the harm. Um, so if you can be thinking on that, I'd be grateful. And Councillor Mellon, you wish to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to comment briefly, uh, um, I'm, I'm really, I think, in, in general agreement with Councillor Stringer. I, I would find it hard to support a deferral. Um, I believe there's enough, um, I hate to use the word material, um, because that's been used in various senses, but there, we have enough arguments uh, against this proposal um, to, to put a case together for, for refusal. Uh, and that's one I think I would support. OK, thank you for that. Anyone else wish to speak or would anybody like to put forward their proposals, please? 
May I, Chairman, come in before anyone pushes this further forward? Hmm? Yeah. OK, um, I'm listening to what everybody's saying, and I, I, I get that there's a lot of uh, feeling of looking towards possibly even a refusal here. Um, I need to be a defendable position for the council. I need to understand what is the demonstrable harm. And I think we we need to get very clear on this. The requirement of a tilted balance ultimately is to uh, direct that, that we can, you know, we should be granting permission unless there is significant and demonstrable harm. And I'm going to be blunt about this. A few extra houses above a limit that within a neighbour plan is not enough, in my opinion, to be demonstrating harm. It's, we, we, if we have a cap on development, which we, we were we failed to defend before as a council, um, we are going to we the NPPF doesn't say there should be a cap on development. You know, you can have more. What we need to work out, though, is if that more results in harm. And so far in the debate, all I've heard is the sewage system is the harmful element. Fine. I've got one harmful element. What else is harm? And it's, is it significant harm that I can demonstrate and defend at an appeal? So please, we need to go through that far more if we are going down a, a refusal route, as the impression I'm beginning to get. Councillor Stringer, you've got something yeah, to help yeah. us with, I'm there's, sure. There's, there's two, two bits of harm that I've, I've listed. Uh, the first bit of harm is actually to the neighbourhood plan itself, and that is actually a material consideration within the guidance. The other bit of harm was identified by the original appeal inspector. Uh, it, it was harm to the character and appearance of the area. He wasn't just talking about the historic building. He was talking about the entire site. So there is harm to the character and appearance of the area and there is harm to the neighbourhood plan and there is harm to the existing infrastructure because everyone recognises that this is the mo not the most safely connected village you'll ever see because of the narrowness and the design of the streets. So there are three clear ident identifiers of harm just there. Thank you, Chair. May I come back on that, please? Um, uh, yes. You're, you're you're saying your the character and appearance remains uh, despite the reduction since the appeal because you feel the remainder of the site that is now put forward today uh, is still harmful in terms of the character and appearance of the area. Okay, and you're saying there are insufficient connections um, and the infrastructure there in in terms of footpaths and, and byways and so on yep. to support uh, the growth of this development. I don't understand how it harms the neighbourhood plan. Right. Well, OK, uh, it's, it's difficult to explain. Well, it isn't difficult to explain because I've been involved with one uh, and there are. Sorry, I'll put the uh, video on as well. There are hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours go into this. And uh, what is highly likely if you get an application which is deemed premature, they are immediately going to have to review their neighbourhood plan, which means it's suddenly going to be out of kilter with every other plan. Uh, or what is likely to happen is everyone will consider that the whole neighbourhood planning process was a complete waste of time and everybody give up. And that is harm. How, um, I'm sorry, I don't agree. I can't, I okay. can't put that in planning terms. That I would have very, I'd have a lot of difficulty in trying to put that into planning terms. Um, I appreciate. Well, the, the MPPF is very helpful because it says we're a made neighbourhood plan where there is a current five year land supply. It says applications that are outside of that should normally be refused. OK, but where it says normally be refused, that's true. But we are in the situation that that is part of a development plan and the tilted balance is engaged. So I, I've got to weigh that into the account. And that's probably where uh, uh, sort of further advice, possibly from council, might be needed if we were to go down that road. And that might be a reason why we would want to defer it for us to get that advice. 
Can I just say that sounds a reasonable alternative to ensure that Councillor Stringer's comments are um, defensible? Would you agree, Councillor Stringer? Yeah, they're not just my comments. I have to say they're, they're what's in the policy. I'm, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just All right. to get you know, if, if, if we want to defer to get that opinion, please do. To get opinion on where a made neighbourhood plan is in, and when the tilted balance or should or should not be invoked is possibly a good thing. And, and, that's, and that's where I would be coming from. But I wonder if in doing so, we could put Councillor Stringer's points as the reason for deferral, if members might be minded to, they might not, but to get clarity on that very point, uh, Councillor Stringer, because as you say, this has happened before and we mm. need clarity. Mm. And I mean, once the, once the joint local plan is in place, we're, 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 we're on the home straight. Which is why I suspect we're witnessing the timings of applications that we are at the moment. But. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they mm -hmm. are yeah. Um, but um, Councillor String, if you just hold that one in abeyance for the moment, I will. because okay, because I'm wondering if you could take that as a proposal. And I see other people have put their hands up, and I'll, let me just hear how they feel about that that scenario. Councillor Gould. Hey, so, uh, I think actually Councillor Humphreys uh, was was before me. Oh, I beg um, your pardon. Sorry, I'm looking on the list. Councillor Humphreys, sorry, you wanted to speak. I beg your pardon. Councillor Humphreys? Yep, Madam Chair, sorry, button problems there. So background noise aside, um, I get a lot of what Councillor String is saying. I also get what um, Mr Payton G is, is saying as well. Um, but I, I'm sort of signing towards your view of a deferral so that we can get some of this information that is going to be important for us to make a decision. Um, and part of that would be, in my opinion, is part of the inspector's report because at the, as far as I can, can read it, 288289, they're pretty much a summary of what you said. I'd like to see a little bit more detail as to why it's refused because that might be relevant to what we're doing now. Even though it's a bigger site, even though it's two fields, I think some of the reasons for that, um, for that uh, loss of appeal are still relevant and would be very, very useful for our debate and our decision making. Um, so I, I understand the reason for a possible deferral um, because I think there's still a few more questions that need to be asked. And indeed, um, the, the issue over the sewage, I mean, it, it you know, it needs to be looked at properly, doesn't it? Councillor Gould, you were going to speak as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'd, I'd, a few minutes ago, I was um, uh, minded to go against deferral because, uh, like Councillor Stringer, I thought uh, this was a clear enough matter. Uh, to be able us to, for us to determine it uh, now. Um, however, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I found two parts of our role in conflict here. One, one is the democratic role in terms of judging planning matters, and the other is the duty to act in a responsible way and, and not put um, public resources and so on at, at risk. And it's how we reconcile those two things. So I'm minded now that we, we do seek um, a council or other expert uh, advice on this, but I'd, I'd like that to be on the basis of how we support uh, a refusal uh, decision to refuse uh, rather than uh, the legitimation of some other planning perspective, if you get my drift. Thank you. I, I do indeed, Councillor Gould, which is why I said to Councillor Stringer, hold your thoughts on the the refusal aspect of it while we look at a deferral aspect so i absolutely agree with you um so um who have we got yeah so councillor stringer do you want to come back and and make a formal proposal on that way um, uh, do, and do you know do you know i've i've considered this a little bit uh <laughs> and do you know i'm not i'll tell you for why oh. <laughs> because when you go and get council's opinion what they'll do they'll go and look back at previous appeal cases and cases that have been through judicial review. And I then ask myself, if this council doesn't have the gall and the backbone to back a neighbourhood plan to make part of that council law, that case law, what is a council for? If it's not to support a community that's put in all of the hard work 
to produce an exemplar neighbourhood plan. Frankly, if that costs this authority some money in defending it, then that's what we should do on behalf of our citizens. If not, all we're going to be doing is getting case law on other people's decisions. So frankly, I wouldn't still vote to defer it. Now I've considered it, I think what we should do is uphold this neighbourhood plan and get that tested. Well, I've got another idea. How about if we go for minded to refuse, but get further information that we seek further information so that that's then in the box? Uh, uh, Chair, I don't see how that helps because well, uh, if, if, the, if the council's opinion comes back and says, I think you I think you've not got a strong case. What what do we then do? It comes back. Well, if we haven't got a strong case, then we're, then the point has been proved. But well, but no, it has. I think we, but I think we've I'm got a lot. To we go ahead and prove it. Well, will somebody please come up with a proposal of something, and then we can have okay. a vote on it, and we'll either vote well, it up or vote it down. To help you, chair, I will move refusal on the basis of the Fressingfield neighbourhood plan. Happy to second that, Chair. And that's and that's the reason for refusal, is it? Yep. Yes, Chair. Okay. Um, Chair, if I may, I would also want to put in the the sewage situation as a material consideration uh, uh, in favour of refusal. Councillor Stringer. So that's actually the infrastructure is also in the Fressingfield neighbourhood plan. Councillor Humphreys. Yeah, Madam Chair, sorry, just, just obviously without a proposal and a seconder there, just for my own sanity and awareness so I can vote on it. What are the actual reasons, the physical actual reasons? Lay them down no, and then. It, it just says the neighbourhood plan. Yep, it's and that is planned policy. Uh, hang on, let me get the number correct. Uh, uh, there we go. That would be it's just disappeared. It's the it's number one, which is the F uh, F N P O one, I believe. Let me have to scroll through. The IT is being particularly annoying today. It Here we go. It's very good. F yeah. F R E S one. And FRES3, which is the infrastructure. Sorry, are we waiting for you, Councillor Stringer? Oh, I thought I, I thought I was waiting. Sorry, I thought I was waiting for someone else, Chair. Uh, oh, well, no, I thought that I thought you were going to give us I some reasons. Have, I would. Have, well, there, there are two. Um, I, I, I've been advised that we can't use or shouldn't use anything beginning with a C because that's out of date, or with an H because they're all out of date in the local plan. So that is what I'm left with. And the National Planning Policy Framework is not a policy, so I can't quote that. Sorry, Councillor String, it's Vincent Pierce. Oh, in Vincent. your list, um, yeah. were you thinking 
FERS 15 transport and highway safety or or did you feel that the position as established following the last appeal wasn't a good reason for well, refusal just for the sake of yeah, absolute 15, clarity 15 there is an issue on uh, transport because of the connectivity because but that links into our F R E S one doesn't it it's the why they chose it didn't choose it in the first place yeah. uh, so uh, yeah Councillor Norris wanted to say something. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, I had pretty well sort of formulated the idea of recommending refusal, but having listened to what's just been said recently, I tend to see merit in your suggestion of a deferral on a minded to refuse basis but that gives us time to get more information on our position so i can very much see the value of that that's all i wanted to say thank you well that that is helpful because i haven't have i had a seconder on this one i'm not sure um councillor gould Yes, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd be um, happy to second uh, that that proposal that uh, we have a minded to refuse but seek further advice that, that seems to me to be the responsible and uh, prudent way ahead. Though, to say again, I am um, opposed to uh, to this application, but want to see the SAP Council's position safeguarded. Indeed. Um, Robert Carmichael, thank you for that, Councillor Gill. Robert Carmichael, you've put your hand up for something. Thank you, Chair. Sorry to just interrupt. We do have a substantive proposal on the table. Mm -hmm. I couldn't jump in quick enough there, I'm afraid, um, from <laughs> Councillor Stringer, um, seconded by Councillor Mellon. So in the normal line of things, we do have to take that um, formally before we can um, go to any other proposal, uh, to any other proposal to vote upon. Um, but can I um, just take legal advice for a moment? Can we just uh, pause well, for legal advice? Well, yeah, yes, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, that Mr. Carmichael's quite right. And unless the if we have unless the proposer and seconder of, of the refusal motion choose to withdraw it, we must vote on that resolution before we consider anything else. It, I mean, it, it's so my understanding is it was proposed and it was seconded. Is that yeah, right? That's what I was um, questioning. Yeah. Um, I think we had we had we did have Councillor Stringer making a proposal, although he was in the process of formulating his reasons. For it. But um, I, I believe that had been done. Hmm. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy for it to go to a vote. And yeah. Well, hang on. I'm not sure I've got a second okay. yet. Can we just do it one at a time? Um, <laughs> Uh, was it seconded by Councillor Mellon, Andrew, Councillor Andrew Mellon? Is that right? That is correct, Mr. Dupre. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Yes. Okay. So if we just before we go to the vote, can I just have a, a time out for a quick legal conversation? That would be quite wise, Chairman. I'm very happy to give you you advice. We we've done it in the council chamber when you've we've gone outside the room. There's nothing wrong in it, so we can do it. So can we just do that for a moment, please, if you would, please, ladies and gentlemen? I'll so we the way we live stream we'll and I will we'll set up a live. separate meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Yourself, Chair, Mr. Dupre. Well, I can I can make a phone call, can I not? Yeah, if you wish to, Chair. If that's if that. Yeah, I'll make a phone call. Thank you.
I am now exercising my discretionary powers as chairman and I will send the matter to referrals. Um, the reason being is that, Rob, I want to be absolutely clear that the Constitution says I can do that because I'm mindful of the strong advice from the officers of the relative weakness of the reasons for our refusal. So, Rob, can you confirm that I am entitled to do that at this point? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I will be referring for reference to the Council's Constitution under the planning referrals. So this is part 3C, Development Control A, B and planning referrals. Within the subsection regarding to that, at point under the planning referrals section part 1, I'll just read it out for clarity if that's okay, Chair, just so that all members are aware of what I'm referring to. Thank you. Um, so all aspects of the planning and development control refer to committee for determination in accordance with the protocol for the use of planning officer delegations, upon which the delegations, the development control committee fails to agree the recommendation of the chief planning officer and where the chairman is of the opinion that the decision would not be in, accord in accordance with the overall policies and procedures approved by the council as defined within the protocol for the use of planning officer delegations. Now, Chair, there is, a, there is on this point, there is ambiguity, as is not uncommon within a constitution, but I would, um, I would advise with Mr. Dupre's comments as well, that if, where there is ambiguity in a constitution, the chair's interpretation is always final. So I would advise that because it does not say at a certain point that you have to make a decision by that, that you can use your rights or your power as chair to send it to the planning referrals at this point. Mr. Dupre, any comments you well, have yeah, will that, be greatly received. That, that is much. Because, uh, th thank you very much for that, Mr. Carmichael. I'm just wondering, sorry, I know this is elongating a very tedious meeting, but I'm sorry. To, no, it's not tedious. It's an important democratic meeting. It's what what what? Because I, I was struggling to get hold of, I was advising the chairman just now privately, and I was struggling to get hold of the wording of the constitution. I'm very glad you have. I was relying on memory. W would you mind awfully just re re reading that out again, just so I can fully get my head around it and make sure I, I'm satisfied I've given the right advice? Yes, of course, Mr. Debray. Yeah. So this to exercise the general role is to exercise the council's powers as a local planning authority in respect of all aspects of planning and development control referred to committee for determination in accordance with the protocol for use of the planning officer delegations upon which the development control committee fails to agree with the recommendation of the chief planning officer and where the chairman is of the opinion that the decision would not be in accordance with the overall policies and procedures approved by council as defined within the protocol for the use of planning officer delegations. Mm. Right. Well, I'm just I'm just thinking this through now. I mean, fails to agree. The the committee at this minute has not actually made a formal decision. So what would would you say that means if we I, I do recall I was saying to the chairman we both she and I both recall an instance a couple of years ago where there was a res there was a proposal to grant permission in accordance with an officer recommendation but which fell so there was no authority to refuse but there was a perfectly proper and lawful decision made then to refer it to take it to referrals committee um yeah i agree that there's ambiguity the issue is whether it, i mean if if the resolution to refuse was passed was passed the the chairman could. But I, I think no. I think actually having so I'm debating with myself out loud. But I think I think I, yeah. I, I think common sense says that if that the chair has got the discretion at this point, and um, yeah, yes, I, I I I have taken that view now. I agree with you. And that, Madam Chairman, that is your that is your decision. Having received our advice that you in, you wish to intend to uh, you are. Ref taking the matter to referrals committee. Yes. That, 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 exactly, that is, exactly so. Could, could, yes. could, could I then ask for a point of order? Could 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 I, could I ask what oh. decision it is that we've taken? 
Well, I can make I can, I can make the, the decision as advised by the legal officer. So um, uh, uh, that's my decision. Yeah, well, no, I, no, sorry, sorry. The, the, my understanding of the constitution is that referrals committee, the chairman has the ability to send something to a referral committee when the committee has come to a decision. We have not yet come to a decision. Um, well, there is a proposal on the table that may or may not get a majority. If my proposal falls, would that change your decision? Mm. Well, the, the the example I referred to a minute ago, that there, there was a failure of a resolution to approve that, but that meant that the the committee by negatively, as it were, was indicating its disagreement with the advice of the chief planning officer. So at that point, it was lawful for the, the chair. I mean, yeah, I, well, Councillor String has made the point as to what why I was debating with myself about this point. But if I suppose Councillor Stringer is saying that, well, OK, if my resolution to refuse is is passed, that, that would be seen normally as an instruction to the officers by the committee to issue a notice of refusal. But the chair under the, the Suff Mid Suffolk Constitution, the chair then has discretion to take it to referrals committee. I mean, maybe I think for the sake of I mean, conscious that one doesn't wish to interfere, one wishes to interfere as little as possible. Mr. Mr. Carmichael, I'm bringing you in again, if I may. We, I think what Councillor Stringer is suggesting is that we ought to take the votes and then if, if the refusal is positively passed, then the chair still may still choose to take it to referrals committee. Sorry, thank you, Mr. Dupre. Um, yes, I completely, and I, I see the point made by Councillor Stringer completely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very valid point to be fair. Yeah. Um, as such, as I, I, would, I, I would retract part of my earlier um advice then on that point if i could um yeah, bearing that in mind and uh, thank you councillor strain for pointing that point out in that respect um but, and i would um i would advise that such as um we've said yeah, Mr. Pray, um that I, it is based on the decision um taken if it does go to that point that then you could um still use that power then chair if the if it was approved with the, if a refusal did go through I have to say that was the point I brought up when I did have a discussion a minute ago with the legal officer. However, I was advised otherwise. So what are no, you now telling me as a legal I person? Think, no, I think the point is, I mean, I when Mr. Carmichael read, read it out, I did take note of the word decision. I I think my, my initial interpretation was it, it would be reasonable for you to say I'm reading the mood of the meeting and I'm making the decision now. I think I think we oh, yes, on balance we ought to we ought to go ahead and vote on Councillor Stringer and Councillor Mellon's Mel resolution and then you decide what to do, Madam Chairman. Okay. Sorry. Chair, can I sorry it's Vincent, can I suggest that seeing this is such a tricky point, rather than Mr. Dupre base his advice on Mr. Carmichael reading the text. Can Mr. Carmichael send a copy of the docu that piece of the document to Mr. Carm uh, to Mr. Dupre, and we actually have the benefit of Mr. Dupre's opinion, having read it for himself, and mm -hmm. perhaps with a minute or two's calm reflection? Because I'm just a bit worried that we're we're going one way and the other, one way and the other, and actually Mr. Dupre hasn't read it. For himself yeah, in the I, was just, I was struggling to get hold of the constitution online and, and keep the this this other thing going at the same time so it was just a we, we've all been having technical problems today um if well if we take I, five minutes then while mr dupre gets hold of a copy of this but um i was given the advice and i've yeah. acted on the advice yeah. that in, indeed madam chairman that's no criticism there of you at all um i will Well, if I if I can go out. Right, OK, thank you very much. It's on. Yeah. Thank you.
I'm just it's, it's a link that I'm trying to open and it's I don't know if it's the same problem I had that they, I, I because I'm in one system I can't read something else on another um, oops. Chair, uh, in in the instance of brevity and not bringing the council uh, in uh, an IT into disrepute, ca can I suggest a way forward that I withdraw my motion and that I back your motion under the understanding that you'll get that legal advice in the meantime? Hello, sorry, is Ian Depro here? Sorry, I've, I was just the system was being very slow loading. I was I was in the constitution, but every page was downloading itself in, in slow motion. Uh, so. Ian, can you just hold on a minute? Yes, um, sir. Councillor Stringer, do you want to hear what Ian has to say first before you pass? Well, yeah, I think, I, think I, owe, I do. We do owe you an, an answer, Councillor Stringer, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. I just don't, I don't, it, it's it's not a good look, is it? And, and, and you know, we want efficient debate and efficient decision making and yeah. and if we can't get it then you know but yeah okay but uh, I, 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 okay. i'm not sure that uh, that um ian heard your comment councillor stringer okay well, well I, think, I, I think i heard councillor stringer offering to withdraw his uh proposal and uh, accept I, I think yes i did hear what he said all oh, right okay so uh, I, I think I think that's the only way we're going to you know break this deadlock. I think is or we're going to end up there anyway. I think so. <laughs> if if I could have the clear understanding that we will go and get some council's opinion on the status of neighbourhood plans vis-a-vis -vis MPPF and whether the tilted balance is invoked or not, uh, then I will I will reluctantly back that ref deferral. Uh, As I said to you, that's very not only magnanimous of you, it's very sensible because it gets us out of yep, future, future issues. Absolutely. So, um, we, we owe this to the hundreds of hours that have gone absolutely. in voluntarily. Absolutely. absolutely. And that was where my difficulty was coming in in the first place. Yes, I, I understand. So I Thank will make. I will withdraw so that magnanimously. Or do you want someone else to make the proposal, Councillor Stringer? Well, I, I'll withdraw mine, but you understand why I put it and why I would go yeah. to the wire and we should be testing this system but i will uh, you know in, in the pursuit of brevity and getting my life back i will <laughs> withdraw that on that clear understanding we will get council's opinion on this and, and councillor well, humphreys was that what you were about to agree to <laughs> madam chair i think uh, as, as you say magnanimous uh, well then council string i think it's the right move uh, and therefore well, because of that i would like to propose with the conditions that you've applied and uh, and discussed there, that uh, we move for deferral. For the status of neighbourhood plans vis-a-vis 
NPPF and the tilted balance. Yes? If, I, if I may interrupt, if we, I understand Councillor Stringer has graciously withdrawn his, his proposal. Are we, is, is that the, the new proposal is that we take Council's advice, but, it, but to, and the decision to be made by, sorry, by which committee when? Well, that would then come back to Committee B again, wouldn't it's it? Deferred, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah well, that, deferred back to us. It, well, yes, that that would be that is a, that is a, a logical thing to do, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to Councillor Stringer. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, Chair. Sorry to add to this, but in view of the delicacy of this, do you think it would be appropriate for us to share our brief to the barrister with members, so well, that you, so that, that you. So that you all understood that we were actually asking for the advice on the basis that Councillor Stringer had asked us to do it on. Yeah, well, I don't think that's a problem. I, I don't no. know. I, I, can we? Uh, I, I'm in in legal, and and um, the committee officers advice on that one, and John Pateman G. I mean. Well, I'm, it's, it will be me or a colleague of mine who will write the brief to council. I mean, I'm, it, it would not be perfectly proper for it to be shared with, sen with senior members. Um, right. So we have a proposal. Do I have a seconder for that particular motion? Uh, Councillor Caston. Yes, happy to second Councillor Humphrey's proposal. So, so we can be clear on that. Right. So, Robert, would you like to take a vote on that particular item, please? Thank you, Chair. So, if members could please respond with for, against or abstain. Came to the Je Councillor James Carston. For. Councillor Peter Gould. For. Councillor Cathy Guthrie? Four. Councillor Barry Humphreys? Four. Councillor Andrew Mellon? Um, I'm sorry, Chair, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced what we're voting on. Is it deferral or referral? De no, no, deferral with um, the status of the neighbourhood plans versus the NPPF and the tilted balance. And, and, and the, and the council's advice on it. And it's, it's going, it was clarified, it, the intention is it, it goes to another ordinary committee, presumably this committee B. Uh, okay, I'm happy to vote for that proposal. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mike Norris? Four. Councillor Andrew Stringer? Four. And Councillor Roland Warboys? Four. Thank you, Chair. That is carried unanimously. And I'm very grateful for everybody's input there because we want to get clarity and everything accurate so thank you to everybody um what i would do now um is that um it has been suggested to me that we are running on um we have one final matter to debate um i don't need a proposer and a seconder but a show of hands will do me are we able to carry on or do people want to stop madam chair i've got a chairman's brief in that's was due at 1530, now goes 1600. So I am going to another meeting. Madam Chair, th that also I've been putting off a meeting that I should have been in at three o'clock. Um, they're waiting for me, so okay. I would have to leave as well. I'm, so, I'm, ha I'm happy to carry on, Chair. <laughs> yeah. same, same for me, uh, Madam Chair. What do you mean, same for you? What? That I, I have to leave now. Oh, you have to I've leave. I think, are we going to be core at still or not? How many have we got left? I can well, carry on. We've lost two members, Madam Chair. Uh, we've lost, we're losing no. councillor. Three. Three, actually. I beg, beg your pardon, we've lost three. Yeah, so we're still, we're still um, core at. Are members quite happy to carry on or do they, do they want? Um, yeah. Happy yep. to carry on. Happy to carry on, Chair. Yeah, yep. right. Off we go then. Um, get the final one out of the way, one way or the other. Just to confirm, Chair, the um, quorum of the meeting is three. Just to confirm oh, well. in case there is any um, questions regarding that. 
Right. OK, so then. Uh, please accept my apologies. I'm leaving for another meeting. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Barry. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I'm staying. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Madam Chairman. I'm Thank sorry you for your late. forbearance. <laughs> Right, who's presenting the last one? That's me, Chair. Oh, you've been very patient in the background. I think I wrote on, on my papers here, this is quite exciting prospects. Very interesting, interesting case. Well, I hope so. Um, can everybody see the PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Excellent, I'll make a start. So yeah, so this is application DC 20-01697. Um, it's at Barley Brig Farm, Laxfield Road, Stradbrook, and it is for the siting of a heat array and exchange container. Um, let's go here. So um, here's the aerial map um, for members. Um, to the west is Stradbrook, and in the centre of the image, hopefully you can all see my mouse, um, there's the existing um, facilities at Barley Brig. Um, this aerial map is slightly old. Um, it doesn't quite show everything here. It doesn't show the anaerobic digester plant um, here, and it doesn't show the second barn that's now been built here. The application um, in terms of the heat array, that's proposed to run in this section up here with then ducting to bring it to the barn down here. The heat exchanger itself, I'll point out, but in terms of its relationship to the anaerobic digester plant, it's fairly small scale um, compared to those buildings. It's sort of like a shipping container next to those enormous domes. Um, so if we come slightly further out, we can get an appreciation for the rural character of the area. Again, this map is just the same as the old one, um, slightly further out. And as we go forward, if we come to a more recent aerial map provided by uh, Google, we can see the scale of the, the site at the moment. So we have the anaerobic digester plant here. We have a number of agricultural outbuildings over here. We have the second barn next to the original that we saw before here. And then the heat array will be proposed. Um, the heat array is, is in this section of this field here. So if we go forward, we see the site location plan, very similar to what we've seen previously. And if we look at the constraints map, we have a small area of flood zone two and three affecting the site of the heat array. So if we come on to the array areas and services plan, access to the heat array and needs to be made along the, the normal access to the site. Um, we then have the heat array outlined in yellow. Cable routing proposed um, underground beside the heat array to run round behind the anaerobic digester plant. Um, that little black spot that my mouse is pointing at is a proposed location of the heat exchanger. And this is then proposed to run ducting again around to the barn structures. With regards to the heat exchanger, it looks very similar to a shipping container. It should be noted by members that the container is to be painted juniper green to better blend with the, the surroundings. It's not intended to be blue at all. What this is proposed to do is to take the heat generated by the underground heat array and also waste heat provided by the anaerobic digester plant is currently vented um, and direct that towards barns within the site that are proposed to be used um, for the drying of crop and other material to be fed into the anaerobic digester. Uh, Stradbroke Parish Council have provided some images. Now, these images um, relate to the second barn Posed on the site and the barn that would be connected up via ducting to the heat array and the heat exchanger. Now the footprint of these barns is that of a barn that was approved by the council in 2017 um, and this barn um, was implemented this summer. Um, with regards to that 2017 application, 
this barn is to be for storage only um, and is not to have um, any drying undertaken within it. This is the aerial photo um, of the barn as well, so members can have some appreciation there. Um, with regards to this aspect of the application, there would need to be a rationalisation of um, this application with the 2017 application um, to remove conditions on that application that prevent the use of the barn for drying. Alternatively, what could be brought forward on site is a separate application for another barn which could um, <coughs> purpose built for the drying of crop and other goods to go into anaerobic digester. Um, and it should also be noted that Barley Brig is large enough that it has access to permit development rights that might allow um, construction of a barn um, subject to prior approval rather than the need for full planning commission. I will pass things over to members at this point if there are any questions or, or, or matters of clarity to be brought up as regards the um, report and presentation as it stands. Thank you, members. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so where are we? We are, we don't have Councillor Caston, we don't have Councillor Gould, we don't have Councillor Humphreys. So we'll go on to Councillor Mellon. Do you have any questions for the officer, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to still get my head around this one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so there is an existing AD plant on site and the heat exchanger would be used to dry material that is going into that AD unit. Is that is that right? That's my understanding, yes. Yeah. And um, is that solely from this farm or is there other um, pro produce from other farms coming here as well to be dried? Um, with regards to this application, the only thing we're looking at is the heat array and the exchanger itself. Um, if they were, if the applicants wanted to utilise um, the existing barn on site, that would require a further planning application to allow the drying of goods um, within that barn full stop. If the applicants wish to utilise another barn, that might either then require a further planning application um, or prior approval process, either of which the council could have regard to and could then look to condition um, issues around um, where goods to be dried within the barn are to come from. OK, I mean, my concern here, and to be frank, is 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 this a viable thing or is it farming the subsidies? But I don't think that's part of the remit of this committee to decide. Um, so no further questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Norris, any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in a way, almost related to the question that uh, Councillor Mellon raised, I know it's on page 432 within the Stradbrook Parish Council comments, uh, mentions further objections noted on ecological and land use grounds. Give, given concerns, the operation of the heat array may give rise to significant vehicle movements to and from the site as well as the possibility that the incorrect use of the heat array will not allow for agricultural uses of the site. Well, surely this is purely designed for agricultural use, isn't it? And would other farms be bringing material in to be dried on this site, do we know? No, I mean, again, that's not the scope of the application before us, unfortunately, Councillor. We are only looking at whether or not the installation of the heat array and heat exchanger are acceptable on their own terms. Um, at present, I see. Okay. Um, the, the 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 barn that is on site is not is 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 prevented in planning terms from being used for drying. So the approval or refusal of this application wouldn't have any bearing on um, vehicle movements to or from site to bring in materials to either dry or removing materials that had been dried. So, 
<laughs> sorry, sorry. It's purely then on the grounds of the purpose of the use of the barn. Is that right? So the application before us is purely on the installation of the heat array and the heat exchanger. There would need to be a further application to either regularize the use of the barn that's been built out, which to my mind is a 2017 barn, which does not allow for the drying of goods within it, or there would need to be a subsequent application for the erection of a barn to allow drying of goods to go on on the site. My suggestion to members would be that if there are concerns about um, vehicle movements to and from the site and use of the barn to dry materials from other farms in the area, that that would be the relevant point when we have that application before us to look to impose conditions to either limit vehicle movements to and from the barn or to impose restriction on the type of goods that may be dried in the barn or to impose restrictions on where those goods may come from. Thank you, Daniel. That's very helpful. Uh, just following on from Councillor Norris's point there, so they could be, if members were minded, they could grant a planning permission now, but then be restricted in the operation that they wish to use it for at a later date if it doesn't satisfy the council's uh, planning conditions. Is that right? Correct. There would need to be a further yes. application, um, and at that point we could look to impose those conditions. So, so they're taking a risk then, as it were? Effectively, yes. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Sorry to have interrupted, but you brought a very good point up, Councillor oh, Norris. Councillor Stringer? Yeah, uh, I would say this one. I declare the interest of being a county councillor, and normally the county council looks at planning applications that surround waste and minerals. So the original permission for the, let me try and get this right, the, the original permission for the digester was was determined by the county council is am i correct yes, uh, yeah. and and that is allowed to import material from here there and everywhere so what we're asked being asked is can just this farm have a drying area that won't be drying stuff that comes from far and away uh are we being asked that this is not at all linked to the waste site so in terms of um, jurisdiction for determining applications, um, SCC's um, waste and minerals team are clear that they believe that this is a district matter and that this is the correct forum for determining this application. Um, the application does not affect the function of the anaerobic digester on site. It merely takes a, a waste product that is otherwise vented into the atmosphere yeah. um, through waste heat. Um, and utilises that along with the heat generated by the heating array for the drying of crop. Um, further to um, your point, Councillor Stringer, it's noted that there is currently an application with SCC um, regarding the conditions applied to the digester um, to allow for changes to be made to the amount of goods that are allowed to be processed within the digester within a given year. But can I just um, just interrupt there a, yes, a little sorry. bit there, yeah. uh, Councillor Stringer? We did discuss this at briefing. Uh, no, don't go away. You may want to come sorry. back. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, we did discuss this at briefing, and this is separate from what's under the County Council guises, which no, we're aware of. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, yeah. I'm just I'm just being mindful that are we? It, it's almost like you've got to ignore the digester yeah. for this. But frankly, you can't ignore it because what would stop people importing stuff into this dryer that's very wet that might then be processed in the digester? Then suddenly that's a different use and that's not what we're approving. You, do you understand what I'm saying? And all the associated vehicle movements with that? OK, no, I think we need to be very clear here. Ultimately, yeah. if I may, um, this is purely and simply a ground source heat array and it, the relevant container uh, exchange container that gets connected to it that's it that is what this proposal is and that we need to be extremely careful that we don't try and make it out to be anything more than that or connected to anything else this is simply done on its own individual 
planning moats. I appreciate it's difficult to extract that from everything else that may be going on this site, but we have to because that is exactly the application before us and we can only determine the application before us. Thank you. I, I, I totally get that. It's just that this is quite a unique situation because we don't see this type of drying unit uh, a, a lot in and around Mid Suffolk. So it, it, it's it's that consequence we need to be very, very clear about. Well, let's hope Suffolk County Council are as good and clear as we are. Well done, Andrew. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Warboys, any questions for... Yeah, yes, the concerns have been raised about vehicle movements. I, I was just trying to find the right page of the document. I've got papers everywhere. Uh, it, it, <laughs> mentions, it mentions two vehicle movements a day somewhere in one of the... But then in your conclusion you uh, to the planning balance, you say that there's uh, only during the build-up will be the um, ex extra traffic. So I find there's a contradiction there. So, yeah, so in terms of day-to-day -day use of the heat array and the exchanger, there are no vehicle movements associated with their operation other than um, those to and from site for routine inspection and maintenance of the heat exchanger and the heat array. So it's not the case that this application in and of itself would lead to an increase in HGV movement to and from the site. Um, I think the um, the point that the parish council would want to make on this is that they have concerns over what would come next in terms of connecting this to a barn or other structure for the drying of goods and crops and whether that would lead to increases in vehicle movements to and from the site. OK, thank you. And Councillor Flatman, do you have any questions for the officer at all? As Councillor Flatman. Thank you, Chair. Thank she, you, Chair. I'm you. here. <laughs> Has she left the building? <laughs> no, I haven't. And I've been here all day, actually. Quite interesting. Um, OK, so um, Daniel, um, on the pages with the um, report from the um, Andy Ruston Edwards Environmental mm. Health, um, mm. there's quite a few from him saying that he's, um, I am still unable to see a satisfactory acoustic report as requested. And he's said this on quite a few pages. And it's very funny that the date on the last one was. I think the 19th of 18th of May and then in above him came his superior and he's got he's got lots of these letters and then the next day there and there you go I have no objection or comment to make and that was his the management officer now that seems strange to me so so there's lots and lots from him. Every time he says, I still want, um, I would still like to um, see satisfactory acoustic report. And he said it over and over and over again. Sorry, Julie, Sorry. could you give us an indication of the page numbers? Yeah, yeah um, page 476. Um, 477, 478, there's quite a lot from him, 479. Daniel, can you respond to that, please? Yeah, of course. I was just waiting in case 477 is on. Um, so in terms of comments from the environmental health team, there's obviously been quite a lot of back and forth between the applicant and themselves. Um, in terms of um, existing levels of noise on the site, there is already a condition attached to the Suffolk County Council um, decision for the anaerobic digester that limits noise outputs from the anaerobic digester. Um, in terms of comments received from um, Mr. Rutson-Edwards, um, there's been some back and forth, but 
the final round of comments received were that actually using those conditions as a basis, he was content that there was sufficient scope um, to address this issue via condition that he has suggested in his response of the 7th of October. And it's my recommendation to committee that should this application be approved, those conditions are attached. Yeah, he does actually say, if you'll excuse me, on page 475, noise from the existing AD plant combined with the heat exchanger, both running at full capacity, and then it goes on there. And then in the recommendation, it does say noise control scheme should be enacted. Is that where you're coming from, Daniel? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. OK, I just want to make a point there. Thank you, Chair. No, 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 I think that's a very good point and it needs clearing up and making sure everybody understands it. Were there any other points you wanted to ask, um, Daniel? You're muted, but we'll, we'll accept that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so um, now ask the parish council if um, Odile was... I can't read the writing. It's Odile Fladon. Oh, thank you very much indeed. I do apologise. My eyes, oh, my glasses are on my head. I'm sorry. I've done it all my life. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I can't keep them up here and I can't read. Thank you so much. If you'd like to have your three minutes, thank you. I'm not sure I need three minutes, but I'll, I'll take what I need. The application for review today is for a ground source heat array and the siting of a heat exchange container. The heat exchange container will be sited on land within the boundary of the adjacent anaerobic digester plant. The ground source seat heat array will need to connect to a building to be able to operate. Application 1837-17 is for an agricultural building that has was granted approval in 2017. There are a number of conditions attached to the grant of planning. Condition 10 is particularly relevant to this planning application before councillors today. Specific restriction on development, restriction on changes of use. The building hereby permitted shall only be used for storing of grain, straw and farm equipment stroke machinery. No grain drying or straw burning equipment shall be installed. Reason to enable the local planning authority to retain control over the development in the interests of amenity. The planning officer states in his report at point 2.2, .2, given that application 1837 slash 17 has been implemented on site, further applications will be required before any connection to the heat exchanger and heat array can be made to allow a barn on site to function as a drying barn. Condition, conditions attached to 183717 explicitly prevent this use within the barn currently built out on site. Given this, the Parish Council suggests it would be premature for this application being considered today to be granted as any decision could be seen as predetermining the outcome of any future applications for the building which has been built out on site or will be built in the future, to which it is proposed this heating array is connected. Thank you. Thank you. Now, do members, if they want to put their hands up, have any questions, please? Yes, Councillor Stringer. Yeah, I, I actually have a question now for the officer, actually, to, to, to comment on does that that condition retaining control mm. to protect amenity, is that protection now not needed or does approving this prejudice that that amenity being protected? So to my oh. mind, oh, sorry, John. No, 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 if you've got the answer, go for it. I'll come All in right. if need be. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you, Councillor Stringer. Thank you, John. And, and if, if you want to jump in at any point, John, and just confirm my thinking, that's fine as well. Um, to my mind, no, the, the approval of this application does not prejudice the decision that the Council may want to make on a future application. Um, the fact that we have allowed the siting of the heat array and the heat exchanger um, does not necessarily then mean that we would be in a position where we are um, we have fettered our own discretion um, on a subsequent section 73 on the existing barn looking at condition 10 or um, for determining um, a future application for a fresh barn on the site um, I think that the council would then be able to look at a wider range of um, material planning considerations, including vehicle movements, including things that other members have raised, 
um, including you know impacts of noise, um, impacts of whether or not goods from outside of Barley Brig Farm were to be dried on the site. Um, I think those are all things that will be considered by that future application, which we don't yet have before us. Uh, thanks. Thank you. OK, any further questions? Thank you very much indeed. Right, so. Um, yeah, may I just quickly ask a quick question, if I may, Daniel, um, just to confirm, I'm just trying to get through the paperwork as quick as I can this end, but um, this proposal before us does not include a connection to the building and therefore would not be in breach of condition 10 in any shape or form. Um, so in terms of the application, it shows ducting runs to the location of that barn. But because to my mind, because condition 10 exists on that barn, which appears to be built out on site, it would not be possible without breaching planning control to make that connection and utilize that barn for the drying of goods. I think if that were the case, we would then be um, looking to discuss things with colleagues in enforcement and to take action um, in order to prevent that use from going ahead as things stand at present. Thank you. So they are very clearly separate in the purposes of planning merit and consideration and the consideration that can come later. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think, Councillor Stringer, you'll have to use yours in debate later. No, I'm sorry. We, you, you've, you've had your question time. Um, Unless it's for the parish council, do you have a question for the parish council? And the lady has. Uh, no, no, afraid not. Afraid not. No. no. Um, so we now have um, Stephen Bainbridge for three minutes, who is the agent, please. Hello councillors, uh, my name is Stephen Bainbridge, Principal Planning Consultant, Chartered Member of the RTPI, uh, like your planning officers, and I've been a, a BABA planning officer in my time. Uh, I was the agent to the 2015 application for the biogas plant and also the recent applications for the drying barns. Uh, thank <coughs> you, officer, for his report to committee and unsurprisingly agree with his recommendation. Uh, on that basis, I simply offer the following clarifications for your benefit. Uh, this development is supported financially by Ofgem, Planning Commission has been granted for the grain drying building and plans showed the heat exchangers and pumps inside the building. This proposal provides the heat source for the grain drying. The development will consist of underground heat transfer pipes like underfloor heating, but in reverse. They have been thrust bored or trenched in so there are no waste soils. All works undertaken within the existing arable fields, which have already been returned to agricultural production. Uh, and you have the juniper green rectangular 20 foot heat exchanger, uh, which will sit on an existing concrete pad at the AD plant. The heat exchange container receives heat energy from the field array and the exhaust heat from the AD plant dryers, uh, feeds this to the grain dryer building. We have had a similar proposal approved by West Suffolk in the summer, uh, details of which were sent to your officer. The Parish Council have claimed that this planning application should have been under the jurisdiction of the County Council. As discussed with your planning officers, it was not a waste. Planning development is therefore not a county matter. To be honest, it didn't matter to the applicant which council processed the application because as an agricultural diversification and green energy scheme, it would have complied with both local plans anyway. The Parish Council also seemed to think the heat array can somehow overheat and cook the ground. This is not possible. The heat exchanger is simply not dealing with that level of heat. The temperature gradient is not very high. It doesn't need to be for a ground source heat system to operate. Uh, but there can be a lot of heat energy stored in a large area, even if the temperatures are only a few degrees apart. The Parish Council is confusing heat and energy. Uh, there are no objections from ecology and highways reflecting those points. Archaeology, I note there's a suggestion of a planning condition for a scheme of archaeological investigation. Uh, but please understand that the field investigation happened in the summer and the council has the findings, so that condition isn't necessary. Uh, on noise, as you've heard, there's been a lot of to and fro with the environmental health officer, uh, but bearing in mind my long history with the biogas plant and the work that was undertaken there, I'm glad that the EHO accepted the idea uh, of a planning condition to complement the one on the biogas plant uh, to allay uh, any concerns that he had about noise. Uh, 30 seconds left. 
please do not hesitate to ask. Oh, well done within the, within the time. Well done. Thank you. Right. Um, so, Councillor Mellon or, or anybody, do you want to put your hands up if you have any questions for Mr Bainbridge? Councillor Mellon, yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, um, Mr Bainbridge, I'm just um, sort of wanting to still understand the what this scheme is about. Um, I'm a farmer myself and I understand that grain drying is a seasonal activity. It's not a year round activity. You know, crops are harvested in July and August. They get dried, they get stored and sold. Um, so there's considerable uh, investment going in here to Can ask a question. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to a question. Sorry, chair. Um, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you? Can you tell me, is this just going to be used on a seasonal basis for for drying the crops from the, the farm itself? Uh, so I got the planning statement out for the grain drying barn, the reference being 1901673. Uh, and there wasn't any detail in there about whether or not it would be seasonal or 365 days of the year. I think the assumption was that it would be 365, some of the crops, and there are uh, quite a lot of tonnages mentioned um, back then, um, are stored elsewhere and brought in in stages. So I guess the, 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 there's capability there for it to be 365. But even if it isn't, um, well, if the heat is being vented into an empty barn, um, I don't see a, a planning problem with that. Does that answer your question, Councillor Mellon? Yeah, I, I understand what this is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Councillor Stringer. Yeah, um, I, well, I think well, there is a planning reason why just venting hot air using energy to generate heat and just pushing it in a barn is, is, is you know, energy and resource retention is and good use of energy is is, is a material consideration. Um, just just to clarify. So th this is where I think a lot of the confusion is coming in. So what we're being asked to approve today is basically a, a sort of giant heat pump and heat exchanger that does not connect to anything. So just what we're approving today won't work, will it? It, it you could you could put all this kit in there won't be a space in which it's actually drying anything. And I think that's what I just want to be clear about. Uh, and I don't, if not, I, I'm not really sure why we've not got the whole, it's rather like being asked to approve a central heating system. You're, you're, you're yeah, asked John, to, you've yeah. asked the question. Okay, Let's thank you. For it. Thank you. <laughs> Can you answer uh, that, Mr. Bainbridge? Is it uh, that it's just the, the facility and that it won't actually be active? Is that correct? Uh, by all, yeah, I can answer that. The the red line plans for the heat array uh, allow for the ducting to go all the way up to the building which was given permission under 201697. Um, on the photo that you saw that the parish council kindly took, uh, you'll have seen, um, if I describe it, two thirds of a building complete. That is the building uh, that had the 2020 permission and then one third of a building which is not complete. Um, I say that the one third that is incomplete, um, well, if you wanted to point at anything, you might say it is part of the building that was approved in 2017. So this planning application has a red line for ducting going right up to the wall of the barn that has planning permission to be used for grain drying and has been built out. That part was built out actually before the, the, the third that appeared incomplete uh, on the photo. So that connection is there. So par perhaps our officer could clarify that uh, and what conditions are, are put on that. Mm, yeah, so um, Stephen, my understanding is that the barn has been built out on site. Is that approved in 2017? What you seem to be saying, therefore, is that part of that building is the barn approved under DC 19-01673 and the remainder is part that was approved under DC, uh, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, it's in the report, for in 2017. <clears throat> is that correct? Uh, I think that probably the best way to look at this, Dan, is the 
barn that had permission, the 01673 barn, was built out and finished. Uh, and then an extension to it has been built. It matches the footprint of the 2017 one. How you and I end up dealing with that extra bit, um, in, we'll, we'll deal with that in due course. And in fact, um, we have discussed and we are what, figuring out how the, the, the multiple permissions on site for different barns with different expectations of them gets dealt with, um, uh, whether that be a new application or removal of conditions or variation or whatever. Um, to be fair and to be honest, that would have been submitted by now, but of course this application has been running since April, so that is delayed. Um, the expectation being that we would deal with the barns um, once this application has been, uh, fingers crossed, approved. Um, but from my point of view, the, the crop drying barn 01673 was built out, implemented, uh, and there is something else sitting there. Um, whether we deal with that as uh, an addition to 01673, or part implementation of 183717. Um, I think we're yet to have that conversation, but as far as this application is concerned, um, for the field array, the red line takes it up to the wall of the barn that is sitting there. So, so we can put a connection in the wall. Can, excuse me interrupting, I think we're going into a long debate here, which as a planning officer, I'm sure you'll enjoy. Um, but um, what you're saying here is then you look as though you've got to do a retrospective application for a bit that was tacked on. Is that correct? Um, uh, possibly. Yes or yeah. no? Possibly, yeah. Um, uh, well, that'll be for discussion with the officers, but uh, possibly. Um, yeah, but the, the members need to understand what's there and what isn't there. So thank you for that. I think, Andrew, you've fleshed that out a little bit for us. Yeah, I think. Um, is, is there a reason why that couldn't have all been tidied up with this yeah, one hang application? On. Can, we, so, can we do that in debate, Andrew? Let's 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 just. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, you know, let, let's just sort of go with the questions at the moment. Um, log that one and you can bring it up very shortly. So thank you for that. Any more questions for the agent? No? Right, Julie, we move on to you. Would you like to give us your thoughts on this matter? Thank you very much, Chair. Perhaps I can. Um, thank you, members. As a farmer's daughter, I am absolutely supportive of far farming and the rural economy, providing local food which does not have a large carbon footprint. You have heard the worries from the Stradbrook Parish Council Father Clark. Planning rules are put in place to protect our communities and our countryside. The application is not straightforward and I would urge the committee to take on board the detailed report from the parish. A closer look needs to be taken at what has been built out under which planning application to make sure we have met all due diligence with the application and if we need to defer then so be it. The site I would suggest is slightly more technical and industrial than most farm sites and needs expert analysis. I think that if the applicant and agent were to be up front with the parish council on aims and ambitions of what actually the site intends to achieve in growth, this would provide transparency and a more fruitful outcome. Instead, looks as if it looks as if there could be some flouting of planning rules i am no expert and i will leave it with you the committee to decide if you need more clarity and maybe a site visit covid considered it's actually in the open air and could be achieved in the new year and just to quote the aerial photo i have here taken in 2020 shows building built out is that granted under the 1837 stroke 17 and not DC 19 uh, 01673. 1837 stroke 17 condition 10 states no grain drying or straw burning equipment shall be installed. I am believing there should be some retrospective planning permission going on here. Thank you, Chair. Oh, just one more thing. It, thank you, Andrew, for bringing that up. County and district had a little bit of a, um, shall we say, a debate over this and legal on both sides were involved. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julie. I, I think I did sort of allude to the fact it looks as though there needs to be retrospective planning permission on this. Can I help, possibly? Might be able to. For me. OK, so condition 10, let's be very specific about what it actually says. Um, so in respect to the building, it says the building hereby permitted shall only be used for storage of grain, straw and farm equipment machinery. No grain drying or straw burning equipment shall be installed. So we're dealing with the building, the internal part of the building, in fact, in terms of its use and its uh, you know, ability to dry grain or not. This proposal does not alter that condition. This proposal is not this building or internal to this building. This proposal is a heating array external and whether you have um, any connection to the wall of the building or not, ultimately any future permission would need to be needed to change this condition or separately deal with this condition. That is not what this application does. This application does not alter this uh, proposal that's been built and the condition that's attached to it. So they are clearly separate matters. Now, the point, though, in terms of what we're proposing and what's in front of members today is that there is an argument to say, what is it for? Because that is true. We're not entirely sure what it's for, because if it's not for the drying of uh, crops and so on in this building, what is it for? Um, what we haven't got, though, is that in front of us. I think that's what makes this whole debate quite difficult. We're not sure what it's for. We can probably guess what it's for, but there's a risk. But that's a risk for a future application to undertake. Um, what we're dealing with is the physicality of does this cause harm in the countryside? Does this cause harm in any other way? Does it cause traffic in its own right? Whether the drying of crops in the building causes traffic or not is a different issue. But does this facility in its own right cause traffic? Does it cause landscape harm? Does it cause any other harm in planning terms? Um, I still feel, given what I've heard, we still have very two clear, and I, I appreciate planning is a pig in this respect. <laughs> you know, there's common sense and there's what planning can do in terms of divvying up into separate applications. But there's still a very clear line between the two aspects. We need to be mindful of it. Thank you for that, John. You say there's a clear line, but there's a chicken and an egg situation here that seems to have arisen. Um, I completely agree with you, yeah, and that is the point. Uh, the trouble is we are dealing with, you, know, well, you can say it's the chicken or we're dealing with the egg, but unfortunately we can't deal with the chicken and egg at the same time. Well, maybe we should defer. Right. Any questions for Councillor Flatman from my good colleagues on the committee who have stuck with it today, please? No. OK, well, we open it for debate and I can start with Councillor Mellon, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, you don't store wet grain and move it around um, when you've got drying facilities ready. Um, grain comes into a grain store, is dried, stored and then sold. Um, so. Uh, the, the sort of proposed justification, or maybe not even proposed justification, for this um, it, it is a struggle to understand in 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 purely farming terms. Um, I'm very aware, though, that there are schemes um, promoted by the government which support this kind of technology, um, which give incentives to this kind of technology. Um, and sometimes those incentives are perverse. They cause people to do things they wouldn't normally do in order to benefit from RHI or various other payments. And we know very well from media reports that in places like Northern Ireland, people got into a lot of bother about this. Farmers were heating their barns to a tremendous extent in order to farm the subsidies. Um, and I suspect that that's where this is going. Now, as a green councillor, I would normally be in support of this kind of technology. I would much rather that we use ground source heating to dry grain than we use diesel or gas or even burning straw. However, I'm not sure that's what's going on here. I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand what is going on here. We have a, a, an, a, an AD plant which would produce excess heat. 
We have a straw burner, which I think has previously been approved, which could produce heat. And now we have this heat array before us. Um, so I'm struggling to understand what is really an incomplete picture of uh, of this application. Um, are we, if we were to approve this, are we basically facilitating the use of a loophole in the RHI legislation um, for this business to make money? Um, I would much rather that, that, that we deferred, if, if one application was going to be deferred today, this should be the one so that we can get a better picture of what in entirety um, the applicant intends for this site. Um, so that's where I'm at the moment, um, confused to some extent. Thank you, Councillor Mellon. I think we've got to be very careful about um, what we um, think is going on. We need to know what is going on. And you made that point very clear. Thank you. Councillor Norris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I take Mr. Pipeman G's comments that we should be assessing the application that is before us, which is purely relating to the installation of this heat array and siting of a heat exchange container. But at the same time, I don't think we're getting the full picture here. Um, I would be tended to agree that we should defer this, to be quite honest, to clarify exactly what the purpose of the application is for. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Norris. And now Councillor Stringer. Yeah, it, it, interesting one. I'm sort of, I, I'm almost at the point where you think, well, you're going to have to approve this because what's <laughs> being asked for in terms of development, you're being asked for a heat pump and a, and a load of piping and, and a heat exchanger and all that. Uh, and, it, and that's brilliant technology, wonderful stuff. What a great idea. Brilliant. And you think, but where's all this heat going to end up? I mean, it could end up in a manifold going into a district heating system, but it probably isn't. Um, but we we don't know. Um, I'm thinking, d do we defer? What are we going to learn if we defer? Because if we defer on this application, what we actually want is a bigger application on what actually is going on with this heat. Because actually, what technically what we could be approving here is an awful lot of energy use and a load of heat going up in the air. Because that's basically what we're being asked to approve, isn't it? There's there's two manifolds, there's two there's pipes going into there with the heat that can't technically go into a building. So if this is implemented as to what we're approving, what we've basically got is something that will take electricity, convert it into heat, and then throw it up in the air. Uh, I, I I really don't know. I'm I'm tempted to suggest we should possibly approve it with an advisory note to say da, 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 or do we just defer it and they get and the applicant can hear what we're saying to say look you know what you can't you can't expect a community to, to to gather trust with what you're doing if you're if you're just giving them little bits of information piecemeal uh you know i i, I mean i feel like i'm being treated like an idiot <laughs> and occasionally i am and i don't mind admitting it but i i really don't feel we're being being dealt with quite fairly with this application because on the basis of it you've been asked to approve something in development terms is acceptable so long as there's an end product but we don't know what the end product is so at the moment we've been asked to approve something that will take energy and take heat and chuck it somewhere for whatever purpose we don't know and we don't know where that is a very bizarre thing to be asked so I, I really don't know. Um, I could easily approve it because actually what's the harm in approving this? The harm will come depending on the consequences and the consequences we don't know. So I understand why John Pateman G is really cautious about this. But frankly, what would help us is a proper application showing actually what's happening here and tidy this whole thing up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Stringer. Councillor Warboys. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, <laughs> I wish I could shed some light on this. I, I, I am I'm very confused. I, I, I picked up on one word in the, the, the document, synergy, and you've got three um, sites, basically, that are 
obviously appear to be related, generating heat, moving heat, use, needing heat, and yet they're not connected up. And we can have no clear picture of what traffic movements will be because um, we don't really know what the future use of the buildings is going to be. If it's used for, if you have a lot more heat available so you can dry more crops, there will be more traffic movements. Um, I do feel we're, we're, it's it's a bit like when, when, you, when the five blind men are asked to describe an elephant and <laughs> one touches his legs and says it's like a tree, one touches the trunk and says it's like a snake and so on. Um, there's no clear picture of what it is. I, I rather wish the planning application had been for a whole site which showed how the, the structures are related. Um, otherwise, it, it's like a conceptual art project we're being asked to approve where the outcome is heat. And that's it, <laughs> as Ms. as Councillor Stringer says. Um, I, I I would like I would support deferral to get a a more obvious um, planning application with a more obvious input and output of the of the system. But I I can't see a way a very clear way forward at the moment. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Warboys. Well, I think we're all struggling on this one. Um, and um, I think we're all on the same page, really, is um, we could all approve it. Great. But what's it going to be doing? So um, if somebody wants to make a proposal from the floor about deferral, I don't think it's unreasonable. Chair, I'll, I'll help if you like. Uh, I'll, I'll propose we defer this. Uh, and ask the officer to investigate uh, the energy use of this thing, because we do have energy use retention policies. Uh, and 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 so let's see what the energy use is and what use it's going to be put to, because at the moment we've actually got the officers describing something different to the applicant. And while we've got that conflict, even in the room today, uh, I mean, the applicant seems to think, they can, yeah, it would just be connected to this building. Fine, let's come forward and let's get it sorted out because I think, you know, uh, and I, I really don't want to be, I don't want to stand in the way of what could be a sustainable development, but at the moment, I really don't know what I'm doing. And I feel exactly, brilliant metaphor, by the way, Roland, I feel like one of those blind men. And, yeah. I, and, I'm, and I'm pretty certain I know which end of the elephant I'm at. Yeah, well, thank you for that. So that's a proposal for deferral for some more information. Um, how, how do you want to just word your proposal for deferral, if you wouldn't mind, please, Councillor Stringer, the yeah, I, so that our officer can be comfortable? I think, with. I think we're within our right to defer this for the officers to investigate the actual energy use usage. and production, yeah. Yeah, the energy yeah. usage yeah. and what it's going towards. I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing to ask. Okay. I think Thank that's you. very reasonable. Thank, Thank you. Thank you Councillor Norris, I think you had your hand up next. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, happy to second the uh, recommendation for deferral. And John, uh, did you want to come in on anything that we've um, put forward there, or are you happy with that? Uh, was, was that me or... or Yes, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry, John uh, Bateman G. Yeah, there isn't another John. There, is there? No. I, I wasn't sure for a second. It's been a long day. No, I know. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm more than happy with that. Uh, defer for offers to explore both energy use and its application. And I would have suggested that's in accordance with your want to make sure that uh, the needs of the countryside are justified and it's essential for the needs of the uh, countryside. Is that fine by the proposer and seconder? Uh, I think so, because it's to uphold those, you know, try and uphold those previous conditions regarding residential amenity, etc. Yeah, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. lovely. In that case, I have a proposer and a seconder. Would um, the officer like to take a, a call starting with there's only five of us, so go for it. Thank you, Chair. So if members could please respond with four against or abstain. So Councillor Cathy Guthrie. Oh, four. Oh. Councillor Andrew Mellon. Yeah, four deferral. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Mike Norris. Four. Councillor Andrew Stringer. Four. And Councillor Roland Warboys. Four. Thank you, Chair. That is unanimously carried. Confirmed by the legal officer, yes. 
Thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much to everybody. It's now pitch black out there. I couldn't believe it. Um, thank you for your staying power, everybody. Um, but we, I think we, it was good that we got to the end of this. So thank you very much indeed. I now close the meeting. Thank you. Well. Thank